Um, that's the reason this case is so fascinating because of the bizarre leakage. Uh, it's almost like these parents leak so much in these interviews that you can almost put together the pieces if you pay enough attention. All the clues are there. What really happened to Madeline McCann? Hello, detectives. Welcome to the podcast. I'm the Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel is all about teaching you to spot liars, scammers, hoaxers, and other manipulators. Today, we're going to look at an interview with Madeline McCann's parents um, with some, I think it's like a Swedish talk show to see if we can figure out if they know what happened to Madeline. This is one of my most requested videos. I have not watched this interview before, but I have seen other interviews of them. So let's watch together. Welcome to baby. Welcome. Uh, Kate and Jerry McCann, please welcome to welcome to Stockholm. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's been it's been almost five years uh, since since uh, Madeline disappeared, and and now you, Kate, are reliving the whole thing by writing a book about what happened. Um, why are you doing that? Well, I actually started to keep a diary back in May 2007. I was advised to do it, actually. And at the time, I felt it would be important for Madeline, really, so that when we found her, we'd be able to fill in the gaps um, in her life. And then I also thought it'd be good for Sean and Emily as well, so that they'd have an account, really, of the truth of everything that happened. You're, you're twins. That's right, yeah. Um, if we could start by going back... Um, to, to May uh, 3rd, 2007. What's your strongest memories of Madeline from that day? I think the strongest memory I have is of really the photograph, the, it's the last photograph we have of her. And, uh, you know, we'd had a lovely holiday. Madeline was having a great time. And just after lunch, we went over to the pool area and uh, she was sitting there paddling in the pool I was sitting next to her and she turned around and she's just beaming and then the the last time I saw her which was probably minutes before she was taken when she was lying asleep and it's terrible I've just said this a few times but I had one of those poignant moments as a parent where I went into a room and the door was open and I, I just paused for a second and I looked and she was sound asleep and I thought how beautiful she was the Already, this is a little bit concerning, and I've seen lots of other people analyze the McCanns, so I'm trying not to let their commentary influence my own commentary. Right now, this concerns me because uh, it doesn't sound real in that you don't pause and, and look at someone that way in an angelic way. And you think you're going to see them again a few minutes later. Right? So it doesn't make sense for him to um, tuck his kids in and look at them and have this deep moment with them. Um, if he's expecting to go have dinner with his friends and then come back and see her again. So already this is a little bit concerning in that it looks like too much persuasion. Um it's almost like ingratiation, trying to make us like him, like he's a doting father. And he might actually be telling the truth here, where the last time he did see her, if he and his wife, you know, murdered her or accidentally killed her, I know there's some theories that they may have given her something to go to sleep, which may have killed her because they are both physicians. And he may have had that moment with her dead body. So he may be relaying a true moment. But the context he's putting it in doesn't make sense, right? You would have that moment if you just killed your daughter by accident, but you wouldn't have that moment if you were just tucking her into bed like you do every night. And in particular, the moment about her, right? He didn't say he looked at all his children and reflected on them. It was only Madeline. So already this is a little bit concerning. Does this mean that they're liars or that they murdered Madeline? No. Right? We need multiple signs of deception before we make a conclusion. 
the twins were asleep in the in their cots and I thought how lucky we were and within you know minutes that was shattered all right so he, I think he might be telling the truth here right he he might actually be relaying a true story if he and his wife accidentally did kill Madeline he's saying the last time he saw her alive he thought wow you know how lucky we were to have a perfect little family and a few minutes later she passes and it's all shattered so listen to what he says and imagine him relaying this right being a true story but he's talking about the last moments he saw her alive because he and his wife may have accidentally killed her and into a room and the door was open and I, I just paused for a second and I looked and she was so imagine he's seeing her right uh, dead or dying, right? This is a physician. He can tell the signs. Down to sleep. And I thought how beautiful she was. The twins were asleep in the in their cots, and I thought how lucky we were. And within you know minutes, that was shattered. Right. Also, notice how he says we were past tense. If he's looking at his three sleeping beautiful children. The thought he should be relaying is, I thought, how lucky we are. We've got three beautiful, healthy children. But instead, right, through leakage, if we believe that he, he accidentally killed his daughter, or maybe deliberately, I think it was accidental, though, if they did kill her. That is appropriate, right? I, I looked at her totally asleep, right, i.e. dead, the children were, the twins were sleeping, and I thought, how lucky we were. Right? We were lucky up until we screwed up big time, and we will never be able to get back from this. And that was all shattered within minutes, maybe when she passed, right? Or they were unable to resuscitate her. And, and what happened was that you went. So let's listen again and. I think this part of the interview is critical because I think there's a ton of leakage here and we're only a minute and 30 seconds in. So listen to him. Imagine him going into the room, finding his daughter dying, right? Or, or looking ill, looking like she's about to pass, maybe hit on the head with something um, or taking too much of, of a, a medicine that uh, her heart rate slowed down. Maybe he's noticing her blood pressure dropping and just listen to him recount this and see how appropriate the emotions sound. I'm asleep and it's terrible. I've just said this a few times, but I had one of those poignant moments as a parent where I went into a room and she was lying asleep. And also, that's a little bit more leakage, right? Why was it terrible? Why would it be terrible to say that... Um, you saw your three children sleeping in their bedroom. I think because it was a terrible situation. I think the two twins were sleeping and Madeline was dying or dead. So let's rewind a little bit further. Let's listen to Jerry's entire answer. I didn't think we would hit pay dirt this quickly. I think you're starting to see my opinion of the McCann's a lot earlier than, than I thought I would reveal it. To, to May uh, 3rd, 2007. What's your strongest memories of Madeline from that day? I think the strongest memory I have is of really the photograph. Uh, it's the last photograph we have of her. And, uh, you know, we'd had a lovely holiday. Madeline was having a great time. And just after lunch, we went over to the pool area and uh, she was sitting there paddling in the pool I was sitting next to her and she turned around and she's just beaming and then the the last time I saw her which was probably minutes okay remember this I believe is true but the context is omitted the last time I saw her this may have been when he saw her dying and was holding her body or trying to resuscitate her before she was taken when she was lying asleep and it's terrible, I've just said this a few times, but I had one of those poignant moments as a parent where 
I went into a room and the door was open and I, I just paused for a second and I looked and she was sound asleep. And I thought how beautiful she was. The twins were asleep in the in their cots. And I, I notice how he's only focusing on Madeline and he doesn't say Madeline was asleep. Madeline was sound asleep. The twins were sleeping. Right? I think sound asleep is him leaking that she was dead. And I thought, how lucky we were. Right? I thought, what a shame. Right? How lucky we were. We had everything. We're two physicians. We're on holiday. We had three beautiful children. And now one of them is deceased. We were lucky. Not anymore. That's a thought you have when something terrible happens. That's not a thought you have. You don't think how lucky we were when you're just looking at your three beautiful children sleeping. And within, you know, minutes that was shattered. And, and what happened was that you went, you went to eat with the other parents that you were on vacation with. That's right. So long story short, I think there was a ton of leakage there. And I think we actually understand from his leakage that he's the one who found uh, Madeline dead, right? He came into the room and found her dead or dying. And that's what he means when he says she was sound asleep and why he had that thought to himself, how lucky we were because we are not lucky anymore, right? The luck is gone. Now we're in a terrible situation. Um, this was not far from the apartment. It's about 50 metres as the crow, crow flies, but about 70 yeah. metres on foot. Yes, um, um, <clears throat> and as you sat there in the, this restaurant, you, you went back and forth on shift to, to check on the children, is that That's right? right. Yeah. And, and what, what happened when the last time you went to check? Well, it was 10 o'clock when I went to check on Madeline, and um, I walked into the sitting room of the apartment and I noticed that the children's bedroom door was open further than we'd left it. We always close it quite far over but just enough so some light gets in and it's quite open and it was our friend Matt who had checked on the children at half past nine when he was checking on. If you've binged all my videos you know that this is another red flag. So people when they're lying about something don't like to tell the big lie, right? The money shot, as I call it. What they do is they linger on all the true details for as long as possible to build up the courage or to get the words in order to tell the big lie. So Miss um, McCann was asked, well, what did you notice when Madeline was gone? So let's see what the question was. And then think about... Um, Actually, let's listen to the question verbatim again, okay? And then I'll explain this. Is that you were on vacation with? That's right. Um, this was not far from the apartment. It's about 50 meters as the crow, crow flies, but about 70 yeah. meters on foot. Yes, um, um, <clears throat> and as you sat there in the, this restaurant, you, you went back and forth on shift to, to check on the children, yeah, is that right? That's right. right. Yeah. And, and what, what happened when the last time you went to check? All right, so what happened the last time you went to check? This is like when we see Joe Rogan ask Bob Lazar about what the UFOs look like, right? Or Chris Grush get asked, what are the aliens like? Or, um, what's his name? Or like uh, Larry Sinclair, right? What was it like doing drugs with Obama? Or any number of hoaxers, right? Bob Gimli, what was it like when he saw Bigfoot? What they do is they linger on all these other details that don't matter to us. And they delay as long as possible before getting to the money shot. So the money shot of this story is I went into the room and Madeline was gone. Right? That's the money shot. But if you're lying about that, then that's the part you want to avoid. So you linger on all the other details that are true, right? Walking up to the room, maybe, or afterwards, or the dinner, right? Things that basically surround the thing you're lying about.
So if she and her husband accidentally or deliberately killed Madeline, everything else is what they want to linger on. They do not want to linger on um, pretending to discover the body, right? Because that would be a lie. Um, or, or rather discover her missing or um, they do not want to linger about how they may have arranged the room to hide the evidence. So that is the part that she would be lying about. And as you notice, he asked her a direct question. The appropriate response is to tell us about the exact moment she noticed Madeline was missing. But notice how many other details she gives us already, right? Delaying the money shot. In other words, delaying the lie. Well, it was 10 o'clock when I went to check on Madeline. And um, I walked into the sitting room of the apartment. You went back and forth on shift to, to check on the children, yeah, is that that's right? right. Yeah. And, and what, what happened when the last time you went to check? Okay, so what happened the last time you, ch you went to check? There's a missing child. You expect her to get straight to, I went into the bedroom and Madeline was gone. And then relaying every detail, scrap of evidence she could find in the room. Well, let's listen to what she focuses on instead. Well, it was 10 o'clock when I went to check on Madeline. And um, I walked into the sitting room of the apartment. And I noticed that the children's bedroom door was open further than we'd left it. We always close it quite far over, but just enough so some light gets in. And it's quite open. And it was our friend Matt who had checked on the children at half past nine when he was checking on his. All right, so notice Matt who checked before, the door was slightly ajar. In my opinion, this is delaying the lie, but it can also be unnecessary persuasion. Right? It is also unusual that she's giving so many details about this door being slightly ajar because they're, they claim that Madeline was kidnapped. So maybe a little bit of unnecessary persuasion where she's building up that theory. Either way, whether it's delaying the lie, so focusing on stuff that's true to avoid getting to the, the lie, right, to delay having to lie, or if it's unnecessary persuasion, right, to build up a fake alibi, either way, it's a red flag because the appropriate response is to tell us about the moment she noticed Madeline was missing, not who checked the room before or how ajar the door was or how they were leaving it for light. Right? All those are non-responsive to the exact question, not what you would expect from someone talking about an actual missing daughter. On his daughter next door, and I thought to myself, well, maybe, maybe Matt's left the door open when he's checked on them. So I walked over to the bedroom door, and I was about to close it to again, and as I did that, it kind of slammed shut. And I thought, oh, there must be a draft, and I checked the door behind me, and I hadn't left that open. And then I opened the door again. Actually, this might be unnecessary persuasion, more so, right? She's trying to build up this story that the window was open. So she's telling us all these details about the door. Either way, right, like I said, whether it's delaying getting to the bunny shot or unnecessary persuasion, you should be able to recognize it on the fly. And that's what my new podcast series is about, right? teaching you to recognize liars, hoaxers, cheaters, scammers in real time, because I think it's a much more important skill. If we were to do a deep dive into her words, um, right, there's plenty of more layers of things we would find. And we would actually deduce, right, whether this is unnecessary persuasion or if it's just delaying getting to the money shot. But either way, it's a red flag, right? She was asked a question where the answer that is demanded is note the moment she noticed her daughter was missing. Talking about anything else, especially for this long, is a red flag. And it looks like she's doing some unnecessary persuasion to build up this story that the window was open, because that's apparently how the kidnapper got in, right? That's what she's building up to. Or again, of the children's bedroom, just to leave it open a little bit. And that's when I really locked in. And I, I couldn't quite make out Madeline in a bed. And I just looked and looked and... Um, it was obviously quite dark, and it must be a parental thing where you don't switch a light on because you're worried about waking them. But then I realised she wasn't actually there, and I thought, well, she must have wandered through to our bedroom, and maybe that would explain why the door was open. So I went into to our bedroom, and she wasn't there, and that was the first time, really, that the panic hit. 
And I just ran back into her bedroom and literally at that point, um, the curtains which were closed just kind of... Right, so notice how brief... Right, so at this point, I'm pretty sure that they accidentally killed Madeline. I don't think they are... Uh, I think it was manslaughter, not murder. I think they may have given her something that accidentally killed her, like a medication to help her sleep or to help her to be quiet. Because um, they were on holiday, right? They were trying to enjoy themselves. So notice how the money shot is discovering Mad Madeline is gone, right? That is the part you would expect someone to linger on. The same way with Bob Lazar, right? The part you would expect him to linger on is the UFOs. But it's like pulling teeth to get him to talk about the UFOs. Or Bob Gimley, right? The guy who says he took a video of Bigfoot. He describes all these details about getting to the place where he and his buddy found Bigfoot and how they opened up their saddlebags and took the camera out. But then when he talks about actually seeing Bigfoot, right, the money shot of his story, he says, there one stood. So he can't even bring himself to say there Bigfoot stood or there a Yeti stood, right? So he's very detailed about everything else except for the money shot, except for the part where you'd expect him to be detailed. And that's because that's the part where he's lying. So listen to how Madeline's mother talks about not discovering Madeline in her bed, right? That is the lie. And look how briefly she talks about it. And I think actually she couldn't even commit to saying Madeline wasn't in the bed, right? If they did kill her, she would have been in the bed and they would have discovered her body there. So let's listen. L listen to all these details we're getting about the door, um, the window. But when it comes to actually discovering Madeline was not in her bed, how briefly um, she talks about, and I think it was vague. If I think I heard her say like she wasn't exactly in the bed or something. So let's listen again. Actually there, and I thought, well, she must have the um, bedroom just to leave it open a little bit. And that's when I really looked in. And I, I couldn't quite make out Madeline in a bed. And I just looked and looked. Right, I couldn't quite make out Madeline in her bed. Everything else has been declarative. But here she cannot commit to the statement that Madeline was not in her bed, right? I couldn't quite make out because Madeline was in the bed. Right? It's very hard for people to lie. So instead she's hedging right, to soften the lie. I couldn't quite make out that Madeline was in the bed. If she wasn't in the bed, you could say she was not in the bed. Madeline was not in her bed. Right? That's not hard to say. But instead she hedges, which is a red flag, right? She can't even commit to saying Madeline was not in the bed. So I think what happened is Jerry went in, or is Jerry the husband? So I think the dad went in, found her dead, put her in the bed. The wife came in and, you know, let the wife know. Wife went in and Madeline was there in the bed, uh, deceased. Again, of the children's bedroom, just to leave it open a little bit. And that's when I really looked in and I, I couldn't quite make out Madeline in her bed. And I couldn't quite make out Madeline in her bed, right? So lots of, lots of hedging language when she's talking about Madeline in her bed. Why? Because Madeline was in her bed. She wasn't missing. She wasn't kidnapped. So just listen to the hedging language when she talks about Madeline in the bed. And I just looked and looked and um, it was obviously quite dark and it must be a parental thing where you don't switch a light on. She worried about waking them. But then I realized she wasn't actually there and I thought, well, she must have wandered through to our bedroom and maybe that would explain why the door was open. So I went into to our bedroom and she wasn't. So notice how she doesn't talk about ripping the sheets off, right? Or looking under the bed or even turning on the light to look around the room. And I think that's because this is the big lie. So she's not lingering on this part of the story because Madeline was in the bed. So she's not dwelling on this part of the story. She would rather dwell on stuff about the door or the exact distance between the table and the bedroom, right? She's been very detailed except for this part about Madeline, right? She wasn't quite in the bed. Um, and so she's not thinking 
to fill in the rest of the gaps in the story, right? So did she ever turn on the light to look for Madeline? Did she ever search under the bed? Did she rip up the covers? wasn't there and that was the first time really that the panic hit and I just ran back into her bedroom and literally at that point um, the curtains which were closed just kind of flew open and that was when I noticed that the window was open as far as it could go and the shutters outside had been all right so this part is pivotal I think this part is scripted so I've looked at this other interview And listen to how she describes this um, thing with the windows and the curtains. I think what happened is this part of the story is 100% fabricated. And both parents came up with it to build up this story that Madeline was kidnapped. So I've actually come to the section here because I was expecting her to say this. Okay, here we go. So let's listen. We'll listen to this version. If you're listening on podcast mode, I'm listening to a different interview. She walked into the kid's bedroom and felt a gust of wind. The curtains, which had been closed, just swung open into the room and revealed that the shutter was all the way up and the window being pushed right across. And then I just knew, I just knew she'd been taken. All right, so let's listen now to this one. went into to our bedroom and she wasn't there and kind of flew open really that the panic hit and I just ran back into her bedroom and literally at that point um the curtains which were closed just kind of flew open and that was when I noticed that the window was open as far as it could go and the shutters outside had been raised all the way up and I just knew straight away that someone had um, taken her so 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 this is this so it's not verbatim the same, but all the beats are there, right? I went into the room and just at that moment, the curtains blew open to reveal the true culprit. Someone had broken in and taken her. I feel like this part is scripted between both parents and it's another part of the big lie, right? This is the money shot of the story, but this part of the money shot is fabricated. So they don't need to try to leave details out like they did with Madeline, right? So when she talks about Madeline, she has to, it's a lot harder to lie about searching for a bed where your daughter was and saying she wasn't there because you know the truth. So you have to, A, have the truth in your head that Madeline was in the bed and then tell a lie saying she wasn't there and make sure that your lie doesn't contradict with any other lies you've told and doesn't reveal the truth, right? It's a complex task to totally fabricate something when you know the truth. Here with the window, that's why I think it's so scripted because this is the lie they had to nail. They had to talk about that window being opened. The other red flag about the window is something we, we see with other hoaxers, which is the conclusiveness, right? I knew right then she had been taken. Well, at that point, you don't know what happened, right? Maybe one of the other parents opened the window because it was hot in there. Maybe Madeline crawled out. Maybe someone was playing a sick prank on you. So there's a million things that, that could have happened. So the conclusiveness of saying, I knew right then she had been taken is a red flag. It implies knowledge outside of what is being told, right? It implies extraneous knowledge. Because what, from what she's told us, there's no way to conclude 100% that Madeline had been taken. There's plenty of other explanations for why a window was open and why Madeline wasn't in her bed. So the conclusiveness is a red flag. This was your first thought? Yeah, absolutely. There's no and even the interviewer, I think, realizes how... Um, bizarre it is for her to be that conclusive, right? He says, that was your first thought, that she was kidnapped? That may be a thought, but it you cannot be that conclusive when you don't have all the details, right? So the fact that she's being that conclusive about it means she knows what actually happened. And, and uh, I think it's because she knows the truth that 
she and her husband may have killed Madeline and disposed of the body and concocted this story about a kidnapping. Raised all the way up. And I also, like I said, with other hoaxers, right, when it came to Bob Gimley and they asked him, could you have been fooled about that being Bigfoot? He does not leave that option open, right? No, that was Bigfoot that I saw. The conclusiveness is the red flag. Or Chris Grush, when they asked him, could it be that the UFOs that you saw, or you you know, you heard about, are just made by other departments of the government? He says, no, right, that's impossible. The conclusiveness is the red flag, right? Reasonable people leave open all possibilities, especially a mother who just discovered her child is missing. You would want every option available. That would be the worst option to dwell on, right? Maybe she's hiding under the bed. Maybe Madeline's paying, playing a trick on me, right? Maybe um, there's a million things you would say maybe to actually save yourself from going crazy. So the fact that she says, I knew right then she was kidnapped is too conclusive. Conclusiveness is the hallmark of a hoaxer, right? Because they have an agenda. A hoaxer has an agenda. They do not want to leave open other possibilities. And I just knew straight away that someone had um, taken her. So. so so this this was your first... Right. Also, someone, right? So she knows it was one person who took her. Right. More indication that she has outside knowledge, right? Not that you know, some people may have taken her or she had run away or an animal broke into the thing and, and grabbed her like a, a dingo story from Australia, right? There's plenty of other things that could explain it. First thought. Yeah, absolutely. There's no way a, a young child could have got out. <sighs> this, this decision of not eating in the apartment, it has been a lot of discussions about that, and not, not, not staying in the apartment go, to go to eat with the other parents. As you did every night. We felt incredibly safe and we were in a very quiet holiday resort. We are with a group of friends. We hardly saw anyone of an evening. And it, it was so close that it, it didn't feel very different to eating outside in your garden with the kids upstairs in the bedroom. And, and it literally, we were only going back um, to check. They had, no one had woken up. And of course, at the time... Someone stealing your child was the furthest thing from our minds, and um, it, so this was it, really not, not yeah, something I mean, you doesn't... thought twice about. It's yeah, no, it was. It just felt. Um, I think if we'd had to <clears throat> think about it or even say to each other, "Do you think that's okay?" Then it wouldn't have happened. But it just felt like a very natural thing. We'll eat at the restaurant on the complex. Um, I think well, I think the hardest thing with this is, you know, with hindsight, we made a mistake. Um, it was a collective mistake, but unfortunately, we can't change that. Also, look at the priorities here. Right? Their priority is saving themselves from criticism, explaining their decision. There's zero, um, zero mention of Madeline maybe still being alive, right? Our curiosity about the person who took her or how she's doing right now, or even waving to the screen and saying, you know, Madeline, if you're out there, uh, please contact us. The priority, and this is something I notice a lot in their interviews, right? The priority is themselves, not being criticized themselves and making sure to leave no doubt that Madeline was kidnapped. So here, right, they've, they've done that. Both of them have said she was taken. No other uh, explanation allowed. And um, and whatever anyone may think about our decision making that night, Madeline's completely innocent, and you know she's been taken, and um, and it's hard. Right. So no, she's been taken. Not she's missing, or she may have run away. Right, real parents of missing children call the, the kid missing. The kid is missing. They don't know what happened. The kid may have run away. They may have fallen into a hole, right? She may have been in a closet and, and went through the HVAC system. They, they have no clue what happened to her. But they're 100% certain she was taken with zero evidence of that. So that is the red flag.
hard for us because, you know, no one could feel more. Also, did he say Madeline was innocent? Right, so I think he talked about her in the past tense, which if, if you've ever heard anything about statement analysis, that's the most famous aspect of it, right? When a parent talks about their kid in the past tense, it means that they know that the kid is dead. Um, it was a collective mistake, but unfortunately we can't change that. And, um, and whatever anyone may think about our decision-making that night, Madeline's completely innocent. And, you know, okay, good. So he caught himself, right? Madeline is completely innocent. You know, she's been taken. He didn't do that famous thing. And actually people are so aware of that, that one rule of statement analysis that you see lots of hoaxers actually correct themselves. So parents of missing children who are actually guilty don't make that mistake as often anymore, right? They're, they're very uh, aware of that rule, right? If you have a missing kid and you did it, but you're pretending you didn't, do not talk about them in the past tense. Eventually, though, they do trip up in interviews. Um, and also, they're not aware of all the rules of statement analysis, but that is one that you see over time. The more knowledge people have about it, the more they correct themselves taken and um and it's hard for us because you know no one could feel more guilty than we did i think that's more leakage no one could feel more guilty than we did i believe him because i think they did it to 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 think that your behavior gave someone an opportunity a risky opportunity, but one that they took. And, you know, we persecuted ourselves for that. But you've got to look forward. You can't. Right now, he knows that this person was opportunistic and it was risky. Right? There's too much knowledge outside of the facts, which tells you that this is a hoax. Right? There's too much stuff that they're infusing into the story to build up a narrative that she was taken. To me, that's the biggest red flag about them. Besides all the leakage, right? No one was more guilty than us. We persecuted ourselves. That all makes sense, right? Because they are guilty. Go back, we can't change that, unfortunately. And, um, and what we've tried to do is, is always to look forward. Were you, like, were you the worrying kind of parents? I mean, I'll answer that. There are, I, I would say I wasn't, but Kate was. I would have said that Kate was a bit overprotective, whereas you know, I grew up in a big family, the youngest of five, and you feel, oh, you know, indestructible. But Kate was much, as an only child, maybe, I don't know, but definitely much more protective uh, of the children than, than me. The, there were... That's another strange admission, right? So I feel like the dad has a lot more leakage than the mom. Destructible, but Kate was much as an only child. Maybe I don't know, but definitely much more protective uh, of the children than than me. The, there were uh, uh, the, the, you you came in contact very very quickly with the Portuguese police. Sure. Uh, how was that experience? We were expecting a metropolitan type response and. And I remember saying to the officers, where's the helicopters? I want helicopters with heat-seeking equipment. And, you know, and the, the officer kind of laughed at us and said, you know, this isn't, we, you know, we don't have a Royal Navy and, and this thing. And, and you just, and I'm sure every single parent can understand this because everyone has lost a child momentarily and the terror and how frightening it is being in a supermarket or a playground or a park and you just want everything done and you want, you want the world to stop and, and scream and, and the response, you know, was slow. Um, and that, that, that's been one of the hardest things for us because, you know, Madeline could have been moved very easily and the Spanish border's on about 90. So that's another interesting choice of words. Madeline could have been moved, not taken, right? You move a dead body or an unconscious body. You don't move... Um, a living kid, right? If you're kidnapping a kid, you, you say she could have been taken across the border or smuggled. To move something, you move inanimate objects, right? You move a piece of furniture, you move a cadaver. So I think this might be more leakage that they found her in her room dead and took her and moved her. And I think they moved her somewhere cold, 
because like he said, she was anticipate, he was anticipating, um, helicopters with heat seeking cameras, which was interesting because no one put the words heat, heat seeking cameras into his mouth. I don't think right. Unless, or unless the police mentioned that, but it sounds like he's the one who brought it up. So, um, Right. If I were one of these Portuguese police investigating this, I would be probably be looking in the ocean for Madeline. Right, somewhere cold. Grounds are apart, and you just want everything to understand this because everyone has lost a child momentarily, and the terror and how frightening it is being in a supermarket or a playground or a park, and you just want everything done, and you want you want the world to stop and and scream and. And the response, you know, was slow. Um, and that, that, that's been one of the hardest things for us because, you know, Madeline could have been moved. All right, so listen closely. Moved very easily. And very, Madeline could have been moved very easily. I think what he's leaking here is they were actually surprised how easy it was to get away with this. You know, was slow. Um, and that, that, that's been one of the hardest things for us because, you know, Madeline could have been moved very easily and the Spanish border's on about 90 minutes away and obviously you're on the Mediterranean and one of the aspects of one... All right, there, you're on the Mediterranean. I think it's more leakage, right? Um, Heat-seeking cameras moved very easily. You're on the Mediterranean. I think they took her little body and put it into the ocean. Of why we are campaigning internationally uh, is because she could have been taken anywhere. What happened was that uh, as time went by... Right, then he corrects himself. Right, then he says she could have been taken anywhere. So I think the reason so many people are fascinated with the McCanns is because they recognize the red flags in what the parents say because there is a ton of leakage and what the parents don't say right so instinctively people realize if if my kid was missing the only thing i would be talking about is where is my kid and what are they going through right now and i'm where who kidnapped her where did she run to how did the staff let this happen? Did some maid open the window? Right, They would have every single theory about what could have happened to their daughter, and it would be top of mind. But instead, I think people realize that the parents talk a lot about themselves with zero mention of what might be happening to Madeline right now. And then there's weird leakage that I think people can instinctively pick up on, right? like this thing with heat-seeking cameras, uh, moving rather than taking her, right? So slip-ups like that. And then the mention of the ocean right there. Like, is his theory that someone broke into the house, grabbed Madeline, and then took her by boat, right, onto the, on the Mediterranean, took her by boat to Spain? Because otherwise, there's no reason to mention the Mediterranean, Right? So leakage like this um, is, as I think, what, what makes this case so fascinating. And I think what makes it fascinating in the minds of all, you know, my viewers. So as you know, um, I did a poll. I've done a bunch of polls. I did this one. I'm going to probably do all these videos on this poll, right? So if you're listening on podcast mode, I did a poll that got about uh, almost 1,000 votes asking what you guys want to see next. You know, whether it's the analysis of Jada Pinkett's book Worthy, uh, one where I teach you five words that liars use, the McCanns in a Halloween special, and the McCanns consistently come in second place. So I figured I might as well just do this McCanns video. And if it does well, uh, we can look at some more McCanns interviews. But I think that's the reason. Let me know in the comments. Um, that's the reason this case is so fascinating because of the bizarre leakage. It's almost like these parents leak so much in these interviews that you can almost put together the pieces if you pay enough attention. All the clues are there. I, uh, you didn't really trust the Portuguese police and they didn't trust you. We were there for three, three and a half months. We felt we had been completely eliminated from the inquiry, had been interviewed, the circumstances, you know, um, and then 
you know, for whatever reason and possibly pressure and a desire for this case to go away, it was portrayed in the media that uh, there was very strong evidence that Madeline was dead. Also, notice the priority. They stayed in Portugal for three months until they were eliminated from the inquiry. Not to provide as much support to the investigation or to be there if Madeline was eventually found, but he leaks that their priority was just to be eliminated from the investigation. What does that tell you? They knew Madeline was already dead. It also tells you that they were worried that they were suspects. Leakage like this is just, um, to catch it on the fly like this means that these people are very, very bad liars, right? They're not sophisticated liars. And we've analyzed plenty of sophisticated liars. So if you want to see more of my videos in your feed, please do subscribe and like the video. And maybe some of those ones will pop up into your feed so you can actually see what a good liar sounds like. Ed, people see DNA and other things and that we were responsible for hiding our body. And they were What's this? One second. Ever reason and possibly pressure and a desire for this case to go away, it was portrayed in the media that uh, there was very strong evidence that Madeline was dead. People see DNA and other things and that we were responsible for hiding our body. Uh, I think that's exactly correct. I think Madeline was murdered and I think they did hide the body. And the fact that he's painting that as the media smear campaign that bothered him the most is indicative that he's sensitive about it. More sensitive about it than, for example, the people who call him and his wife negligent. Right? There's People have called them negligent, bad parents. They've also called them um, child touchers. Right? I've seen other analysts talk about uh, facts that they, like, like they may have sexually abused the children. I haven't seen any of that language myself. But it's interesting that that is the one that he brings up because he's the most sensitive about that one, probably because it's the one that's true. So as far as the McCanns go, right, we've seen liars be manipulative. We've seen them um, do weak denials. We've seen different types of lying. The thing that they portray very well is deceptive leakage where people leak the truth despite themselves, because you always speak based on everything you know, right? If I try to tell you a lie, I still know the truth, right? I still know everything. And it's hard to keep that back. So the truth, typically, if I talk long enough, will come out in my words. And I think that's something that's happened with these parents. They're leaking the truth, because they talk so much. And there were rumors about DNA in, in, a, car, in a car that yeah. you hired. And I want to be absolutely clear about these things. You know, there's two aspects. We didn't hire that car for three and a half weeks until after Madeline was taken. And the second aspect is there's no DNA match. Uh, you know, when you see the files, there's a mixed sample of DNA that comes from five people. And all they say that some of it matched Madeline's. But of course, all of our DNA matches Madeline's. And, and, it's interesting about the car, right? I don't know enough about this case to even posit a theory about the car, but it is interesting that they rented the car after Matt Madeline was, right, as he says, taken, right? Maybe they put her in the trunk and drove her to the water. All I'm detecting from the leakage, right, and this, we've, we've watched nine minutes of an interview, right? So I, my theory is very rough here. We'd have to watch more interviews to pin it down. But I think at first glance here, it looks like they accidentally killed their daughter. They realized in that moment their lucky, happy life was shattered, right, in the dad's own words. They concocted this story about the window being open and her being taken. And as you can see right here, the, the thing with the window is scripted. She says it almost verbatim. All the beats are the same uh, about Madeline being taken. And then I think what happened is they, they were surprised at how easy it was, right? When he was talking about the police, they were actually surprised how easy it was to hide the body. And I think they hid her 
somewhere cold. I think they hit her in the water. Now, am I going to take all my poker chips and go all in that I'm 100% correct on this? No. Um, I'd need to watch more interviews to, to pin it down. And to be fair, you know, I was in... So if you want me to do more of the McCann's, uh, please let me know. I'm open to doing it if this video does well. When I talk about these heavy topics, YouTube typically throttles me. So if these videos do well, I will continue to do it. Um, it all just depends on what you guys want to see and, and what this uh, YouTube algorithm does to the video. It's incredibly frustrating from the time we were our Guido through to the, the file being closed the following July. And there is a part two to this interview that we could analyze in the next McCann video if you guys want to see that. But the, the prosecutor's final report was very clear, actually, and uh, unequivocal that, you know, there was no evidence that Madeline was dead and there was no evidence that we were involved. But certain people have chosen to ignore that information. Which one of these media speculations was, was most shocking, do you think? Uh, that's a good question. So he might actually reveal which is the true theory by saying which media revelation bothered him the most. So that's in part two of this interview. Are Jerry and Kate McCann lying about what happened to Madeline? I'm the deception detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis. And this channel is all about exposing liars and manipulators. Before we proceed, please take a moment to hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In this episode, we're going to analyze the second part of an interview Madeline's parents did with a Swedish talk show to see if we can figure out through their language what actually happened. Which one of these media speculations was, was most shocking, do you think? Was it most hurtful? I mean, there were loads. I mean, I guess the worst thing is if they say that she's dead and there's no evidence, because if she's dead, there's no search. I think the um, other thing, just to, to go back to that, Frederick, is that we had an interview with the police, which Kate details in her book, an unofficial interview. And um, basically, two of the senior officers were saying... So if you've seen the first part of this video, right, we've analysed the first half of this interview. And Madeline's parents are not very good liars. So they leak lots of information in the words that they use. And leakage is common with liars because you always speak based on everything you know. So if you talk enough, eventually you let the truth slip out, right? Knowing the truth and trying to keep it out of your language while trying to fabricate something else is very difficult. And one of the reasons liars trip up so much. And part of the leakage with Madeline's parents is in responses to some of these interview questions, they reveal what they're most sensitive about. So let's listen to that very first question again. The, the host asked them which uh, rumors or something affected you the most. And whatever response they give means that's the one that they're most sensitive about, probably because that's the one that's true. Right? So if I call you purple, that doesn't hurt your feelings because you're not purple. But let's say you are low IQ and I call you low IQ, that you will be sensitive about because it's true, right? Which one of these media speculations was, was most shocking, do you think? Was it most hurtful? I mean, there were low. So which speculation was the hardest for you? Their answer here is going to be revealing. Because there were lots of speculations, right? There were speculations that they were negligent. There were speculations that the daughter was kidnapped. There were speculations that they actually uh, sexually abused Madeline. So listen to the response here. It's revealing, right? Out of all these options, which one they pick to say hurt them the most? I mean, I guess the worst thing is if they say that she's dead and there's no evidence. Because if she's dead, there's no search. I think the um, other thing... Right, so they said... The one that hurt them the most is saying that Madeline is dead, probably because that's the one that's true. And they know it's true because I think that they uh, killed her. Personally, I think they did it by accident, if you saw the first part of my analysis. 
thing, just to, to go back to that, Frederick, is that we had an interview with the police, which Kate details in her book, an unofficial interview. And um, basically, two of the senior officers were saying to us, um, tell us what happened, we know what happened. And, and I was in tears saying, do you have evidence that Madeline is dead? Because if you do, as her parent, we need to know. And they were saying, it's coming, it's coming. And that, you know, it, the pressure that was put on us to confess to a crime of, of hiding your own daughter's body and to, to say that you were going to pursue us for murder. And, and it's not unique to Portugal. This happens with police the world over. It's happened to many different people. It's happened to other parents in similar situations to us. How is it? So I think that the Portuguese police were accusing them of murder, murdering Madeline because just like me, right, and just like lots of my viewers, they picked up on the red flags and what the parents did say and what they didn't say. Even in this interview, they expressed no curiosity about what Madeline is going through right now or uh, any curiosity about whether or not the kidnapper is watching this and might demand a ransom, right? There's a possibility to get her back. Um, or even expressing any fear about what she might be experiencing right now, she's still alive. And I think that's because they know she's dead, right? So she's at peace. There is no point in worrying about Madeline anymore, which is why they're not worried. What they're worried about now is themselves. So they go to great lengths to defend themselves from accusations. How is your daily life? It's been five years. How is your daily life affected by this now? How, or, or do you have a daily life? Yeah, I think we've, we've reached a new normality, I guess. You know, our, our life will never be what it was. You know, it's never going to be truly normal again because of what... Also, notice how she's saying our life will never be what it was, which is kind of like when O.J. Simpson said, right, I'll keep searching for the killer for the rest of my life implying that he understood the killer would never be found, right? He was basically revealing that he was the killer. He knew the killer would never be found because he was, in fact, the killer. And I've done a video on a OJ, which I think is one of my best and craziest videos. So make sure to subscribe so that YouTube will serve that up into your feed, hopefully. Um, so... What is she saying here? She's saying we know our life will never be normal again. In other words, she knows Madeline will never come back. Right? She has knowledge outside the facts. No one knows whether or not Madeline will come back or not. Right? The facts don't support her being dead or kidnapped. Right? We just don't know. It could be anything. She could be dead. She could be kidnapped. She could have run away. Um, so... The fact that she's saying we will never be normal again, in other words, our family will never be whole again, is uh, revealing, right? It means she knows Madeline's never coming back because she knows Madeline is dead. What's happened, but we've got to a place where we are obviously functioning. I mean, Jerry works full time. I haven't returned to medical practice, but I've worked on the campaign and the investigation. Six months of my life was spent going through the Portuguese police files. Nine months was spent writing the book. And of course, we've got two other children. We've got Sean and Emily, and it's, you know, it's actually quite... Right, we've got two other children. What does that mean? They've got those two. I think, once again, she's sort of leaking that she knows Madeline is dead, right? We don't... No, it's not saying we have three children. Although she did say other, so I won't read too much into that one. And part of the thing with this being five years later is they are inconsistent with their leakage. So you can tell that they they catch themselves sometimes. For example, sometimes they speak about Madeline in the present tense because everybody knows that if you speak about a missing kid in the past tense and you actually are the one who killed them, then you just outed yourself as the murderer, right? So everyone knows that one rule of statement analysis. It's almost like a meme. Everybody knows it, even criminals. So they catch themselves with some of these things, but they also slip up at other times, right? It's not consistent. For example, in the first episode we did on the McCanns, Jerry talked about moving Madeline, right? And you don't move living people, 
right? So he talked about the, the alleged kidnapper moving her across the border to Spain. When you're talking about trafficking, you say they they could have taken her across the border or they could have smuggled her across the border, trafficked her. You don't say moved, right? When you talk about moved, you're talking about moving an inanimate object, like moving a piece of furniture, or in this case, I think what he was visualizing was a cadaver, right? So when he was talking, he was visualizing Madeline's dead body and he slipped up. But then at other times he said she was taken, right? So they, in these five years, they've obviously gotten better at reducing the amount of leakage they have, but they still have a ton of leakage. They are not sophisticated liars, right? They're very bad liars. Quite a luxury, but a nice luxury to be able to take them to school and be there for when they come home. So. It's probably important to emphasise, you know, we do spend, obviously, a lot of our spare time uh, focused on it. And the last year, we've slept a lot better knowing that the review has taken place. But if you had a casual observer looking at us as a family, they would see a family of four, they'd see a happy family of four, and they wouldn't really see... They wouldn't suspect that we've been, um, you know, suffered a great trauma. Um, but for Kate and... Also, we suffered a great trauma. So they caught themselves when they were talking about Madeline living in, in the past tense, right? So they always, ref they try almost always to refer to her as, as in the present tense. But like this, they slip up, right? We suffered a great trauma. If your kid is missing, it doesn't matter if it's 20 years later, 30 years later you are still suffering that trauma because you don't know what your kid is going through. So the fact that he says we suffered a great trauma means that the trauma is over. The trauma was when Madeline died in Portugal. That was traumatic, but that is over, right? We suffer When someone dies, the trauma is over, right? If your parent dies, you say, you know, it, it was a tragic loss, you know, it was traumatic, but you don't say I'm still traumatized by it, right? You're still traumatized by things that are ongoing. If they truly believe Madeline is still alive and don't know what happened to her, then that trauma should be ongoing. So that's a slip up, right? The tense he's using is not appropriate to his story. The tense he's using indicates that he has knowledge beyond what he's saying. He has knowledge that the trauma is over. The only way it's over is if she's at peace now, right? She's dead. Pay family afford and they would also let's say this were, was the only thing we noticed. Would that mean that they killed her? No. Right? We look for multiple signs of deception before we conclude that someone's being deceptive. And even as I said in my first video, I'm not gonna take all my poker chips and go in on my theory that they killed her by accident. Right, so I'll just recap my theory based on the first video I did on the McCants. In that video, based on what the parents said, I came to the conclusion that they probably killed her by accident in the hotel room by giving her something to help her fall asleep, right, like a medication. And her blood pressure may have dropped, right, they're both physicians, they may have noticed she was dying, and uh, Jerry, the father, was there when she died. And then they corroborated their story about the open window and came up with this alibi that she was taken from them, right? That someone kidnapped her. And then they took the body and put it somewhere cold. I think the ocean, right? So they took her little body and put it in the ocean. So if, if you want to know how I came up with that theory, listen to uh, part one of this interview where um, I developed that theory. Also, I did that one as a premiere. I'm also doing this one as a premiere. So make sure to watch the live chat as you watch it, if you're watching on YouTube, because there's um, lots of you guys had great comments in the live chat and I added more details in the live chat. And they wouldn't really see, they wouldn't suspect that we've been. All right, so here, look how he talks about the trauma. The trauma is past tense, it's over. Their trauma is not ongoing. If you have a missing child, the child, the trauma is ongoing. Um, you know, suffered a great trauma. Uh, right, we suffered a great trauma. The trauma's over. Madeline's at peace now. Um, but for Kate and I, Sean and Amelie, 
are as happy as any seven-year-olds that we know. And for Kate and I, we get enjoyment from life. We do. We do do that. But until Madeline's back with us, there's, there's always going to be a void and that there's a limit. You know, whereas before you could be, you could have unbridled joy. Anything now is always, there's always a tinge in it. And it's often the family things because Madeline is not there with us. How, how has it affected your relationship? Well, we're very lucky. Also, lots of times, um, right, so I usually just like to look at people's words, right, when I'm doing deception detection. I don't like to consider outside facts because it can bias me. And I try to be unbiased, right? It's one reason I don't talk about my political leanings on, on the podcast, because even telling you guys my own leanings can bias what I say. So, um, and it will obviously bias how you hear me. Lots of parents, when a child goes missing, end up getting divorced, right? There's usually a lot of trauma and blame between the parents. Notice how at, they never, uh, blame the other for, you know, losing Madeline. You know, you're the one who had the idea to leave her in the bedroom alone, not me. I was the protective one, right? Are saying, you know, why, why didn't, did you really check when you went up to the room? Because you should have noticed the window open, right? So there's none of this bickering or accusations between them, which is another sign that they're co-conspirators, right? They're very tight knit, in fact, a lot of times when they're talking about stuff, they say we instead of I, right? They're so tight knit. And I think it's because they know, they both know the truth. They both know they're murderers and they can never turn on each other, right? This is their secret that they must keep no matter what. And I think the interviewers, you know, is a little bit suspicious of them with this question, right? He understands it's kind of strange that you lost a daughter and you're closer than ever. There's never been any bickering or accusations or even accusing the other parents, right? Didn't they say they were in Portugal with another couple and the other couple was also checking the bedroom, right? They never accused that other family. Uh, you know, it's like, well, did you actually check or did you steal my daughter? I don't know you that well, right? I think I know you, but did you take Madeline? Right? There was no accusation, no consideration of the staff or anything, Ever since day one, they've said she was kidnapped because that's the story they came up with. So they have to stick to that story. And like I said in my first video about the McCanns, the fact that they're so conclusive that she was kidnapped by some unknown, you know, uh, person who came through the window, the fact that they're so conclusive about it and will not entertain any other explanations shows that they're hoaxing because that is something that every hoaxer we've analyzed on the channel does. The hoaxer has an agenda. The hoaxer has a particular thing they want you to believe, so they will not entertain any other explanations, because their grift or their attention-getting uh, ploy or here, saving their own skins, depends on you believing that one story that they came up with. So the conclusiveness is a huge red flag here as well, besides leakage. Very lucky in that our relationship was very good, very strong before this happened, and I'm not sure we'd have survived if that wasn't the case. I mean, I don't think there can be anything more traumatic than what's happened to us, plus all the additional stuff on top of that. You, you, you said you, you've written the book for the twins. How much do they know? Probably as much as we do, to be honest now. Um, Actually, yeah. We did take advice from a child psychologist, and he said to be as honest and as open with them, but let them take the lead. So if they ask you a question. Right. So be as honest and open, right? Not be honest and open. She left off the last word, right? To be as honest and open as possible, because there are certain things they cannot be honest and open about without incriminating themselves. And you respond as, as fully as you can. And that's exactly what we've done. So we've got to the point now where they understand that a man has taken Madeline. Wow. A man has taken Madeline. How do they know? Let's say Madeline was kidnapped, right? So this is, this is another indicator of a liar. The fact that they know things that are not in evidence, what does it mean? It means that they've fabricated a story. How do they know 
it was only one person who took Madeline. How do they know it was a man? And in the first part of this interview, they said, you know, this, whoever took Madeline saw an opportunity. It was a risky one, but they took it, right? So they even have, know the internal thoughts of the person who took Madeline. There is no way to be conclusive about any of this. Also, if you're a mother and your daughter's missing, the last, you might entertain that she was kidnapped, right? So you, that is definitely an option. But is the last option you even want to consider, right? I would rather consider, and so would any other uh, person, right, who lost a kid, would rather consider that the someone on the hotel staff snuck in and is, is holding her ransom and is going to send me a letter any day to pay a ransom, right? Or that she op- somehow opened the window herself and got out, right? Or a, a vulture flew through the window and grabbed her and dropped her a couple yards away when it couldn't carry her, right? Any other option is what you want to consider. Or even one of the other parents is p- playing a cr- cruel joke on me. They open the window and they pretend that Madeline was missing, you know, those, you know, that, that couple's crazy. What a cruel joke, but I'll forgive them. Just give me Madeline back. Right. So the fact that they're saying that the kidnapping is the only option and that they have all these facts about it that are not in evidence, right? That it was a man is a great indicator that this story is fabricated, right? They've come up with a little story in their heads and they're leaking it, that it's made up, because they're saying things about it that are not in evidence. To be honest now, um, Actually, yeah. we did take advice from a child psychologist, and he said to be as honest and as open with them, but let them take the lead. So if they ask you a question, you respond as, as fully as you can, and that's exactly what we've done. So we've got to the point now where they understand that a man has taken Madeline. They understand. Right, a man, the, it couldn't have been um, a woman, right? That's totally impossible. Right, it's plenty possible, right? There's actually cases of women stealing kids because they can't have kids of their own, right? Or there's evidence of, of uh, there's a famous story in Australia, a dingo taking a baby, right? All of these options are still in play unless you know what actually happened and you have an agenda, to point everyone in a specific direction. So I'm I'm trying to illustrate how big of a red flag this is. They're talking about things that are not in evidence, which means they have information outside of the evidence. They they, they view it like burglary. She's been stolen and you shouldn't take something that doesn't belong to you. But they understand, you know, there's lots of people helping us. They understand why we're in Sweden today. The purpose of that is to ask for more help, really. Um, can, can they really remember? Well, obviously they, they were very know. young, but they have recounted things that happened prior to May 2007, which has kind of thrown me a little bit. Obviously, they've been surrounded by Madeline ever since. There's pictures all around the house. Madeline's bedroom's still there. They've obviously seen things on the television, and, and they know that my job really has changed from being a doctor to looking for Madeline. Um, and I think it's important to say that they still see Madeline as a big part of their life. Mm. And as parents, that's incredibly comforting. And they'll say things like, oh, we're going to get an aeroplane and we're going to look for that man. And when we find him, we're going to, and I said, we'll give him to the police. But they even talk about... Right, that man. Like I said, these are not sophisticated liars. Right, so they're revealing that this kidnapper who nobody knows who it is, is a man. He worked alone. He's not in England, right? He's somewhere abroad. It's This is not how the parents of actual uh, kidnapping victims speak. This is how hoaxers speak. Talk about that. And well, I think you know, if we don't find Madeline in the next period, we will face more difficult times as they get older and they're on the internet and they start seeing some of the vile material which is there. Um. I, in, in your book, you, 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 you mentioned that you have been perceived as, uh, as, as cold in a way. Well, that's- Regarding this interviewer, I think he's doing a great job. So I'm actually glad I stumbled across this interview. The reason I picked this interview is because when I was researching interviews in the McCanns, right? So when I did that poll, 
when I've done a lot of the polls on the channel, the McCanns have come in second place almost every single time. So I figured it was about time to just to just do it and knock it out. And I wanted to analyze an interview that has not been analyzed uh, by anyone else on YouTube. So this seemed to be the only one I could find without some other commentator's face in the thumbnail. So um, I think this interview is doing a great job because he's asking uh, lots of questions that are sort of um, at the top of my mind as well as in my comments about the McCants, right? So yes, they do appear cold. Why do they appear cold? Because people can instinctively see what's missing. They never appeal to this kidnapper, right? If they actually believe someone kidnapped her, they have not made an appeal here, um, right? They haven't looked into camera and say, and Madeline, if you're out there, we still love you. And if you have my baby girl, uh, you, you know, message, call this hotline or send an email here, right? So there's no appeal like that. And there's also no curiosity or concern about what's happening to Madeline, right? So they're concerned about the twins. They're concerned about themselves, but they're not concerned about Madeline, right? They never say, I can't sleep at night because I don't know what's happening to her or what happened to her. Right? It's like a UFO came and abducted her. Um, so there's never anything like that, right? which is why they appear cold. Also, I think one of the reasons they appear cold in actuality is because so much of their story is scripted, as I showed in part one, where they actually say things across interviews that are almost verbatim the same. Like They literally hit the same beats, which I think are the parts of the story that they made up together and decided we're never going to veer from this script. So when you're citing a script like that, you come off colder because you're trying to recall a script in your head and say it verbatim rather than speaking with true emotion. Period. We will face more difficult times as they get older and they're on the internet and they start saying some of the vile material which is there. Um, I I, in, in your book, you, 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 you mentioned that you have been perceived as, uh, as, as cold in a way. Well, th th someone's always got an opinion, and I think we've learned how judgmental people can be. I mean, I think it's maybe part of human nature. We're all quick to judge from a position of ignorance. Is there a right way of grieving and a wrong way of grieving? Well, exactly. I mean, how should a, a mother or father grieve when the child is abducted and I think the other thing people probably don't it's also interesting how she puts it in the hypothetical how should a mother grieve when her child is abducted she wants us to believe that her child was abducted right she should be part of that group what you would expect her to say is how do you want me to grieve uh you know, my child was abducted. Sorry if I'm not grieving the way you expect. But instead, she says it in the hypothetical, right? She doesn't put herself in the group of mothers who, whose children are abducted. She's almost asking it like an actor. How should I act if my child were abducted? Right? How does a mother whose child was abducted act? Because that's probably what she asks herself every day before every interview. I don't understand it. Right, so let's listen again. Right, uh, and now, does this mean she's a liar? No, but like I said, with enough, enough drops make a flood. So already in the first part of this interview, we've had plenty of things for me to feel confident in betting that they know what actually happened to Madeline and that they know Madeline is dead. Regarding the details of how she died and what they did with the body, I would need to watch more interviews. But at the rate of leakage they have, right, at the rate of things they reveal by their words, we could probably piece it together. And that's why I think people find this case so fascinating and why they've requested it so much on the channel is because I think if if um, we spent enough time on the McCann's, we could actually piece together what actually happened just based on what the parents reveal in their interviews right way of grieving and the wrong way of grieving. Well, exactly. So listen to how she puts herself outside the group of mothers whose children are abducted. 
I mean, how should a, a mother or father grieve when the child is abducted? And I think the other thing people... All right, so how should a mother or child grieve when their child is abducted? All right, if your child is abducted and you were defending yourself against idiots, let's say like your child is actually abducted and idiots on the internet who don't, you know, think you're crying enough, you would say, you know, too bad. I, I don't know how you want me to grieve because my child is abducted and this is how I grieve. Right? It wouldn't be a question. You would be a mother whose kid was abducted. It's also interesting how she says, how should a mother or father um, which which is uh, strange, right? Which shows that she's concerned about the criticism of her husband as well. And like I said, I think it's because, right, they, they talk about themselves as we, they are so tight-knit now because they have committed a murder together. And like I, like I keep saying, I don't think it was first-degree murder. I think it was manslaughter, right? I think they either accidentally dropped something on Madeline's head or gave her too much of something to try to put her to sleep and, and killed her that way. But either way, I think she was found in the bedroom. So I don't think, for example, they were out swimming with her and she drowned in the ocean. Right? She died in the room. People probably don't understand is that when we've done media, and particularly in the early days, you had to really set yourself up to go in there and deliver the message that, you know, we yeah, set Were objects. you advised on how to behave? We, I mean, the... This interviewer is uh, Skavlan. It must be Skavlan is a great interviewer. All right, that's another great question. Were you coached? Like, did people tell you how to behave? That's a great question. Also, it's a good question to follow up to what Jerry said, right? We had to psych ourselves up to deliver the message. Why would you have to psych yourself up to ask people to help you find your daughter. That shouldn't be hard, right? So he's revealing. It was hard probably because it was a lie. They knew what happened to her. So you have to psych yourself up and you have to concentrate it, concentrate not to reveal the truth and to pretend you don't know what happened. Right? Lying is very difficult, especially when you're lying um, while trying to omit information, right? So you're lying by commission because you're talking about a window that wasn't open as well as omission, right? As well as describing not finding Madeline in the bed, right? So you, the type of lying they're doing is very difficult. And that's probably why there's so much leakage because they have to add things that weren't there and they have to omit things that were there in the room, right? That Madeline was actually in the bed. And that's also why I think they, whenever they're asked about finding Madeline, they spent so little of the narrative talking about searching the room. So if you go back and watch the, the first part of this uh, series, right, I pointed that out, that the mother, when she talks about going to the room to find Madeline, to discover Madeline missing, spends a very small amount of time describing the actual search of the room. Right? She would rather spend time talking about the hallway and seeing the door and the window leading outwards or the distance between their table and the room, or the exact time she went to the room, right? So she wants to spend time talking about all those things and the details of those, thing, of those things, because those are very easy to lie about, right? Or even just tell the truth, right? She can honestly describe everything except for what she found in the room, because that is the part where she has to lie about the open window and lie about Madeline not being in the bed, right? So it's commission, and omission, which is very difficult to do. It's a huge juggling act in your brain. The very initial things we weren't, but when we did the first sort of direct appeal to the abductor, um, Kate, we were given, and it was told. Once again, the abductor. There's no evidence that, right, it was just one person. Also, if it's a trafficker, like the, I think they think, right, they're, they're trying to imply that this was a trafficking operation. It would be a network of people, be multiple people. Appeal, but I think as much as anything, you know, Kate had probably cried 16 hours a day for four days by the time we did that. And we were just drained. You cannot physically cry 24 hours a day. I mean, it's The impossible. day we did the appeal to the abductor, which is on the Monday, and I spoke to Alan, the counsellor. That could be worth analyzing. 
Uh, if you have that video, I, I didn't come across that, right? The their appeal to the abductor. Uh, please send that to me on X. And also do give me a follow on X um, at Deception Det, D-E-T, as in Deception Detective, but you don't have to write out the whole word detective. Slayer and I said, I feel really numb, and I, I felt really bad that I felt numb. I just, and he said, Kate, you can't cry for 24 hours a day. You know, this is, this is natural, but um, it's hard. I mean, if you laugh, people will say, how can they laugh when their child has been abducted? If you don't laugh, you'll either get called cold or you're on the edge of a nervous breakdown or and it's, it's just hard. You've just you, got to be who you are, you know? Do you have days that when you, when you can forget, when you can sort of not think about it? No, I don't think there's any day when Madeline isn't on my mind. You know, she's always there. But for 18 months, two years, I never thought I'd enjoy myself again. I never thought I'd allow myself to enjoy anything again. Um, right, never again. When do you punish yourself forever? When you've done something that can never be forgiven, right? Something you can never forgive yourself for. If your kid is missing and it's been a couple months, you might still laugh again. In fact, you're going to be elated when your kid is returned, right? You hold out hope that you will laugh again and uh, be able to spend time with them again, right? So the... the uh, definitiveness that they will never be happy again is another bit of leakage, right? You can never be happy again if you've done something you can never forgive yourself for. If your kid is missing, you may be happy again because there's that small sliver of hope that your kid will be returned. Also, the leakage here, there is so much leakage in what they say that if we watch this five different times, we would find five different layers of leakage, right? So this is just the high level stuff. So in the comments, if you notice something else that I glossed over or didn't catch or could put another twist on, do drop it in the comments. I, I tried to read every comment. And in the previous video, there were lots of great comments um, of people pointing out things that, that I didn't touch on or adding an extra twist to things that I mentioned, right? So um, I think if, if you've binged all my videos, you should have enough skills now where you can pick up on stuff if you watch this a second time that I didn't pick up on the first time, right? Um, and with time, you adapt. And I, I, I realize that actually it is okay to do that and it's important to do that. You need to get rest. You need to enjoy your life and you have to be well and happy, you know, for each other, for Madeline when she gets home, for Sean and Emily. And, and thank you. All right, so now for Madeline when she gets home. So you notice they do have some coaching, right, or some self-awareness because it goes back and forth between acting like they think she'll eventually come home and admitting with words like, I'll never be happy again, that they know she won't come home, which is another sign of, a, of deception, the inconsistency. When you're telling the truth, it's consistent because you're speaking based off memory and what you know, right? So if you don't know she's dead, you you don't put anything into permanence. So if you go watch videos of mothers whose children are actually abducted, you'll see that a big theme of them is actually how they are holding out hope that they will see their kid again. And they almost uh, never, even decades later, admit that they might never see their kid again. So this is rare. This is like a huge red flag if we were to do a comparison, right? They're going back and forth between admitting they know they're not going to see her again and will never be happy again, will never forgive themselves, and saying little um, coached, almost scripted phrases like, well, you know, when she does get home, where they almost have to remind themselves to say that. Thankfully, you know, we are in a position now where we get a lot of enjoyment out of things, Sean and Emily in particular. Today, almost five years later, what, what do you believe happened to Madeleine? Well, I mean, my view hasn't changed, you know, since the 4th of May, really. And that is that a man took Madeleine. And 
Wow. So that's what I'm talking about, conclusiveness. My view has not changed since the day she was taken. A man took Madeline. No other theories allowed. That is the hallmark of a hoaxer. When... Uh, I already said this in a previous video, but every other, if you watch my playlist on hoaxers, you'll see every hoaxer, whether it's Bigfoot, aliens, um, having uh, homosexual sex with Barack Obama, every hoaxer does not allow for any other explanation for what happened because they have an agenda. They need you to believe their story because if you don't believe it, their whole house of cards uh, fumble, you know, tumbles down. So it's interesting how committed they are to this story. When in reality, a, a mother whose child is missing would want to entertain all theories. And least of all, they would want to even, some of them might not even be able to accept it. They'd be in denial that this could even be a possibility, right? They would rather believe that one of the other families was playing a sick five-year joke on them by hiding Madeline from them than to think that, uh, a man who they will never find came into the room and took their daughter away. Well, I mean, my view hasn't changed, you know, since the 4th of May, really. And that is that a man took Madeline. And that man was the person who our friend Jane Tanner saw carrying a child away from the area of the apartment. And sadly, I don't really know anything else since. How long do you think you can find the strength to continue this search? Well, as long as it takes. And I don't think any parent um, would ever be able to give up on the child. And even That's... the weeks where we're absolutely shattered. She's right. Any parent would never be able to give up as long as they didn't know what happened. But these parents, through their language, reveal that they have given up. Right? They have come to peace. And you only eventually come to peace once you know for sure that your kid is dead. Um, or there's another injustice that comes your way. You get up the next morning and think, right, let's go again. Because, you know, Madeline's part of our family. We all need her back and she needs to be with us. We just need to keep going. I mean, there are times where you just think, I cannot do this anymore. Um, it's too much and particularly you know the attention that's come through the media but as Kate says you know that bond with us and with Madeline and for Sean and Emily and even if you wanted to I don't think we could stop so notice how the bond is between him his wife and Madeline and then the other two children I think the bond he's talking about is whatever happened in that room that night when Madeline died, right? There's a, a secret that only the three of them know, and it's a special bond, and Madeline's dead, and now Jerry and Kate have a very special bond, right? Where even the twins are outside of that special bond they have with Madeline, because the twins don't know what happened, and we'll, we'll never know what happened, right? Please know that our thoughts are with you. Uh, Kate and Jerry McCann, please welcome to welcome to Stop. Good interview. Let me know if you want to see more of the McCanns. I think this case is fascinating. If we watch enough interviews, maybe we can put the pieces together. I've never looked into it in depth. But the amount of leakage makes me confident that we can shape out a theory where I would want to put all my chips in on it and uh, see if we can get some of the details correct. Almost 20 years later, can we figure out what happened to Madeline McCann using nothing but her parents' own words? I'm a deception detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose liars and manipulators. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, we're going to look at an interview that Madeline McCann's parents did with Antenna 3. I've not watched this interview before. It was sent to me by uh, Rodinas Levis, so one of my followers on X. And he says that in this interview, the parents are confronted with a theory that they used sedatives on Madeline. And he says the answer is fascinating. So that's why I booted up my computer. Let's watch and listen and see if we can figure out where they're lying 
and through their leakage, maybe if we can even figure out what actually happened. If you've seen my previous two videos on the McCanns, you know I think that Madeline died in the bedroom as a result of either getting hit on the head or by having her parents administer sedatives to her because they are both doctors in order to keep her down, help her sleep while they enjoyed their holiday. So let's listen. I feel lonely and um, life's obviously not as happy without Madeline. Um, but, you know, I still have hope. We still have hope. Um, Definitely. And there's still, she's out there. We believe that. I just feel anxious that she's out there and she's not with us. Estamos aquí para hablar de Madeline, por supuesto, pero yo les quería preguntar por sus otros dos hijos. ¿Cómo están Amelia y Son? ¿Se mantienen al margen de este drama? All right, so this interview is in Spanish. All right, forgive me for my non-fluent Spanish, but it looks like the host is asking them, uh, let's see. And she's not with us. Estamos aquí para hablar de Madeline, por supuesto, pero yo les quería preguntar por sus otros dos hijos. So he's asking about their other two children, right? So they have a pair of twins. And uh, what's going on with them? ¿Cómo están Amelia y Son? ¿Se mantienen al margen de este drama? ¿Preguntan por Madeline? I mean, they, they do ask about Madeline. Right, so he asks, do the other siblings ask about Madeline? Madeline. And Madeline was very much a big part of their life. Um, when they ask where she is, that they're not upset, they're not distressed, but they're obviously very aware that she's not there, especially being home. Um, and I guess it, it's hard for us as parents to imagine um, the fun they'd be having together, the three of them, if Madeline was there. Um, I think the hardest thing for me is when they they say things to us like, when is Madeline coming back home? And, you know, we have to say that we don't know, that everyone's looking for her. Yeah, we say that, and now, and now they yeah. say things like we're looking for her, and we're finding Madeline and things. And then, I mean, Emily said the other day, she just said, um, it wasn't to me, actually, it was to my friend, she just said. What's interesting here is, if you saw my other two analyses of an interview the parents did five years after Madeline went missing, they were a lot less emotional than they are here. However, they still don't report a lot of emotion. So this is something I posted today because the Madeline's, I mean, sorry, Madeline's parents, right? The McCann's have lots of hallmarks of hoaxers, right? So as you know, if you've binged all my videos, I like to analyze hoaxers. And four signs of a hoaxer that, you know, we've shaped over the course of analyzing hoaxers are these things, right? And I posted this on X. Four signs of a hoaxer are conclusiveness, right? So uh, the McCanns are conclusive that Madeline was kidnapped by a man when nothing in the evidence supports that 100%. So it's a red flag, right? So hoaxers are conclusive. Secondly, hoaxers are vague about the money shot. So they're vague about the subject of the hoax, the big part of the story that everyone wants to hear. So for Bob Lazar, it's the UFOs. For um, Chris Grush, it's, it's the aliens. Um, for Bob Gimli, it's Bigfoot. So for the McCanns, it's going into the bedroom and discovering that Madeline was not there. But when they talk about that in other interviews, they get very vague. Right? So they're extremely detailed about how far they were sitting from the room or walking up to the room or the time they went to go check the room. But when it comes to actually searching the room, they get very vague. Third is reticence about the money shot. So... In other interviews, when people ask the McCanns, uh, what happened when you checked the room? They delay talking about that part because that's the big lie, right? That's the part they're, they're lying about. So they slow down the narrative, right? They talk about walking to the room. And then um, the mom 
didn't even report turning on the bedroom lights, right? When she checked the room, just said, I went in there. Madeline wasn't there. I left the room. I ran out. So they don't want to spend any time in the room because that's where the lie is centered around what happened in that bedroom. And that's why I think Madeline died in the bedroom, just because of the reticence about talking about them talking about the bedroom. And then this is the most important one regarding what we're seeing here is hoaxers are emotionless. And by that, I mean, they can act emotional in an interview or they can be super emotional right, uh, when they're talking to the press, for example, but they don't report emotions correctly when they're talking about what happened, right? So there's a difference between displayed emotions, which we're seeing here, right? I've, I've never seen them look so sad in an interview. So there's a difference between displayed emotions and reported emotions, where they're talking about the emotions they were feeling or are feeling. And you would expect them to appear emotional and talk with deep emotion if they really do believe their daughter is still out there missing. So just be aware of that. Just because they look sadder here and more weepy, still listen to the actual reported emotions. Because I think you'll find that those will still be lacking. Madeline's coming home to my lovely house and I'm going to share my toys with her. Yo sé que son eh, comparecencias siempre muy difíciles para ustedes. ¿Por qué ahora, después de varios meses eh, sin hablar a los medios, han decidido romper? So saying this difficult for you, and why, after all this time, are you talking to the media? Something along those lines. Silencio. I mean, there's a couple of reasons why we haven't spoken. Um, there's obviously quite a lot that we haven't been able to, to speak about in the last couple of months uh, with circumstances. Um, If I'm honest, I've been a little bit um, disheartened, disillusioned with the media. This is something that Kate says a lot, if I'm honest, which is a sign of deception when people say honestly or to tell you the truth or truthfully. It's a little bit of leakage indicating that some of the stuff they say is not true. And I think yeah, this is beautiful. So one of my subscribers actually commented this exact thing on my previous Madeline video. So he noticed 20 minutes in, Kate, to be honest now, meaning she wasn't honest before. Great comment. And actually pulled up comments um, where I've commented nice catch on some of the comments you guys have left on previous videos because the comments are so good, right? So I have the best followers, the smartest followers. So here Kate did it again. To be honest. Does someone saying to be honest mean that they are lying? No, of course not. Right? We need multiple signs of deception to conclude that someone is being deceptive. However, we do take note of it. Media coverage. And also when she says to be honest, that probably means that she's lying. So let's listen to what she said after to be honest and let's start keeping track of that. When she uses that verbal crutch, to be honest, is what she says afterwards uh, a lie or truthful, based on you know what we can understand from the context. So it could be either one, right? It's up to us to figure out what that verbal crutch means. The same way Jada Pinkett Smith has that verbal crutch where she says, you know what I mean? Right? And I have a ton of comments about that and I actually commented on um in uh, my last Jada Pinkett Smith video, where when she's telling an unbelievable story about someone pointing two guns at her head, she says, you know what I mean, loud and, and giggly like that right afterwards, right? So as far as Jada goes, when she says, you know what I mean, it's usually following a lie. So here we'll figure out what Kate's verbal crutch means. We haven't been able to, to speak about in the last couple of months uh, with circumstances. Um, if I'm honest, I've been a little bit um, disheartened, disillusioned with the media coverage. And I think now, I mean, you mentioned it's six months and it's, it's a long time to be without Madeline. And we believe she's out there. And we just want to appeal again once more to 
the people of Spain, Portugal, North Africa to help us really. And that's why we've got a new central phone number that people can ring. Um, Mantienen hoy todavía la esperanza, creen de verdad que Madeleine sigue viva. I do, maybe even more. So I. So he said, "Do you believe that she's still alive?" Right. If I'm getting my Spanish incorrect, I'm, I'm getting the gist of it. Right. I haven't practiced Spanish in depth in a while. Strongly believe that Madeleine is out there. Um, I think she's probably in someone's house. I don't know why. Um, and I suppose it's a feeling. Wow. That is strange. Let's listen again. She said, I, I believe Madeline's in someone's house. Um, Mantienen hoy todavía la esperanza, creen de verdad que Madeline sigue viva. I do, maybe even more. So I strongly believe that Madeline is out there. Um, I think she's probably in someone's house. I don't know why. Um, and I suppose it's a feeling, but I feel, as Madeline's mummy, I feel in my heart really that she's there. And I don't, I don't believe Madeline has. Another word that liars use is the word really. So intensifiers, like I truly believe she's alive or I really think she's alive. When people use intensifiers without any uh, reason to, it usually indicates a secret doubt. So for example, if I say, I, I really didn't steal your bike but you didn't ask me if I stole your bike, that should be a red flag that I may have stolen your bike. However, if I use an intensifier with you after you accuse me, like for example, if you say, did you steal my bike? And I say, no, I didn't steal your bike. You say, are you sure you didn't steal my bike? Then an intensifier is appropriate, right? Like really, I did not steal your bike. I'm being honest. I didn't take your bike. So Kate uses intensifiers when she's not being pressed. So this is a softball interview. It's not like the other interview we saw with Sklavin, where I spent two episodes analyzing that interview, where he was, you know, looking at them a little bit more skeptical, right? He had his eyebrow raised, and he was ans asking them um, slightly more skeptical questions than we're getting here, right? These are softballs, right? Do you think Madeline's still alive? Why haven't you come to the media in six months? So just listen to the use of intensifiers where she's not getting any pushback, it can reveal a secret doubt. That's what intensifiers reveal, right? You always speak based on everything you know. So if you know you're lying, your brain inadvertently may use intensifiers because you know you need to persuade someone because you're lying. Whereas when you tell the truth, as long as you're not telling the truth in response to some pushback, you don't feel that secret need to persuade because you know you're telling the truth. That's usually why truthful statements are shorter than lies. Mantienen hoy todavía la esperanza, creen de verdad que Madeleine sigue viva. I do, maybe even more, so I strongly believe. That's also weird, right? So he said, do you think Madeleine is still alive, right? Do you still maintain the belief that Madeleine is still alive? And she says, I do, maybe even more so. So that means closer to the event. In the past, she had less belief that Madeline was alive. Which is a little bit of leakage, right? If, if you, like me, believe that they killed Madeline, I think they did it by accident with sedatives. Um, or accidentally hitting something on her head then it makes sense that she believes now more that Madeline's alive than she did then. Because at the time, she knew 100% Madeline was dead because she was there looking at the body. But now she can sort of convince herself, right, or is more distance from, distant from the death. When someone's child goes missing, they maintain hope that they will find their child. But the chances, logically, of the child being dead go up. They don't go down. So that is a weird statement to make. 
believe that Madeline is out there. All right, so let's listen again. Right, so she says, now more than before, she believes Madeline is alive. That's leakage. That's another thing you'll see, right, in these um, uh, analyses I do with the McCanns is they have a ton of leakage. Right? Leakage is when someone reveals the truth through their word choice. And like I said before, because you always speak based on everything you know. So if you speak for long enough, eventually the truth slips out. Lying is very difficult to do. Cool. North Africa. It's help us, really. And that's why we've got a new central phone number that people can ring. Um, Mantienen hoy todavía la esperanza, creen de verdad que Madeline sigue viva. I do, maybe even more. So I strongly believe that Madeline is out there. Um, I think she's probably in someone's house. I don't know why. Um, and I suppose it's a feeling, but I feel, as Madeline's mummy, I feel in my heart really that she's there. And I don't, I don't believe Madeline has been taken away from us permanently. I don't believe her. I don't feel. Right. That's also strange, right? I don't believe Madeline has been taken away from us. If you take the permanently off that, she's basically saying, I don't believe Madeline has been taken away from us. I don't feel it. I don't know who would harm her. I don't think anybody could harm someone as beautiful as Madeline. And I don't say beautiful as in... So that's also strange, right? I don't think anyone could harm her. If someone took her away from her mom and dad, well, they harmed her, right? They kidnapped her from her bedroom, according to their theory. So they're making lots of bizarre statements, right? I don't believe anyone would harm her. If someone kidnapped her, someone already harmed her. She could be getting harmed right now. And this goes back to what I would say about so we have leakage there, right? But also regarding the emotion. They look very sullen and down, right, in the way they're speaking. However, their words, they're not reporting emotions that we would expect from parents. Parents of missing children are terrorized by the idea that their child might be getting harmed. Or even that their child might be missing them. Uh, are wondering, you know, what happened to them? Did, did they get abandoned, right? There's a, there's a million things that they are terrorized by. So to say that we're, we don't think she's being harmed by anyone is strange leakage, but also it's reporting emotions that are incorrect, right? It's reporting a lack of emotion. And this is one reason I prefer statement analysis, right, and deception detecting, de detection the way I do it. Um, I prefer that to uh, body language reading because I don't know how a body language analyst would study this. They might be studying her facial expression more than what she's saying and getting tricked by the um, exhibited emotions rather than the reported emotions. So people know how to lie with their faces and why I, I trust statement analysis over something like a lie detector test. because. Uh, we will never have the opportunity to sit Kate and Jerry down and put them through a lie detector test, right? I will never be able to do that to them. However, I can analyze them remotely through their words. And that's why statement analysis is so powerful. And right, if you binge all my videos, you should be picking up these skills. Also, let me know in the comments if you want me to make a course um, for you guys, because I feel like having a handout or something or a cheat sheet, I've had lots of comments at requesting that could be useful. So it's something I could devote some time to. Maybe when we hit 100,000 followers as a celebration um, to bundle up all these lessons. Her appearance, I mean, beautiful as she is, a beautiful little person. And I don't think anybody would harm her. Permítame que les... So once again, I don't think anybody would harm her. That is a strange thing to say. 
for the mother of a child who has allegedly been kidnapped, right? She says she believes Madeline was kidnapped is a strange thing to say. Eh, transporte ahora al pasado a ese día fatídico, al 3 de mayo. ¿Qué es lo último que recuerdan de Madeline? Stop. Right, so what's the last thing you remember about Madeline? That's a good question. Happy little girl. Beautiful, happy little girl. Yes, thank you for Beautiful, happy little girl. See, this goes back to um, what I think about the sedatives. Right, both of the parents are doctors. And as you know, usually I don't like to have extraneous information about a subject. I like to just listen to the words. However, I do know they're doctors just because it's so famously reported. And I feel like, and I know they were on vacation with another couple. I feel like when they say she was a happy little girl, it means she was loud and boisterous and running around. And, uh, Right, I'm not going to put all my poker chips in on this theory, but it is my best hunch right now that she was loud. They used sedatives, perhaps too much sedative on Madeline to put her to sleep so they could go enjoy dinner. And then when they were checking the bedroom, right, I believe if you saw my previous analysis, I believe Jerry found her dying and, uh, And he was the one who first discovered the body. So I think that when Kate says her last memory of Madeline is a happy, beautiful girl, she's recalling Madeline probably being loud and boisterous and running around and hyper before bedtime, right? Before they administered the sedatives. And right, this is a, this is a big uh, leap right now. But uh, we're trying to polish the details, right? So... This is my best theory right now. I'm not going all in, betting all my chips on it. I'm just giving you guys my thoughts as I have them. Of all the times, the nice times that I've had in our house and her and playing in the playroom with us. With us. Right, so once again, even Jerry, right? Playing, playing in the playroom. I feel like they're leaking that she was loud and running around before bedtime. Because right, yes, what is your last memory of her? The twins. ¿Creen ustedes que necesitan todavía más la ayuda de desde España? Definitely. I think he's saying, do you want more help from Spain or something? One second. And the playroom with us, with us, the twins. ¿Creen ustedes que necesitan todavía más la ayuda de? Okay, so do you believe you still need help from Spain to find Madeline? Desde España. Definitely. I mean, I think, you know, the public can help so much. I think if people know something, if they can um, just, I guess, search the heart, really. Somebody knows something, and they might not realize it. They might just suspect something. But every, everybody can make a difference to this. It's not about us. We miss it like crazy. But this is Madeline. This is a four-year-old girl. We haven't even seen her since she's been four. You know, Madeline's there, and she needs our help. Oh, was that some leakage? She said Madeline is a four-year-old girl. When was this interview done? A few years later? I don't know when this interview was done, but if it was done over a year later... That is strange to say Madeline is a four-year-old girl. That means that Madeline stopped aging. And I actually think Kate corrected herself after she said it. Right? She said Madeline's a four-year-old girl, and then she said we haven't seen her since she was four. So that is actually uh, a huge red flag. That actually reveals that they, they do know, that could reveal they do know she's dead, right? So... One sign of deception does not mean someone's being deceptive. However, like I, I always say, enough drops can make a flood, right? Enough drops can make a river. And we've already seen in my previous videos on the McCanns plenty of, of drops of deception and leakage. And I think, you know, the public can help so much. I think if people know something, if they can um, just, 
I guess search the heart really. Somebody knows something and they might not realise it, they might just suspect something. But every, everybody can make a difference to this. It's not about us, we miss it like crazy, but this is Madeline, this is a four-year-old girl. We have right, This is a four-year-old girl. If this is uh, two or one or two or three years later, she should be saying, Madeline is a five-year-old girl, a six-year-old girl, right? Keeping tabs on her age, celebrating her birthdays while she's missing, if they truly believe she's still out there and can come home. So this is actually um, a bright red flag of leakage. You will not hear the mother of an actual missing child talk about their child as if they permanently stayed the age they were when they were missing. In fact, lots of times they were wondering, you know, um, how, what are they going to look like? How are they growing? Um, how tall is she? Does she look more like me? Right. So they have all these questions. What will they look like? And they even spend uh, right time making posters updating the age. Right. It's something that is obsessed about. So this is strange that she says Madeline is a four year old girl, and then she she catches herself and and corrects it. We haven't even seen her since she's been four. Right. But every, everybody can make a difference to this. It's not about us. We miss it like crazy. But this is Madeline. This is a four-year-old girl. We haven't even seen her since she's been four. Right, so she caught herself. And she used, used extra words, which can be a sign of deception, right? The, the verbiage. We haven't seen her since she was four is a better statement than we haven't even seen her since she was four. Now, Madeline's there, and she needs our help. She needs to be with her family, you know. Uh, as parents, we just were asking. As parents, for people to try and reunite an innocent four-year-old girl with her parents. So strange. Wow. So Jerry made the same mistake. An innocent four-year-old girl. She's not four anymore, right? Unless she is, right? If she is still four years old, then that's appropriate. However, the interviewer mentioned earlier that it's been six months since the last time they went to the media. So maybe nine months have passed. I don't know if a birthday has passed. But if she is no longer four years old and they're referring to her as a four-year-old girl, that means that their image of her has stopped, right? Their mental image of Madeline is at four years old because she's dead. She's no longer growing. They're no longer curious about what age she might be now. Because she is no age. She died at four. Right, I hope that makes sense. Ustedes han sido considerados sospechosos por la policía portuguesa, pero hay muchos... All right, so you are considered as suspects by the Portuguese police. Los investigadores, sobre todo aquí en el Reino Unido, que mantienen eh, su inocencia. Sin em And you maintain your innocence. Sin embargo, yo les quería preguntar por sus amigos, por esos siete amigos que estuvieron con ustedes en el Algarve. ¿Confían plenamente en ellos? 100%. I think he's asking, right, do you uh, believe that the people you were with are also innocent, right? That they're not suspects? 100%. Of everyone. Of our friends, yes. Good question. So this is actually something I touched upon in my previous McCann's video. I said it was bizarre, A, that the parents do not accuse each other, right? There's no bickering. For example... You were the one who said we should go down to dinner and leave the kids sleeping in the bedroom. You know, why, why did you do that? Or did you actually check in the bedroom to make sure there wasn't a huge window open when you went to check? Right? So there's no accusations between them, each other. But also, there is no accusations of the other parents, which I said in the previous video was bizarre. Right? They never said... You know, like, we might be family friends, but did you take my daughter, right? Are you playing some sick joke on me? You know, wh what did you do with Madeline, right? No accusations, no um, curiosity, right? Not even bringing up the, the uh, possibility. Whereas a, a parent of a real missing child would never be so conclusive. All options would be open. And this goes back to this post I did on X. Right? One of the four signs of a coaxer, conclusiveness. 
So the interviewer asked, is, it, is there no possibility that the other people you were with are the ones who took your daughter, right? You're sure they're innocent? And listen to the conclusiveness, right? She says, it's impossible that they did it. Why are hoaxers conclusive, right? Why is she conclusive about this? Because they know the truth, right? They're not curious about it because they know what actually happened. And their agenda is to make you believe one story, right? So if they know they killed Madeline, they're not curious about the friends taking her because they know that didn't happen. They're concerned about making you believe that some random kidnapper who will never get caught stole her because that's their alibi. That's their story and they have to stick to it. So let's listen to her again. Listen to the conclusiveness. Completely in ellos. 100%. 100%. Right, 100%. It is impossible that my friends took Madeline. Of everyone. Of our friends, yes. Right. In missing ch uh, children's cases, parents often get divorced, right? They will turn on each other, but they're not even suspecting their friends, right? That's a giant red flag. It indicates knowledge outside the reported facts. It indicates they know what actually happened. That's why they're not curious about the friends. That's why they're not accusing the friends. That's why they're not accusing each other, right? Did they accuse the hotel staff? I don't know, right? Because ever since they first came out with this, they've been insistent that a kidnapper came through the window and took Madeline. And that insistence on that story and the conclusiveness about it is a giant red flag. And that's why conclusiveness is the first on my list of four signs of a hoaxer. Absolutely. And, but, you know... The same way that we will be eliminated, they will as well. No doubt in my mind about that. We are much more optimistic. Right, they will be eliminated as suspects. We have no doubt in our minds. These are people speaking like they know what actually happened because they do. Right, when they were talking about, well, someone knows something, call the phone number, someone has to search their heart, someone might know something. That's how you know all that is ingenuine and scripted. Because when it comes to the friends and each other, there is no searching of the heart or someone might know something, rack your brains. They're, they're conclusive that they had nothing to do with it. Right, so that conclusiveness is a giant red flag. So this is um, a shout out to Rodina Sleves. Great interview. Uh, I'm lucky I speak Spanish, though. So I want to give him a shout-out for sending this because this has a ton of leakage. Um, let's keep listening. Domestic about what Mr. Ribeiro, the National Director, and Mr. Ribello are saying, that all lines of inquiry are open. And we... Right, all lines of inquiry are open. However, he just contradicted himself by saying 100% it's not the friend's. And between each other, it's 100% it wasn't one of us. They checked the bedroom separately. If my kid went missing, as dark and as hard as it would be, I would still have questions about the spouse who went and checked on the kid last. Right? Are you, are you sure you didn't do something weird? Right? You didn't try to play a joke on me. Are you sure you saw Madeline? Right? So... And why are they so close? Because they know the truth. They know they're murderers, so they're co-conspirators. That is my theory, based on the analysis I've done, right? Then again, I've only watched um, that Sklavin interview, which I broke into two parts, and this, and some outside material about the case. We know, because of our, we know we are innocent, we know that she was taken. Once again, the conclusiveness, we know she was taken. That is a giant red flag. We can't really talk in detail about the Arguido status, but I, the way I... I think he's just saying that they're, they're under suspicion. I understand it is... Their guido status is to give, defend your own rights. So if the police want to ask questions, difficult questions, they have to make your guido. 
So that, that in itself isn't a problem. We have not been charged with anything. The investigation continues and we will be eliminated. And the key thing is Madeline is out there. And everyone oh, and as traumatic as it's been, it's secondary. It really is secondary. I'll take anything that's thrown at me, but number one is getting my daughter back, without doubt. Anything that's thrown at me. Stuff like that is why I think Madeline might have been hit on the head with something. All right, this is uh, right, a huge leap based on a little bit of leakage. But I think something's triggering in my brain about the previous ones. I think they use some language like throwing um, or hitting. Right, If we did a deep dive statement analysis breakdown, we would discover lots more leakage. That's why I think the comments on the videos are so good because if we watch these videos five times, we will find five different layers of leakage. So that's why I try to read, I do read every single comment, even if I don't reply to every single comment. So if you find more instances of violent language like that, right? Like we'll take anything that's thrown at me or even Jerry, right? We will be eliminated. These are weird choices of words. But without enough of them, it's a big leap, right? So these are the only two I've keyed on to right now. But it's triggering something in my memory. Se consideran en parte eh, condenados ya en un juicio paralelo por la opinión pública o por una proporción importante de la opinión pública y por también una parte de los medios. I think it's hard. Um, I, think I think they're saying like, do you consider the public opinion and the opinion of the media? People are reading every day that someone has done something or is guilty of something, it's hard to ignore it. But, you know, we've always said, always said that, you know, we will wait for the facts and, and to look at what the, the official and statements are saying. And that, that scenario hasn't changed. Um, I don't know how some of the things have been published. Uh, and we've asked for responsible reporting. Um, and we still ask for that. But the key thing for us is finding out where Madeline is. Hay mucha gente en España que se pregunta si unos padres que son injustamente acusados de la desaparición de su hija no deberían reaccionar de una forma más airada, no tan fría. After being made a guido. I think you're saying that you come off as cold as parents who are accused. I might be wrong. Especially. You know, we know the truth. I know I'm innocent. Jerry knows he's innocent. We know each other are innocent. And that, to me, it was actually quite calm because I thought... See, it is strange, right? Like I said, the conclusive. We know the truth. I know I'm innocent. At that stage, that's if you are innocent, that's the only thing you know. Because you were going back and forth checking the room. You don't know if the other spouse is innocent, and you definitely don't know if the other friends are innocent. So the conclusiveness of what they say, the only conclusive thing you could say is, I'm innocent. That would be appropriate. I am innocent. But to say conclusively that the other spouse is innocent, uh, I mean, obviously, you would expect them to do that in, in the public. But they do it constantly. And uh, they're so insistent on the other one that, that um, it's, it's extremely conclusive, which is a red flag for hoaxers. Right? If it were the only red flag, we would dismiss it. But there's tons of other red flags. So we're innocent, we're totally innocent, and we know that. And I think as well that you've got to remember it was um, it was over. Also, like they say, we're totally innocent. When a child goes missing, parents blame themselves for not being better, right? As crazy as it is, right? Even if they did everything right, if the kid goes missing, they say, "Well, you know, I, I maybe I should have." Uh, put more security systems in the house, right? Or I should have walked them home from school every day. So they, they have doubts about themselves, right? Uh, and these parents, right, did do something. I don't know if it rises to the level of child neglect because, well, you know, if you believe the true story, right, at the very least they admitted they left the uh, infant's sleeping in a bedroom alone while they ate dinner, uh, you know, at the other part of the resort. And 
if you believe their story, they should still feel bad about, well, maybe, you know, we shouldn't have left them in there, right? So there would be some level of self-blame and self-questioning. But here, because they know they're guilty, they have to persuade you that they are 100% innocent. They can leave no room for doubt, right? Their life depends on, make, on convincing you that they're innocent. So they leave no wiggle room, um, no option that they did it, no option that they may have been a little bit neglectful, um, even in the choice of friends they brought with them, right? So it's that conclusiveness and that persuasiveness that, that we are certain we are innocent, we did nothing wrong, that insistence is, the, is a red flag. Four months since Madeline disappeared. It's like when uh, Bob Gimley, the guy who allegedly took the video of Bigfoot, was asked, could it not have been someone tricking you, some person wearing a costume? And he said, no, impossible. That's how you know it's a hoax. That's how you know he's a hoaxer. Because of course it's possible someone could be fooling him. In fact, that's far more likely. It is far more likely that it was an elaborate hoax. Or Chris Grush, when he was asked... Uh, you know, is it possible that the UFOs you're reading about are simply aircrafts made by other government departments that don't communicate with each other? And he said, no, that's impossible. Right? That conclusiveness is the hallmark of a hoaxer. Of course it's possible. And if you're telling the truth, you would entertain that possibility because your goal is to get to the truth. If you're lying, your goal is to convince every single person about the story you're trying to get across. There can be no room for doubt disappeared and nothing nothing that's happened to us in this time right. has come close to upsetting us the way we felt when we discovered madeline missing when we discovered madeline missing It is a weird phrase, but I feel like I use it myself too sometimes when I'm describing this, right? But it is weird to say that you discovered something that wasn't there, right? It's more appropriate to say when I noticed Madeline was missing or when we realized Madeline was gone. The more uh, appropriate grammatical thing is when we discovered Madeline dead. Makes more grammatical sense. Claro que van a seguir buscando a Madeline, que creen que puede estar en España y que necesitan ayuda de los españoles. Pero mientras tanto continúa la investigación policial y se espera que se hagan públicas unas pruebas de ADN que les podrían incriminar. ¿Cómo esperan? ¿Cómo viven esa espera? ¿Con miedo, con inquietud, con esperanza? And he's saying, you know, uh, how do you feel about that? You know, are you worried about it? You know, I'm not concerned, if I'm honest. We're certainly not scared, you know. There she uses that if I'm honest thing again. So he asked about the DNA in the car. And she said, I'm not concerned if I'm honest. So if we go back and we look at every time she says, if I'm honest, right? Every time she uses that verbal crutch. If she's lying every time she uses it, that means she is concerned about the DNA. Like I said, if these videos do well, we'll do a deep dive into this. Because as I say in each of these videos, there's so much leakage with these parents. If we actually spent enough time on it, we I think we could piece together everything. You know, if there is anything in the DNA results and we don't know them and we, we cannot know them and I don't believe anyone in the press knows them either, but there is nothing in those DNA tests related to Kate and I that will show anything other than completely innocent. Um, Interesting. So are they worried that Madeline's DNA will show up? Because right, he's saying there's nothing that will show Kate in my DNA. It will show guilt, but he excluded Madeline. And this goes back to something I said in the last video, when they mentioned in the video that they got a rental car after Madeline was quote unquote taken. And I speculated that they may have put Madeline in the car and taken her to the ocean based on the leakage 
So if you haven't seen the other two videos I've done, you should go uh, watch those after this. Make sure to subscribe because I'm sure YouTube will serve them up into your feed. But in that one, we basically theorized, and this seems to support that theory, that Madeline was given sedatives, which killed her. Uh, Jerry found her. He and his wife concocted the story of the kidnapper. And then they took Madeline and put her in the ocean. And then when I heard about them bringing up the rental car, um, I theorized that they may have put her in the trunk of the car and drove her to the ocean. And now they're sort of leaking that uh, they are worried about that DNA based on Kate's verbal crutch, right? If I'm being honest, I'm not concerned. And Jerry, right? There will be no DNA from me and Kate, excluding Madeline, right? So he's leaving open the possibility that maybe Madeline's DNA will be in there. Whether that is enough to eliminate us, I don't know, but we will be eliminated. I'm confident of that because we have done nothing. Also, notice how we left off the word, we've done nothing wrong. Dropped words are something you should be attuned to. Lots of times people will say a sentence um, when they're lying and hope that you just imply, you infer the rest of the sentence. Like we saw with Nadia when she was doing the lie detector. The lie detector guy asked her, have you ever cheated on a partner? And Nadia said, never cheated. Right, Leaving off the pronoun I, I've never cheated. Never cheated does not mean anything. Saying we've never done anything is not the same as saying we never done anything wrong. So these dropped words should also be red flags. Like I say, there are so many layers to their leakage. We could find a lot here if we broke it down in depth. That's why I think your comments are valuable because you will notice stuff on your second watch or third watch that I did not notice on this watch. Right, this is all the high level stuff I'm noticing in real time. And those DNA tests related to Kate and I that will show anything other than completely innocent. Um, whether that is enough to eliminate us, I don't know, but we will be eliminated. I'm confident of that because we have done nothing. Right, we have done nothing. Hay mucha gente que piensa que ustedes eh, son inocentes. Hay gente que sigue queriendo ayudarles. Y sobre todo hay mucha gente que independientemente de lo que piensen de ustedes, quieren que Madeleine aparezca viva. So he's saying, right, there's lots of people who think that you're innocent, who want you to get Madeleine home alive. ¿Qué les diría a esa gente? ¿Qué What do you tell those people? mensaje les transmitiría a los españoles ahora mismo? What message do you want to give to those people? Yes, please help us. Please help us as a family. Please help Please help us. If your daughter is missing, what would you say? If my daughter was missing, I would say, please help Madeline. But listen to their priority. Please help us. This is the type of leakage I'm talking about where this is, uh, this is why people suspected them from day one. Because this sort of leakage, even if you don't know exactly what's hitting you the wrong way, can be detected instinctively. If your daughter's missing, the message you give out is, please help Madeline. Wanted, Madeline. Not, please help us. When you say, please help us, you're basically leaking that you know Madeline is already beyond the need for help. She's dead. Please help us find Madeline. Please help Madeline. So, oh, now she corrects herself. All right, so... Les transmitiría a los españoles. All right, so listen to her first answer. Also realize that, and we saw this in the previous interview, they say some stuff correctly, and then they also say stuff incorrectly. When you're telling the truth these inconsistencies don't happen. At least they don't happen this often because you're telling the truth. What happens with liars is they say some stuff correctly because they're conscious that they're lying and they want to say the right thing. Like, for example, always referring to Madeline in the present tense, except for when they admit, you know, we'll never be happy again. So they contradict themselves. 
right? If she's still alive and you're referring to her in the present tense, you may be happy again. She might get found. Or here, what is the one message you want to give? Please help us. And then she catches herself. Please help Madeline. So listen again. Yeah, sure mismo. <sighs> It's please help us. Please help us as a family. Please help us find Madeline. Right, so there you go. Please help us. Please help us as a family. And finally, please help us find Madeline. Please help Madeline. And then finally, right, so it took her five attempts to say the thing the real a mother of a real missing child would say, which is please help Madeline. So like I said, these are not good liars. A good liar would be able to get that right and maybe in two attempts, right? Wouldn't take five attempts. Please, if you know any information at all, or you suspect anything, no matter how small. And look at how they contradict themselves, right? If you know anything, any information at all, right? So they're asking for all these tidbits of information all the way in Spain and Sweden. Mm -hmm. However, when it comes to the people who were there with them, their friends who are checking on the kids in the bedrooms, 100% no, they didn't do it. There's zero curiosity about them, right? We don't need any tidbits about them. That is another contradiction, right? So this is how they, lots of people pick up on this instinctively, but it's also how some people get fooled because they listen to all the correct things that they're saying, right? Well, she did say, please help Madeline. Yes, she did. After five variations, and the first one of which was, please help us. And that first variation was not, please help us find Madeline. It was, please help us, and please help us as a family. Then finally, please help us find Madeline. Or maybe it was four attempts, right? And then, please help Madeline. Something along those lines, right? It took three or four attempts. But if someone's not paying attention to what's actually being said, they miss all the screw-ups and, and only listen to what they expect to hear. Right? They expect her to say the right thing, so that's all they hear. So that's another critical skill just in life in general. Listen to what is actually being said. If someone implies something, that's not the same as someone declaring it. So if someone doesn't actually say, if someone doesn't say, I didn't cheat on the video game, don't put those words into their mouth, right? Or if they, uh, right, if they don't say, my daughter is missing, then don't put those words into their mouth. Small, please, you know, just find it in yourself really have that courage to make that call to the new number. strange it's like she's talking to herself find it in yourself All right what are these random spanish people supposed to find in themselves oh please you know just find it in yourself really have that courage to make that call to the new number it's almost like she's looking in the mirror, talking to herself. And help us bring Madeline home. Jerry, hay también mucha gente que considera que quizás ya habría llegado el momento, después de estos meses, de mantener la esperanza y seguir la búsqueda, pero desde un ámbito un poquito más privado. Todo este entorno eh, mediático de asesores que tiene no les perjudica. I think he's saying, right, some people think you seem a little bit cold or reserved. Uh, I don't think so, uh, that it is bad. We, you know, she's been missing for almost six months now, and the longer that goes on, the more um, high risk or aggressive the strategy for us is. We have waited and been incredibly patient. Clearly, the media attention has never gone away. Yeah. It's never I mean, gone away. We haven't spoken for long, and, you know, and, day uh, after day, Madeline's in the paper. We're on the front page and we've said nothing. Permítame que ahora ya en los minutos finales de la entrevista les haga algunas preguntas sobre algunas cuestiones de, de aquella noche. All right, so I think... So Radinas told me in his ex post to me that at 11.36 they're confronted with the theory of using sedatives, which is a theory I believe. So I think that's going to come up here. So right now he's saying, you know, allow me to ask a question in these final minutes about a theory. De la noche del 3 de mayo. Or rather, about that night. 
¿Qué es lo último que recuerdan de Madeleine ese día? Once again, what is the last thing you remember about Madeleine? So they've already answered this question before in this interview and in previous interviews. So let's listen to what they say now. A little bit like I mentioned before, she was very happy um, and very loving. And, you know, I know Madeline was very happy with her life. Madeline was very happy with her life. Like I said, I think she was being loud that night and running around and being hyper, keeping the twins up. And they used a sedative to put her to sleep. They used too much. And uh, she died in the bedroom. She's special. Usted, Kate, estuvo, fue la última que la vio, ¿verdad? Porque... You said, Kate, you were the last one to see her alive. Jerry estaba jugando tenis, creo, ¿no es así? Because Jerry was playing tennis. Mm. I, I, saw, I saw it and um, I thought how beautiful she was and how lucky I was. To... So he said almost this exact same phrase in multiple interviews now, right? I saw her, I thought how beautiful she was. The father of three children. I thought how lucky I was. Let's listen to his answer again because I'm going to point out some huge leakage here. Okay. I, saw, I saw it and um, I thought how beautiful she was and how lucky I was to be. So when you're recounting something you thought, for example, if I was holding a puppy, I would say I thought how cute it is, how happy it is. Now, if I'm talking about a puppy that just got run over, and I pick it up, I'll say, I thought how cute it was, how happy it was, because the puppy's dead now, right? It's past tense. I'm relaying the thoughts I had at that time. So if I'm looking at a cute little puppy, I'm saying how cute it is, right? I remember how cute it is, right? I thought to myself, this is so cute, it's so fun. If it's dead, I would say, I, I, you know, I was so sad, I thought to myself how cute it was. It was so fun, right? Past tense. So look, even as he's recounting this thought he had, it's in the past tense. The father of three children. Mm. I, saw, I saw it and um, I thought how beautiful she was. Right, how beautiful she was. I think what he's revealing here is the last time he saw her, she was dead. So he did think, yeah, he's being honest here. The last time I saw her, I thought how beautiful she was. And how lucky I was. How lucky I was, right? I was lucky. I had the perfect family. To be father of three children. And how lucky I was to be the father of three children. Because now, I'm the father of two children. It's past tense. I am no longer the father of three children. So the tense is another thing you should always listen for. Right? This, he is, in my opinion, relaying honestly the last time he saw Madeline and the thoughts he had the last time he saw her, right? I was very lucky. I was the father of three kids, and she was very beautiful, but not anymore, right? I'm not lucky anymore. She's dead now. She was a very beautiful little girl, and I'm no longer the father of three children. I'm the father of two children now. I... Also, even if you think they are killers, it's still a tragic tale. Right? It's a tragedy either way. I think they did it by accident. That's also why I don't like covering true crime too much, right? Because this stuff is heavy. I would rather talk about um, sadists like Jada Pinkett Smith or even Ruby Frankie than talk about um, dead children. Una teoría que se extendió en la prensa y es que pudo haber sido un accidente. All right, so here's the question. Could it have been an accident that night? Father of three children. Hay una teoría que se extendió en la prensa y es que... All right, so here we go. This is the money shot question. That night, could it have been an accident? Right? Could you have killed Madeline by accident? Now, let's listen to the response they give 
because I think this will be a major clue into understanding what happened that night. Pudo haber sido un accidente por una sedación de los niños. Ustedes han negado reiteradas veces que jamás dieran calmantes o médicos los dos. Jamás. Okay, so he's saying, so in the past you do admit to having given them something to calm them down, right? Sedatives. Dieran calmantes a sus hijos para dormirles. You know, I'm not... Right? You admitted to giving your kids sedatives to put them to sleep. I'm not even going to answer that question, I'm afraid. I mean, it's ludicrous. And... Wow. I'm not even going to answer that question. I'm afraid. That is leakage. She basically just said she's afraid to answer that question. Why? Because it's the truth. Now look at the mockery. We've never seen Jerry get this riled up about a question. And, you know, these sort of... It's ridiculous, right? Mockery is another sign of a liar. Which is why when um, I see mockery, it's weak, right? It means you have doubt. It's not elite. It's not an elite way to speak. It's how people who have secret doubts speak, which is why I don't like mockery in general, but also it's a sign of a liar. So I'm not going to even answer that, I'm afraid. If you didn't do it that night, why not say, no, of course, we did not do it that night. No, we did not use sedatives on her. Instead, she says, I, I'm not going to answer that, I'm afraid. She's leaking, right? Her brain is leaking the truth. She's afraid. She is afraid to answer that question. You know, I'm not even going to answer that question, I'm afraid. I mean, it's ludicrous. And, you know, these... What's so ludicrous about it? Why is it ludicrous to suspect something that's totally reasonable and that they've admitted to using sedatives on their children in the past to put them to sleep? It's, it's actually very far from ludicrous. It's actually more believable than a kidnapper randomly coming in and taking their child. So it's the furthest thing from ludicrous. These sort of questions and the publishing of them are nonsense, and we shouldn't be giving them the time of day. There is mm. absolutely no suggestion um, that Madeline or the children were drugged. Right, so he actually leaked a little bit, right, that Madeline was drugged. Because I think only Madeline was drugged. And it's outrageous. What I'm going to say is... Also, he never denied it, right? He never said it never happened. He just said there's no suggestion of it. And this goes back to it being very difficult to lie. This is how we caught Nadia cheating on war zones. It's how we caught Liver King lying about taking steroids. It's how we've caught lots of liars by weak denials. If you're telling the truth, you can deny things easily because you're telling the truth. But it is surprisingly difficult for people to deny things that they've done. And like we've seen here, Jerry and Kate are not sophisticated liars. So they can't actually say that they didn't do it. The most they can do is imply it, right? There's no suggestion that happened. Well, you would know, so you could just tell us it didn't happen, right? But he can't do that. And so there's no suggestion it happened. So notice how there is no denial. It's not a reliable denial. And if you want to see the difference between a reliable and an unreliable denial, watch my most watched video. It has like a quarter of a million views on YouTube. What does a reliable denial look like? And you will see a stark contrast to this, which is a weak denial. Okay. There is absolutely no suggestion um, that Madeline or Right, so absolutely, so an intensifier. To a simple question, right, was it possible? That's why it goes back to what I say about intensifiers. No suggestion. Well, if you didn't do it, you could say you didn't do it. You don't need to rely on extraneous suggestions and evidence. You could just tell us it didn't happen. Oh, the children were drugged, and it's outrageous. What I'm going to say is I'm Madeline's mummy. I know she was taken from that apartment and she's out there. Wow. So they're getting desperate at this question. All I know is Madeline was taken, right? So straight back to the alibi. So they're not even on offense anymore, right? Now they're going on to defense. They're directing the interview now. She was taken. 
I'm her mommy. I, she was taken. So I, this does indicate that we might be onto the right theory. I think that they gave her a sedative because look how anxious they are about this. All of a sudden we're into mockery. We're into trying to direct to the conversation, right? To get off the topic. We're onto everything a hoaxer does, right? They're conclusive now. She was taken without denying that they drugged her, right? So there was no denial that they did it. You know, even if we did drug her, she was taken. Vagueness, reticence, they don't want to talk about this. So this is, um, this is a money shot of an interview for sure. He asked the right question and they're displaying all the signs of a liar. They don't want to talk about it, right? They refuse to even answer the question. And when they get close to answering it, they don't even make a direct denial, right? Even Jerry didn't say they didn't do it. He just said, we shouldn't give this the time of day, right? There's no suggestion. Imagine if your spouse came, came up to you and said, did you, did you cheat on me last week? And you say, there is no suggestion that I cheated on you last week. What would they think? Would that be satisfactory? Of course not, right? Because it's not a denial. Or, you know, or if, if your spouse said, did you cheat on me last week? And you say, you know what? We shouldn't even be giving this the time of day. I'm not going to talk about this. That would be a huge red flag. Right? So when you think about it in other more relatable contexts, you can see how wild the res these responses are. Right? Did you cheat on me? That's ludicrous. You're ludicrous. You're crazy. Right? That is a huge red flag. Right? So whenever you think that, you know, I'm making a giant leap, try putting it into a different context. Right? I could put this into a hundred different contexts to illustrate it, but I think that illustrates it. Right? So just imagine asking someone something and them reacting in this way regarding that question, and you'll understand how ludicrous it is. Right there, there we go with that word it's stuck in my head now. I understand how crazy it is to answer that way. And I want to back. I mean, that that is all. I mean, everything else. I'm sorry, is rubbish. Siguen hoy ustedes. Rubbish. I think it's more leakage, right? I think, um, like I said, I think they disposed of Madeline in the ocean. They may have wrapped her in a trash bag. The words they're choosing here when they're shaken up are very important. This is probably one of the most dense interviews I've ever covered on the channel with the amount of leakage that we're getting. And one reason why I think if we watched enough interviews in enough, enough depth, we would get to the bottom of this case, right? as unbelievable as it sounds. Um, right, so this is, we're 12 and a half minutes into a 13 minute interview and I've been on recording for over an hour, right? That just shows you how dense this interview is. And, uh, please make sure to like, subscribe and share my videos so we can get more eyes onto it, which means more people adding to the comments. And basically the way I pick the videos I'm going to cover are by which ones do well in the YouTube algorithm. So that helps boost them in the algorithm when you drop relevant comments, uh, like them, subscribe, and share them. Ustedes dos igual de unidos en el terreno personal, igual de unidos que antes de la desaparición de Madeline, o más unidos todavía. What do you think? So he's saying, are you closer together now that Madeline's gone? <laughs> Very close. See, and this interviewer is asking good questions. Right? It's actually hitting on lots of the points I made in the previous video. Lots of parents of missing children bicker, end up getting divorced, right? They can't even look at each other. But they're saying they're closer, which goes to my theory that they're co-conspirators, right? They cooked up this alibi about the kidnapper together, and now they are bound for life. And they even talk about themselves as a we, right? Never I. It's always we, right? They are, they are stuck together for life. We're completely together in this, and we're united in the search for Madeline, her, her daughter. Right, we're together in this. What's this? The murder of Madeline. 
right? This ordeal we're going through right now, trying to get away with murder. We're together. We're united. Desde aquel día, en todo este tiempo, casi seis meses, ¿hay algo de lo que ustedes se arrepientan? ¿Algo que crean que no hicieron bien? Ok, another great question. Is there anything that you regret? Now, the parent of a missing child would not be conclusive. Right? Conclusiveness is one of the signs of a hoaxer. The parent of a missing child would probably, would admit some of the faults, right? I, I, I'm kicking myself for leaving her alone in that room. I wish I'd never went on vacation, right? They would be filled with regrets, right? Their life would consist of regrets, even if they didn't do anything wrong. A hoaxer would leave no room for doubt. They would minimize their regrets Because, hey, we didn't do anything wrong. Someone broke in and took Madeline. There's nothing we could have done about it. Don't even look at me as a suspect. So let's see how they answer. Not from the minute we find they're gone. Pues muchísimas gracias por... Wow. Textbook, right? No regrets. We anticipated that one. It's always nice when you make a prediction about what someone's going to say, and then they say it. Haber hablado con nosotros para Antena 3 Televisión. Y lo que sí les podemos asegurar es que desde España hay millones de personas que desean. So now they're wrapping up the interview. The Portuguese police have issued an apology to the McCanns. Should the police have done that? If not, why did they do it? I have my own thoughts. I'm deception detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis. And this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we get into the video, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's episode, we're going to continue an interview that Piers Morgan did with the McCanns. And we're actually at the part of the interview here where he asks the McCanns about their interaction with the Portuguese police. So we're going to listen to this part of the interview. I've not heard it before, so you'll be hearing it with me. But as we listen, let's try to uncover, A, the thoughts of the Portuguese police, which might give us a clue why they just issued this apology to the McCanns so many years later. And as we always do on my channel, listen to the words of the McCanns to see if we can figure out the truth of what happened the night that Madeline went missing. So that, to me, would seem more oh, suspicious. Yeah, absolutely. When we come back, I want to talk to you about the moment that you realized for the first time that the Portuguese police were not looking for anybody else in connection with Madness's disappearance. They were looking at you. When the mood began to change, massive media attention, a lot of criticism against the Portuguese police and authorities for not moving quickly enough, not doing their job properly, and they retaliate, it seems to me, or they respond, let's be polite here, in the worst possible way, as far as you're concerned. They, they make you formal suspects, our Guido. What was the moment like for you when you heard that was happening? Because that completely changed things. I, mean, I think this had gone on probably sort of end of July into August, really. Um, there's certainly a change in the media coverage. If you've seen my previous videos on the McCanns, I've done five of them now. You'll know my opinion of what happened that night. And I do believe, based on what the McCanns have said, right, without much outside knowledge at all of the case, although many of you have clued me into extra details in the comments, which is uh, very insightful. Without much knowledge of the case, the McCanns, based on their own words, have leaked through the words that they choose what I suspect actually happened that night. And so far, I'm crystallizing my opinion, but I feel that they over-sedated Maddie on the night that she allegedly disappeared, and she died from over-sedation, right? So they were trying to put her to bed to calm her down so that they could go enjoy their vacation. As a result, she died. Uh, Jerry was there when she died. And then they scripted a story together of their alibi, and they've stuck to it ever since, that some third unknown party 
kidnapped Madeline and ran off with her. And I think what they really did was dispose of the body somewhere cold, whether that was the ocean or somewhere else, just based on their language. To me, it sounds like they disposed of the body somewhere cold. Now, um, how they did this or uh, the exact night Madeline died, let's say some people say there's a theory she died three nights before, whatever that may be, that's not my job, right? If it comes on language, I'll add it to my uh, thesis here. But how they pulled off burying her or um, storing the body until they could take it to the water, I haven't figured that out yet, right? So it's kind of like seeing a magic trick. Just because I don't know how the magic trick was accomplished doesn't mean magic exists, right? I just haven't seen that angle yet. So like I say, so far I think Madeline was over sedated. I feel like Jerry was there when she died. And I think that they disposed of her body uh, somewhere cold, most likely the ocean, a body of water. And if you want to know how I came up with all that, you'd need to watch these videos because we formulated this thesis over the course of five interviews now in three, uh, five videos in three interviews, right? And this is the third interview we're still analyzing. So... I think, all that is to say, I think the Portuguese police suspected the McCanns from day one because their story was so far-fetched and because the McCanns are very, A, unsophisticated liars, they're not psychopaths. At least they don't lie like someone like Casey Anthony, who can lie point blank and actually update her lies as she needs to. Right, so they, they might have that, I'm not a clinician so I can't diagnose them but they are not as good as a confirmed psychopath like Casey Anthony. What I feel they did is they had to script their alibi and they've stuck to that script ever since. So it's a, it's a little bit harder for them to lie, which is why they have so much leakage and why they have to stick to their script so tightly and why you'll see in interviews why they're constantly glancing at each other um, or cutting each other off, right? To make sure that no one veers off the script. So um, I think that the fact that they are not particularly good liars and the type of lying they're doing is extremely complicated where they have to lie by omission, right? So they have to omit finding a dead body and they have to lie by commission where they actually have to add other details like the window being open when Kate checked the bedroom, right? So it's a complicated form of lying on top of which they have to corroborate their own stories between each other, which adds an extra dimension of complexity to the lie. And I covered that in, uh, in this video, how to spot a fake story. So all that is to say, I think the, pol the Portuguese police suspected them from day one and were pretty confident of their suspicion, which is why they didn't launch some huge um, search campaign. In reality, they had their suspects and likely culprits right in front of them, so, so they didn't need to launch a huge campaign. However, they got offended or got on the defensive when British media started pestering them and questioning what they were doing. And I'm going to develop this theme later when we talk about the recent apology that they issued to the McCanns. But part of finding the truth is A, having the technical skills, which I'm teaching you on this channel to recognize the truth. But two, A, you need the skills and B, you actually need the courage to stick by your convictions. Right? And I think I'm foreshadowing where I'm going to get to with these Portuguese police and their apology and actually the way they acted, even at the time Madeline went missing. So let's keep listening. And it was obvious that things were being leaked, stories were being leaked to the media to smear us essentially or to show us in a negative light. Um, and that's, I think, when we still just sense the hostility. And that coincided with a time where suddenly our communication, our meetings with the police stopped. So not only were we having to face all that negativity and, and lies, um, we were also left in this void of information. And um, we found out that we were going to be made our guido. A void of information. If you see my other videos, you know that leakage happens when people are under stress. And I never miss an opportunity with the McCanns to pick up on a strange word choice. Does this mean 
They buried Maddie in a void, in a dark hole, maybe the ocean or a tunnel or a cave. No. Right? Does not mean that. However, enough drops can make a river. And if I were in charge of the case, listening to these interviews, I would be allocating my resources to looking at the ocean, in caves nearby, in dark crevices, Because they continue to use words that sound like leakage to me, right? So listen to how she says this. Is this technically proper English? Yes. Is it a bizarre word choice? Yes, right? And that's usually what leakage is. When someone has something on their mind and the word, the truth slips through, through a seemingly benign word choice. So I will continue to point out this leakage. So listen to what she says here. Void face all that negativity and and lies um we were also left in this void of information a void we were left in a void of information was maddie left in a void was her body left in uh, a cave or a, a cold cave right or in the void of the ocean right the dark abyss we were left in a void of information our meetings with the police stopped. So not only were we having to face all that negativity and, and lies, um, we were also left in this void of information. We were left in a void of information. That is strange word choice. A leakage, as you'll know if you've seen my other videos, is common with people who are lying. It's right? surprisingly common. And as I said before, if, if you think... To yourself, hey, I don't leak the truth when I'm lying. What's he talking about? I don't slip up and reveal the truth. If I buried something, I wouldn't say void. Um, It's actually more common than you might think, especially under stress. So A, the McCanns have to omit leakage, so they have to not reveal the truth. Just consider how much stress they're under right now. They're on live TV. They have to coordinate their stories with each other. They have to watch peers and make sure he's buying their story. Otherwise, they need to keep talking and filibustering um, before he can ask them a more pressing question. There's many factors that they're considering right now, which makes them more open to leakage, which makes it more likely that they might have a slip of the tongue. And as I pointed out on a a previous video, I actually experienced leakage myself on another McCann's video. And one of you eagle-eyed or eagle-eared listeners actually caught it and put it in the comments where you notice that after I mentioned I thought they uh, buried Maddie at sea, I used lots of phrases that weren't quite appropriate. For example, I said, I haven't done a deep dive into Spanish lately, where a better expression would have been, I haven't brushed up on my Spanish lately. Um, And I also said, will we get to the bottom of this story? And I think I used that phrase rather than, you know, will we find the truth or will we figure out what happened? I said, will we get to the bottom of the story? Because in my mind, I was picturing Maddie at the bottom of the ocean. So leakage even happened to myself under very low stress, right? I'm, I'm just recording a video by myself. I'm not on live TV. So the chances for leakage are very high. So if you catch them using a strange phrase... Um, and I miss it here, put it in the comments. I try to read all of your comments. And if I write nice catch and give you the little hundred and uh, uh, dartboard emoji, it means I'm really impressed with what you said. And I might actually feature your comment when we do a wrap-up video at some point about this where, or a Q&A where I want to feature some of the best catches from, from my listeners. Because as you know, I think I have the smartest, uh, best audience on YouTube. Um, we found out that we were going to be made our guido. It must be the, the worst moment of all, other than the moment you know that Madeline's gone. To have somebody look you in the eye and effectively say to... I wish Piers hadn't corrected him, himself there. Imagine if he had said that must have been the worst moment and they said yes. That means that them being accused of Maddie's disappearance was worse than her actual... Uh, disappearance or death, right? Which would be very telling. 
kind of like in the other episode where we predicted the McCanns, how they would answer a question Pierce had about the hotel, which was very damning, which I still think is one of the best signs, in my opinion, that they are guilty. To both of you, we think you killed your daughter. That's a terrible moment, isn't it? Well, I just thought, what is going on here? The, the, you know, the, I thought, you're right, nothing is worse as the first night, but I just felt like we were about to get destroyed at that point. Yeah, I think the realisation, and this particular part for Kate, that effectively there was no ongoing search because there was clearly a strategy where the public uh, were being led to believe that... The Did you sedate Maddie? Great question. I think maybe I should just get into this now. Why do people, why did the Portuguese police apologize to the McCanns? Why do people believe the McCanns when, in my opinion, their lies are very obvious? I think it's a lack of courage. To catch a liar, you have to have the technical knowledge to actually know they're lying, but then you actually have to have the conviction and the courage to stand by your own analysis, even if the entire world is against you. And people have tried to ch chase me off my opinions on this channel ever since my first video. When I accused Liver King of taking steroids, plenty of people came to my channel and said, no, you know, he, he gets tested all the time. He's 100% natural, impossible. Uh, you know, he's, you're subprimal. Until a, a few weeks after I made my videos, he admitted he was on steroids. Or even the, my videos on Jada Pinkett Smith calling her a sadist. People called me uh, a racist in the comments. Or my videos exposing Me Too hoaxers, a misogynist. It'd be a lot easier to walk back my opinions. But part of catching liars is actually having the conviction to stick with it. And this isn't rare. It's, I think it's rare in, in the media, unfortunately. But attorneys, prosecutors, uh, they stick by their convictions um, against direct threats to their lives. So courage is out there. There are plenty of people who can recognize truth and have the courage to stick to it. However, I feel like the people in the media were covering this case were bullied into walking back what they knew. Because look how accusatory this first article is that we're looking at on the screen here. And if you're listening on podcast mode, it's an article from about the time Maddie went missing. And the headline in massive bold letters is, Did You Sedate Maddie? That's a great headline. I actually think they nailed it until they were forced, they were cowered down and forced to walk it back. Even on my last McCann's video, uh, people told me, oh, the McCann's are very litigious. They might sue you. Don't you know that the Portuguese police issued an apology to them? That means nothing to me, right? If the McCann's were to sue me, I it would open them up to discovery. I would love for it. I would love to sit them down and do a deposition with them because I would not walk back. So I feel like they pick and choose. They, they focus on people who can be bullied and coward. So I think the press back then were bullied into walking back their story, at least the British press. And I feel like the, these Portuguese police recently were bullied into issuing an apology to the McCanns by the British and I think the German government, right? Don't they allegedly have some person who they're accusing of having done it? I think they cowered. Do they know the truth? I think so. I think the police since day one have suspected the truth. And I'll should show you this funny video quickly. Whenever someone has said, right, your McCann's analysis contradicts the BBC, the police, uh, the UK government, the German government, this is my internal response from the great Christopher Hitchens. My own opinion is enough for me, and I claim the right to have it defended against any consensus, any majority, anywhere, any place, any time. And anyone who disagrees with this can pick a number, get online, 
and kiss my ass. <laughs> right, that's how I feel about it. Until I see something that updates my analysis, I'm going to stick to my guns. And unfortunately, I think if the British press had done that in the beginning and the Portuguese police had done that in the beginning, we would see both of the McCanns in prison for negligence or at least manslaughter, um, negligent death of their daughter. That there was evidence that Madeline was dead, and that simply wasn't the case. I mean, Jerry, you, you kept remarkably calm. <clears throat> that that almost played to your disadvantage. People thought, "Why is he being so calm?" Had you been hysterical, they'd say, "Why is he being so hysterical?" You can't win in that position. You didn't see me behind the scenes, but, but you were remarkable. The other thing Pierce is pointing out here, and this is why I don't look at body language, is because Pierce is right. People criticize Jerry for being stoic, but if he'd been hysterical and running around, he would have been criticized for being overly persuasive. So that right there is accurate. Is, is Jerry a likable, charismatic guy? No. Does that make him a murderer? No. In my mind, what makes him a murderer are the things that he has said. We evolved to communicate with speech, so it is very difficult to lie with our speech. Because if you're lying about something that happened, it is extremely complex to picture things, to say them again the same way, to memorize every detail, to coordinate details. You are much more likely to get caught, tripped up in your words, right? All I do is listen closely. And there are some research and empirical studies to show that certain words and phrases are used in certain situations to uh, demonstrate deception. But really, all we do on this channel is listen closely to what people say. Whereas if you're focusing on, is he crying enough? Well, she looks haggard. Um, they're looking at each other a lot. That doesn't, so what? That doesn't mean anything. Even if their kid were actually kidnapped, they, they would be looking haggard and, and acting uh, sad. Right? So looking at their behavior doesn't really tell us much, in my opinion. Because if they bludgeoned her to death or accidentally sedated her to death, or she was actually kidnapped, they'd be acting, as far as their emotions go, similar, right? It's a tragedy no matter what. The way the truth is revealed is in the words they choose, because the words they choose demonstrate their knowledge. You always speak based on everything you know. And that's what I'm curious about. What do they know? And I think that's why the leakage is so important in this case, because the leakage reveals things that they are picturing in their minds. It reveals their memories. Void. The pain is never far from the surface. These are all expressions they've used. And one on its own probably means nothing. But we've seen so many patterns throughout this interview that it is tough to ignore. And like I said, if I were in charge of the case, just based on that leakage, I would be prioritizing searching along the coastline or searching within a day's drive of that hotel to any coastline or caves or uh, construction sites. Anywhere with a void, a, a deepness to it, and a coldness to it. Mark would be calm. I mean, if I'd been in your shoes and I'd been accused of something like that, I, I think I would have freaked out. How did you manage to keep your composure? I think the key thing is, um, I mean, as I say, behind the scenes, what you see... It's very different. Um, I mean, I saw my husband on the floor crying his eyes out, you know, um, so I think... Uh, I mean, at that point, um, at the lowest point, I... I saw my husband on the floor crying his, clies, crying his eyes out. I wonder if she's describing the night Madeline died. Like I said, I think he was there when she actually passed away, when she actually expired. Could she be describing the night, that night, of Jerry crying, holding his daughter while she was dying? In what privately, see, it's very different. Um, I mean, I saw my husband on the floor crying his eyes out, you know, um, so I think... Uh, I mean, at that point, um, at the lowest point, I thought our family was going to be destroyed or the potential for it to be destroyed was there. I thought our family was going to be destroyed. Well, Madeline's missing. So the family unit is destroyed. 
So what does he mean by that? Let's listen again, right? Because he, he is saying in his own words that the family unit is not destroyed yet, even though Madeline's missing. So when he talks about the family unit here, he's talking about himself, Kate, and the twins, right? The remaining members of the family. How could they get destroyed? How could they get destroyed when the parents are under suspicion? Listen again. I think I have an answer here. Let's see if we're on the same wavelength. Oh, thank you. I mean, at that point, um, at the lowest point, I thought our family was going to be destroyed or the potential for it to be destroyed was there. But ultimately, in particular... The potential for their family to be destroyed while Madeline's already gone. How could the family be destroyed? Well, if the parents are convicted of negligence, the parents could be locked away and the twins would go into foster care. That's how you destroy the rest of the family. So I think that one way they justify covering up Madeline's death is protecting the rest of the family, not just themselves. Right? They are, they are clearly a priority for each other. In all these interviews, one of their main priorities is defending themselves. However, they might also see this as a heroic effort to protect their twins. Because if the truth ever does come out, they will surely be arrested and locked away, and the twins would go into foster care. I think that's what he's imagining there when he says our family could have been destroyed and the potential was there. Which is true, whether Madeline was kidnapped and they were wrongly accused, or if they killed her and they were correctly convicted. Either way. So I think what it reveals here is a little bit more about their motivation. They're not just protecting each other. They may also, they're definitely considering the twins as well. So even though they have to lie for a living now, they may see it as noble because they're protecting the remaining two children. So when they didn't answer the questions in the polygraph, which would have incriminated them, if you really believe Madeline was missing, the heroic thing to do would be to answer every question, be as candid as possible with the investigation so that they could eliminate themselves as suspects and the police could go find the real kidnapper. But because they knew they were guilty, they found it more justifiable and heroic for the remaining children to not reply to questions and to lie, because at least that way they can protect the remaining children. They already know Madeline's already dead. So avoiding answering the questions and lying to the police is actually the noble thing to do. I think that's how they justify all this. Certainly when you're tired and you're doing that, you, you come by and the overwhelming objective that we have is to find Madeline and what you need to do to get through that and to keep that search going. But, I, I mean, we should be clear, there was no formal accusation. No. Uh, we were never arrested, there were no charges, and their Guido thing literally, tran you know, is translated as suspect, but it would be... You could argue if we'd been made our guido on day one because they had to ask us some questions which might incriminate you, that would have been fine. And in the August, I said, look, if we have to start from... It's a strange admission that the questions he, at, he would have been asked could have incriminated him. What he should be saying is they could have exonerated him. It's interesting how they never get pushed back in person, which is why... I would love to be able to do a deposition with them because these slip-ups are hard to explain if you actually press them. What do you mean? For example, he had said that. What do you mean they could have incriminated you? Well, I mean, but no, no you said incriminated. Which question, which question specifically could have incriminated you? No one ever pushes back on them like that, which is unfortunate. Square one again. You know, bring it on and we, we will be there and, and do it. But there was clearly a portrayal in the media that there was evidence incriminating us. And, you know, we were clearly suggested that if we confessed to hiding Madeline's body, 
then that's weird. Let's listen. There's evidence incriminating us, and you know we were clearly suggested that if we confess to hiding Madeline's body, then that would be the end of it. Were you offered a specific deal like that? Were you offered a, a if you if you accept that you did this, you can go to prison for two years and be out. Yeah. That was what I read. Is that, is that true? It is true. I mean, it, it's it's hard because no, nobody likes it to be called a deal, but indirectly it was put to us that um, if we confess to hiding Madeline's body, so not killing her, but accidental death, and if we confess to hiding her body, then it would be a non-custodial service, two years. Um, Jerry could go back to work, we were told. Um, but I was just crazy, you know, the hardest thing, as you say, about the Arguido was the realisation suddenly that no one was looking for Madeline. Because if they were looking at us and focusing all their attention and resources are on us or trying to find stuff again. First of all, the fact that the Portuguese police offered that deal to them is a sign that the Portuguese police were on the right track. The Portuguese police, it sounds like, were actually on the same page as I am, where Madeline died through... Uh, negligence through some sort of tragic accident and what they are guilty of is disposing of her body and covering it up. I would have offered them the same deal to get a confession and get this over with. But they didn't take it. And I think this goes back to what I was saying before. Their family that might have been what he was referring to. That deal could have blown apart their family. Madeline was already gone. So when he's referring to the family, he's talking about himself, Kate, and the twins. If both parents were in prison, the children would, would be taken away. And the family would have blown up. Another question I get asked a lot in the comments is, why would these parents do so many interviews if they were guilty? I think it's because they are petrified of losing control of the narrative. As you see here, when the police are pointing at the finger at them and suspecting them, their main concern was, don't even look at us. Go find the person who took her. Rather than being cooperative in answering every question like you would expect a parent of a missing child to, to do, parents of missing children are extremely cooperative because they want to eliminate themselves as suspects. They understand that they are the primary suspect. It's perfectly logical that the first person they look at is the parents. So they understand that, they submit themselves to any test, any investigation, any amount of questions in order to eliminate themselves as suspects so the police can turn their attention to finding their child. But the McCanns didn't do that. When the police started suspecting them, they immediately started complaining, why are you looking at us? Go look for the person who took Madeline. And I think they've been doing that ever since. Whenever the heat is on them, they need to go into public, write a book, do an interview, because they constantly have to be pointing the fingers somewhere else, because they have not eliminated them themselves as suspects. They have not sat down for intense questioning or a polygraph, as, as dubious of, as polygraph tests are. The person of a missing child would submit themselves to it in order to clear their name. So I think that is why the McCanns are constantly doing interviews, because they are petrified of losing control of the narrative. Because as soon as the search stops, people are going to look back at them. The obvious culprits, the ones who should have been investigated with rigor from day one against us than who was looking for Madeline. So I was angry. I mean, I'd gone from kind of this downward spiral in. The other thing, when people act surprised by obvious things, for example, when they say, how could the Portuguese police suspe suspe suspect us, the parents? That's obvious. Everyone knows that. If a wife is murdered, the first suspect is the husband. Everyone knows that. If a kid goes missing, the first suspects are the parents. So to act surprised by that is a red flag. And we actually caught uh, someone by doing this 
So let's do a quick cut here and I'll show you the example where someone, where I caught someone on X lying simply by acting surprised by something that was obvious. If you're familiar with American uh, politics, you know that uh, Republic, or, uh, Democrat Representative Jamal Bowman pulled a fire alarm during an important vote and then claimed that he pulled the fire alarm by accident. And recently he was charged with it. And I think he was guilty and I thought he was guilty ever since day one. And as I put in my notes when I analyzed his statement about it, one of the things he said in his uh, statement about this, where he was trying to defend himself and pretend it was an accident, he said, I don't know why this has gotten so much attention. And that's kind of like how the McCanns feign surprise that they get attention for being suspects by the Portuguese police. Pulling a fire alarm is, is designed, a fire alarm is designed to get attention, whether you pull it by accident or not. So acting surprised that people are paying attention to someone who pulled a fire alarm is a red flag. The same way that acting surprised as a parent that you are a suspect is a red flag. I hope that makes sense. In July, when nobody was really speaking to us, in August, with all the headlines, and suddenly I just felt strong because I thought, you know, I'm damned if this will happen to my daughter. You know, if they're not going to be there for her, then we have to fight for her. We're going to take another short break. When we come back, I want to talk to you about the fight that you then launched to try and find Madeline and what you think are the possible unanswered questions that need to be answered. We welcome the news today, although it is no cause for celebration. It's hard to describe how utterly despairing it was to be named our Guido. So we're still watching the Piers Morgan interview, but now we're doing a flashback, it looks like, to the McCanns back when Madeline first went missing. And they're doing a press conference announcing that they are now Arguido, suspects by the Portuguese police. Um, and subsequently portrayed in the media as suspects in our own daughter's abduction. That was just after you'd been informed you were no longer... Once again, our own daughter's abduction. That has been their story ever since day one. She was abducted. And as I've harped on many times in my videos, the conclusiveness that she was abducted is a red flag. The same way acting surprised that you as a parent are a suspect is a red flag. If a child goes missing, the word we use is missing. Because any number of things could have happened to the child. And that is why in this video, How to Spot a Fake Story, we looked at scripting. I believe the McCanns scripted the story of the abductor around the time that Madeline died because they knew they needed an alibi. And the easiest way for liars to coordinate their stories is to come up with a simple one that's vague with very rigid details. So as you'll notice, they've stuck to that story since day one. She's been abducted. But they contradict themselves in their actions. For example, they never accuse each other. They never accuse their friends. Allegedly, their friend Matt was the last one to check on the children before Kate. Why, is he, why were they not pointing the finger at him? Why, in the previous part of this interview we analyzed, did they exonerate the hotel? If they didn't know what actually happened, all these things should be in play. Our daughter is missing is a much more reliable statement. It indicates that the parent doesn't actually know what happened compared to our child was abducted when there's no evidence of that. Uh, an open window is not evidence that your child is abducted. So uh, the conclusiveness, and we see it all the way back to those early days. That press conference we just saw was, was uh, from around the time Madeline went missing. The interview we're watching now is 2011. The story has never changed, never evolved. New details have never been added. 
new reminiscences and details that might have cropped up the more they thought about that night have never bubbled up because it was a scripted story from day one and they are petrified to death of anyone challenging challenging that story are following a different path, which is why they do so many interviews, and they are petrified of adding too many new details to it or evolving it for fear of contradicting themselves. Are Guido no longer suspects, as they call it there? And whilst there's relief in your voice, Kate, there's also, I can tell, real simmering anger. What did it do to, to your public opinion, particularly back home? here where it was such an enormous story you were front page news for weeks after weeks after months after months a lot of it negative a lot of it pushing really hard as almost as if some of the media wanted you to be guilty i remember reading the headlines thinking wow they're pushing the envelope here this is how you bully people so normally i like peers but this is how i think people bullied the media into backing off the McCants. How could you be so accusatory? Their daughter is missing. I'm sure plenty of people said that to the journalists who were actually on the right track, in my opinion. Right, you come off as a bad person if you're accusing parents of missing child doing it. However, we're not doing it based on a crystal ball. We're doing it based on their own language. And their own language indicates that they have knowledge outside the facts that are presented to us. In other words, they know what actually happened. You're having to live in this country, and you're having to live with being called our Guido suspect. That same sort of bullying is the reason so many hoaxers got away with it during that Me Too movement. Plenty of actual victims came forward, but so did plenty of hoaxers. And even if people were intelligent enough to see the hoaxers and recognize the hoaxers, they didn't have the courage to stick by their convictions and actually call out the hoaxers, even when everyone else was saying, believe all women. It takes courage to stick by your convictions against people who look like sympathetic victims. When I defended Andrew, when I analyzed the Andrew Tate accusers, the two women who accused him, plenty of people accused me of being a misogynist or a, a woke, crazy liberal. And then when I did the opposite to Russell Brand, uh, oh, sorry, uh, it's inverse. When I defended uh, Andrew Tate based on those two accusers, right? So when I saw the two accusers who accused him of sexual harassment, People said I was alt-right, uh, crazy Republican. And then when I said I don't believe Russell Brand's denial of uh, regarding his accusers, I was accused of being a woke, liberal, hive mind. Either one of those, if you don't have the conviction in your own analysis and the courage to stand by it, could, could get you to back off your opinion. It's also one of the reasons I wear the hat and the glasses and don't reveal my name because people can actually get way too invested in celebrities. And if you call them a liar, they can actually go crazy and try to come for you personally. So I feel like not revealing my identity allows me or nor my politics allows me to call things as I see them as honestly as possible. And in this case, these are two parents who lost a daughter, which is sad. That is sad whether they did it by accident or whether she was actually kidnapped. It is a sad, tragic situation. However, my channel exists to expose liars and manipulators, and I feel that they are lying and they manipulate the public's opinion by being litigious or playing the victim card or doing a whole bunch of other things to get people to uh, not, not push too hard the narrative that they actually did it. Specs. That must have been a pretty awful experience, wasn't it? You know, it was a great story for the media, but you're right. I mean, this was our life. We were having to live it, you know. Um, I think it's a bad episode for 
the media, you know, because obviously we took action against the Express and uh, it was a last resort, but they were rehashing headlines from months before over and over again and we were prepared to cut a bit of slack around our Guido time. We were declared our Guido. These things were happening in Portugal. But, you know, months later, um, and some of the stories were just complete fabrications. It was detrimental to the South. I think the other important issue is the stories that were being put out there were implying that Madeline was dead. Yeah. Of all the madcap theories, that's interesting. Like I've said in my another McCann video, if I call you purple, you won't be offended by it because you're not purple. But if I call you low IQ and you are, you've done a test and you have a low IQ, that's going to offend you because it's true. So notice how Kate brings up the headlines that actually offended her fabrications. It was detrimental to the South. I think the other important issue is the stories that were being put out there were implying that Madeline was dead. Yeah. Of all of them. Which, if your daughter is missing, is totally reasonable. As sad as it is, your daughter could be dead. If the news is publishing stories after months of a missing girl and saying she might be dead, that is 100% reasonable within the realm of possibility. In fact, much more likely with such a high, highly investigated, let's say it was a kidnapping. If it got this much press and attention, you can believe they got rid of the body. They would either issue a ransom note or get rid of the girl. So why does Kate bring that up? Why would that offend her so much when it's totally within the realm of possibility? Why? Did she mention that that particular sort of headline made her sensitive? Just complete fabrications. It was detrimental to the South. I think the other important issue was the stories that were being put out there were implying that Madeline was dead. Okay. Why would you need an injunction against, against that? Because they killed her. Why else would you be sensitive about that? It might be sad to think about are offensive, or you might actually want to avoid those headlines. But if journalists are over there in Portugal investigating this case for you, which is what you say you want, and coming up with evidence that Madeline's dead, would you not be curious about that evidence? Would you not be curious about finding out the truth? They show zero curiosity about whether or not Madeline is alive or dead. Because they already know the truth. And that's why they're sensitive about articles about her being dead. Because they know that's what happened. They know they did it. And they do not want people... If someone's finding evidence of that, they are scared. Because the evidence will point them to Madeline's body, which will point to them being the killers. That's my suspicion. Nobody put that particular headline in Kate's mouth. That was a priority to her. She brought up that particular line of inquiry and headlines up as the ones that she was most sensitive about, which is very telling. Yeah. Of all the madcap theories, then you must see more than anybody else. You must hear and see everything that, that comes uh, out about this. Are there any that you think have any kind of credibility that you think should be really pushed for? Okay. Let's see if we can predict their answer again. We did this with the hotel. Question. When Piers asked them, do you blame the hotel at all? I predicted they would say no. Because someone who knows that Madeline is dead would not want to make new enemies by accusing the hotel. Because if they accuse the hotel, the hotel can defend themselves by pointing the finger back at the McCann's, and they don't want that. So here, Piers says... He asked them, are any of the theories possibly true? If your child was missing, you would be pursuing every theory, no matter how ludicrous it is. From a dingo stole the baby, to a vulture broke into the room and stole the baby, to one of their friends is playing a five-year sick, messed up practical joke on them, to Kate kidnapped her own daughter and hit her in the suitcase and didn't tell Jerry. Right? Everything would be on the table because you want to find out what happened to your daughter. Now, if you're a hoaxer, 
you are petrified of anyone searching anything outside of your alibi. You want to direct the narrative down the course of your alibi. And that's why actual parents of missing children don't go on 20-year press tours. Because they're more concerned about the investigation of their kid. They're not interested in going on Swedish talk shows. You go on Swedish talk shows because you're trying to control a narrative. So for everyone who asks me, why do they do so many interviews? If they're guilty, innocent parents are the ones who don't do a ton of interviews. Because they're more concerned with the actual investigation. And doing things that actually help them find their kid. Hoaxers do interviews. I have a whole playlist about hoaxers. These people are all, all over the press. Because part of it is uh, getting attention for hoaxers. In this case, these hoaxers are petrified of losing control of the narrative. So, when Pierce asks her, do any of these other theories hold any credibility or any credence to you? I suspect she will minimize it. She will try to direct it back to her alibi, which is a an unknown third-party suspicious man in the shadows stole their daughter. Further. Anybody else? You question. must hear and see everything that, that comes. Out there, we're implying that Madeline was dead. Yeah. Well, of all the madcap theories... Then you must see more than anybody else. You must hear and see everything that comes uh, out about this. Are there any that you think have any kind of credibility that you think should be really pushed further? It's incredibly difficult, Pierce, because if you speak to Ernie Allen at the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, who've got the most expertise in these types of stranger or, or stereotypical kidnappings, what Ernie says and it's stuck with is, is until you know who's taken your daughter, you don't know. So nothing, as, as predicted, the response is directed back to the alibi. An unknown, unnamed kidnapper. It's textbook. This is what hoaxers sound like. You can watch my hoaxers playlist of people talking about UFOs, aliens, Bigfoot. They sound exactly the same here. The conclusiveness is the key that someone is not curious about the truth. And if your child is missing, you should be obsessed. You should be curious as hell about every possibility, even the most outlandish possibilities. But hoaxers are not curious because they know the truth. Many times their grift or their attention-seeking endorphin rush or here their... Um, Ability to remain unconvicted relies on being conclusive about their story. They have a stake in making sure no one looks outside the realm of their hoax. And here, Jerry answered textbook. If he was asked, are any of these headlines have any... Let's listen to the actual question again. Because even uh, headlines about Madeline being dead should be of interest to them. But instead, they're trying to shut them down. If you didn't know what happened to your daughter, wouldn't you at least like to be able to retrieve the body? More than anybody else, you must hear and see everything that, that comes uh, out about this. Are there any that you think have any kind of credibility that you think should be really pushed further? It's incredibly difficult, Pierce, because if you speak to Ernie Allen at the National Centre for Men So no headline, nothing. No theory that she's dead. No theory. I don't know what the theories were. There's tons of theories. Even the one, that, particularly ones that she's dead, have zero interest. Generate zero interest in the parents because they're hoaxing, because they know what actually happened, in my opinion. For missing exploited children who've got the most expertise in these types of stranger or, or stereotypical kidnappings, what Ernie says and it's stuck with is, is until you know who's taken your daughter, you don't know. And you can think of a whole host of scenarios. And I think that he's given us some examples when Elizabeth Smart was abducted at knife point from her bedroom, uh, which she shared with her sister. 
It's always an abduction. That's the alibi. Yet they contradict themselves. That's what I mean by not being sophisticated liars. It could be anybody, except for my friends, except for Matt, who was the last person to check the bedroom, and except for the hotel staff. Definitely not them. The conclusiveness that it is a, an unknown, unidentified third party who didn't work at the hotel, who's not one of their friends, who isn't either of them, that is how you know it's a hoax. I know I'm beating the point to death here, but uh, there are still people who believe them. This study says there's no way we could have known that she would be living. And they, that may have, might have been leakage from me, right? Beating something to death. Just miles from home. It would have been leakage if I had said, I know I'm putting you to sleep with all this. That would have been leakage because that would actually reveal my thoughts about Maddie. I don't think they beat her to death. Um, JC Dugard. I mean, all of these cases, who could have imagined it? So we've got to be completely open minded as to who's taken her and why. And right. So the contradiction, they contradict themselves constantly. We have to be open to all possibilities. However, these possibilities are closed off. I don't think we'll know until we find that person. One of the things I struck by in the book is, is your quite open account of what it's done to your marriage, this. I mean, do you feel that you've been quite fortunate to stay together? Do you think? This is a whole other can of worms. And I've pointed this out multiple times about how parents of missing children often get divorced. Today, I'm going to teach you a counterintuitive way to catch liars. I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, we're going to look at Kate and Jerry McCann's first interview about their missing daughter, Madeline. And we're going to look for signs that their story is scripted. And I'm going to teach you a way to detect a fake scripted story that's going to seem counterintuitive to you. Let's listen. Also, I've not listened to this interview before, so I'm going to try to find the right spot to, to mention this lesson. So let's look for any signs of deception. And then when we hit on what I want to teach you today, uh, we'll get into that. There's a little preview of it here. Jerry and Kate, thanks very much indeed for, for talking to us. I'd like to begin by taking you back to the, the events of May the 3rd on that evening. Tell us how you discovered that Madeline had gone. Um, as I think people are aware, um, we were checking regularly on the children. And um, it was during my, one of my checks that I discovered she'd gone. And I can't really go into any details about that. But. Already, this is a red flag to anyone who should have seen this interview at the time. Put yourself into Kate McCann's shoes. Her daughter is allegedly missing, is allegedly kidnapped. That's their story. You would think that since she has a platform on TV to talk about that, she would talk about noticing Madeline was gone in great detail. Every tiny detail she knew about that night, every person she saw on her way, maybe on the staircase in the resort, on her way there and her way back, anything that might help people find Madeline. But instead, I'm actually su surprised by this. Um, they're being so reticent about telling the story, it might actually ruin my plan for this video. Instead, she is saying she cannot talk about the details of the night Madeline went missing. That is totally counterintuitive if you believe that uh, they are innocent. However, if you think that they accidentally killed Madeline like I do and then hid the body, it makes perfect sense because they understand that the more they tell their story, the more likely it is that they might contradict themselves or say something that might be contradicted by the evidence down the road. And this is why lying is so difficult. 
So already, even if I was watching this back on the 25th of May, 2007, that would be a giant red flag. And I think the Portuguese police also saw this as a red flag. I think initially they suspected the McCanns and they were correct about that. That is my opinion. I'm sure any parent will realize how that felt. Did the panic set in immediately? Yeah, pretty much. This is a resort that offers childcare facilities, baby sitting facilities. Why then were the three young children left alone in the apartment while you were having a meal? I mean, I think if you know the location here, which you've seen, uh, what we did, uh, I think, and then we've been reassured by the fact in the thousands of messages from people who have either done exactly the same or said they would have done the same. And for us, it really wasn't very much different to having dinner in your garden and the proximity of the location. I think it's fair to say that, you know, the guilt that we feel having not been there at that moment, irrespective of whether we had been in the other bedroom or not, will never leave us. Do you blame yourselves regularly? Certainly the first few days, I think the guilt uh, was, was very difficult. Um, One thing I suspect, if you've seen my McCann's playlist, uh, this is not the first video I've done on the McCann's. This is, I think, uh, the eighth video I've done on them. So we've looked at three interviews of them. We looked at one interview that was recorded about five years later, I think, with Piers Morgan. We looked at an interview they did about six months after Maddie went missing with a Spanish TV station. And we looked at an interview they did, I think, a couple of years after Maddie went missing, like two or three years, on a Norwegian talk show or a Swedish talk show. Um, I think Swedish talk show with a Norwegian host, based on the comments. And Kate's story has been consistent the entire time regarding the night she found Maddie. So I'm waiting for her to tell that story so I can show you how you can tell that it's scripted. However, one thing I notice across all these interviews is when it comes to the matter of guilt, Kate expresses a lot more remorse about what happened that night, which is why I suspect that Kate is the one who administered the sedative to Madeline that probably killed her. And that's also why Kate stopped practicing medicine because she could no longer trust herself. And I don't think Jerry had um, anything to do with the actual death. I think what Jerry did was actually get involved. He realized that Madeline was dying and then get involved to protect Kate and protect his family unit by ensuring that he and Kate do not go to prison for negligence, for negligently killing Maddie. And he took charge from there, which is why he takes these questions that talk about um, guilt over going out to dinner and leaving the children. But Kate mentions her personal guilt. When Kate's talking about her guilt, she always says, I, and not we, or most of the time, that's, that's what we see. So long story short, I think Kate administered the sedative that killed Maddie and then Jerry took charge and sat Kate down and scripted the story that they would tell people. And maybe this is too early for her to have the script totally memorized, totally comfortable to say it on TV, which is why we saw her reticence about even getting into the details of that night. Because in future interviews, she does tell that story. And she tells it beat for beat exactly the same way, which is the red flag, which I will get into later in this video. I'm just waiting for them to give me a good opportunity. So that basically, if you haven't seen my other videos, fleshes out my theory about the McCanns. I think Kate administered the sedative, Jerry found Madeline dying, and then Jerry took charge of the situation, scripted the story of Kate, disposed of Madeline's body somewhere cold, somewhere dark, based on his leakage, if you've seen my other videos. I think it's somewhere cold, a body of water, and in the comments, lots of, lots of you had mentioned that there are old reservoirs and old abandoned wells around that resort, which is very interesting. So I think that I didn't even think of wells or reservoirs when I first came with that theory. I was actually thinking the ocean, the coastline. Um, and that's the beauty of these videos, that I have the smartest subscribers, smartest audience, 
And I think those are actually great suggestions. A well sounds like exactly what I was detecting in the leakage, a well or a reservoir or a cave. I think as time goes on, um, we feel stronger and we felt very supported from that point of view. Is there the other thing here that doesn't make sense, Kate just said that they feel stronger the more time goes on. Now consider who would be who would feel stronger as time goes on? Someone whose kid died tragically or someone whose kid was kidnapped. If your kid was kidnapped, the longer your kid is missing, the more likely it is that you will never find them. So as time goes on, you would expect the parents of a missing child to actually get more and more concerned and actually feel worse and worse and lose hope or start, start feeling less hopeful, right? Parents of missing children typically don't ever lose hope, but starting feeling less hopeful. But instead, Kate said they actually feel stronger as time goes on. And that is what I... Yeah, I think that's an example of leakage where she's leaking that she knows Madeline's dead because that's the only way that response makes sense. And as I've said repeatedly in these McCann videos, the McCanns are not particularly sophisticated liars. There's a ton of leakage in their responses. So if you like this video, I suggest binging this playlist and seeing how I develop my theories over time. Uh, we did not start out with such a clear picture, but as we've seen more and more leakage from the McCanns, it's, uh, be the picture's becoming clearer and clearer. And the oldest video I did is called How to Analyze a Suspect on the McCanns, if you want to start there. Do you blame yourselves regularly? Certainly the first few days, I think the guilt uh, was, was very difficult. Um, I think as time goes on, um, we feel stronger and we felt very supported from that point of view. That is the wrong answer. This is not a sophisticated liar. This is not a Casey Anthony. This is a person who is not very sophisticated at lying. That's the total wrong response. If a cop heard that, a cop of any sort of pedigree, they should recognize that that means the mother knows the daughter's dead and she's actually feeling stronger and stronger because she's getting away with the lie. So the more people, she's on the news now, the more people that are giving her a platform and seemingly believing her story, of course she feels stronger. She's still, of course, sad that her daughter's dead, but she's feeling stronger and stronger. She's processing the death. She's in panic mode fighting for her life. And as I've theorized in other videos, I think that the parents see the lie they're telling as noble. They understand that if they admitted the truth, the twins would be taken away with them. They would both be locked up. The twins would go into foster care. So they can actually justify the lie they're telling. We can't go bring Maddie back to life. However, we can hide the body. We can lie about this and keep our family unit together. And Jerry basically said as much in one of these other videos where he was talking about the family unit blowing up, blowing up something along those lines. But Madeline was already missing at the time he said that, which made no sense. The family unit would have already been destroyed because Maddie was gone. But they changed their frame of mind. They understood she was dead. And the new family unit now needs to be protected. Also notice how Kate, just going back to why I think she administered the deadly sedative, when she was talking about the guilt, she didn't say we, but then she switched to we when she said we're starting to feel stronger. I think the blame for Madeline's death is 100% on her, which is why she stopped practicing medicine, why she expresses all the guilt. Is there a lesson here, do you think, to, to other parents? I think that's a very difficult thing to say because if you look at it and we try to rationalize things in our head and ultimately what is done is done and we do continually look for Wow. If you've binged all my videos, if you've watched enough of my videos, that is a red flag. This is the father who is supposedly talking about a missing daughter. And I really need to do this video where I compare 
parents of actual missing children to the McGann's. Listen to the conclusiveness. What is done is done. That's how you talk about something where there is no hope of ever getting your daughter back. Where she's dead. It's done. The father of a missing child, it's just beginning. The investigation is just started. It ain't over till I get my daughter back or till I retrieve a body. But listen to the conclusiveness. They've this is only a few days later, and it seems like they've already processed a death because they know she's dead. There's not even a question in their minds, right? Could she still be out there? What's done is done. The other thing is these interviewers constantly ask them, right, when they say, do you feel guilty or you know bad about what you did? The interviewers are asking about leaving the children alone in the bedroom. Because if you believe the kidnapping story, that's what they should feel bad about. Because that gave the, the alleged kidnapper the opportunity to kidnap Madeline and then sneak away without being detected. However, the McCanns never express guilt about that. Because they know th their decision to leave the kids alone in the bedroom was the right decision. Nothing happened. It was the sedative or however Madeline died. That's what they feel bad about. Leaving the kids alone in the bedroom is, is nothing to them. They, they, I think they think the people who ask you about that are stupid. Because they're, they're thinking in their head, we didn't need to hire a nanny. It all worked out fine. No one broke into our hotel room. We were not negligent parents. We left them alone in the bedroom. Nothing happened. Um, because they understand that it was the sedative that killed Maddie. Leaving her alone in the bedroom is a non-issue to them. So listen to this red flag response. I rewound here. What's done is done. To say because if you look at it and we try to rationalize things in our head and ultimately what is done is done and we do continually look forward that is a gigantic red flag. Also, you'll notice this is their first interview. The wrong answers they give here are actually surprising me at how bad they are because I've watched their later interviews where they, as bad as they are at lying, they actually improve their lies quite a bit. For example, they say scripted things like, we hope to still find Maddie, even though they contradict themselves later in those same interviews. But here, they haven't given a good response to any of the questions so far, and we're two minutes in. This might be the worst interview they've done. And I know I'm pausing a lot, but that's because I'm, I'm actually surprised at how bad these answers they give to every single question are. We've tried to put it into some sort of perspective for ourselves. We're in a very safe resort. If you think about the millions and millions of British families who go to the Mediterranean each year, really the chances of this happening are in the order of 100 million to one. Notice how he's minimizing leaving them alone in the bedroom because he understands that it was totally safe. You can see the disdain he has for this question. The chances of this were happening were minuscule because it didn't happen. No one broke in and stole Maddie. Their decision to leave her alone in the bedroom was totally justified, totally correct. Also, if it happens to you, this is another way you can tell that Maddie wasn't kidnapped. If a one in a million chance thing happens to you, it seems like a big deal. You don't rationalize the statistics of, oh, well, this, there's only a 1% chance of this happening, even though it happened to me. When an unlikely thing happens to you, if a shark bites you, you don't go back in the water for a long time. Even though you understand the statistics, it seems like a big deal to you. If a shark bit you, you probably wouldn't let your kids go swim in deep water, even though you understand the statistics, because it's a big deal to you. So if his daughter were actually kidnapped, we would not expect him to sit here reciting the statistics of how unlikely it is. It would seem like a big deal. Of course, let's say this were the only question, and I try to say this caveat in every video now. Let's say this were the only question that was asked. This was the response he gave. Would I think he's a liar? No. We have to look for multiple signs of deception before we conclude that someone's deceptive. By this point, I've analyzed, this is my fourth McCann video. By this point, I'm convinced, my opinion is, that they accidentally killed Maddie and hid the body 
and scripted a story to get away with it. And what I wanted to teach you guys in this video was something I talked about in uh, a video I did a few days ago, how to spot a fake story, where I talked about the ways you can tell that a story is scripted. So the counterintuitive way to tell that someone's lying is actually their extreme consistency. And this is something I put in the members only section uh, last week. If you haven't become a member, it's a great way to support the channel. I put extra content in the member section and I actually posted this video in the member section so that members could uh, post their own analysis and actually compare their analysis to my own one in the live chat during the video premiere. So that is going to be fun to see if they caught the same things I did. But uh, besides that, here's the lesson for today that I want to teach you. I was hoping that Kate would recite her story about realizing that Madeline was missing. In all the other interviews we've seen of the McCanns, Kate tells the same story beat by beat, where she went up to the room at precisely 10 o'clock, the door was slightly ajar, she opened it, she couldn't quite tell if Maddie was in bed, but she didn't turn on the light. And I think she says she didn't turn on the light because that light was probably visible from where everyone was eating. So she would have been called out as a liar if she said she turned on the light because other people, witnesses might say, no, the light in that room never turned on. But it, it, no matter why she mentions it, she mentions that, that she did not turn on the light. She couldn't quite make out Madeline bed. Then she went back to her room to check for Madeline without checking the bed. Then she went back to Maddie's room, and as she opened the door, she noticed that the window was open, and a billow of wind blew the curtains at her, and she saw that the window was open, and she immediately knew that Madeline had been kidnapped. That story, across the interviews we have analyzed, has never changed. It is told almost verbatim, beat by beat. And that is the sign of a scripted story. Because true stories actually are not told perfectly the same. And new details, as counterintuitive as it might seem, are actually added when the story is retold. And they're not made, because it's a true story, they're not contradictory details. They're just other details the person remembers due to something known as the reminiscence effect. So as the McCanns, for example, learned more in the course of those five years between this interview and the other interview, there might be other things that stood out to them as more important, as other suspects were suggested, or new details emerged, or new evidence was collected. And they might search their memories and actually come up with details they didn't think of before based on this new evidence, or based on new factors that they just considered over time. And the story might evolve slightly, where she might mention, you know, uh, Madeline's favorite stuffed animal was actually on the other side of the room, or was near the doorway. I didn't even think about that before. Uh, maybe he came in through the window, but left through the front door. Or the front door, now that I think about it, was unlocked. I think it was unlocked. So I came in, the, in through the unlocked door. The reminiscence effect is the reason that true stories actually evolve over time and new details are added. And by new details, I mean details that are not contradictory and are not necessarily self-serving either. So that's how you can tell uh, the difference between a true story and a scripted story. A scripted story stays the same across years, like the McCann's have. Beat for beat, it's very van vanilla. There's no sign of reminiscence effect because they're not actually remembering anything. They're just sticking to a script to save their own skins, right? They made up an alibi and they have to stick to it because they cannot contradict each other. And then there's more stuff like unique details, etc., which I covered in my other video. Sensory details, non-self-serving details. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, uh, how to spot a fake story is the video for you. But right here, I was hoping Kate would tell that story here, 
so we could actually see how it has not changed ever since their first interview. And maybe she will. We still have some time to go in this interview. So hopefully she will, so we can illustrate that point. I think, I think at worst we were naive. Um, I mean, we're very responsible parents. We love our children very much. And I don't think any parent could ever imagine or consider anything like this happening. Were you aware of the, the big public debate that went on in the immediate aftermath, and were you hurt by that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, no one hurts you as much as the hurt that we had. But, you know, we've tried to remain very positive in our outlook. And even small levels of criticism make that hard when you're trying to do everything in your power to get your daughter back. I know you've been very supportive of the Portuguese police investigation, but is there anything that you feel could have been done better, particularly in those crucial first, first 24 hours when, when Madeleine was missing and perhaps it was treated as a, a simple missing child as opposed to an abduction? I think, um, you know, we are not looking at what has been done and I don't think it helps at this stage to look back at what could and couldn't have been done. I think it's Notice the finality in everything he says. Nothing we do now could help. He's leaking that he knows she's dead, in my opinion. And like I say, let's say this were the only interview I've seen, it would be a bunch of red flags. I would not be this conclusive or opinionated. It's only because I've seen so many interviews of them now that everything they say echoes across all the other interviews I've seen, especially the conclusiveness of the McCanns, the lack of hope they have for ever recovering her even this early on, is just astounding to me. I think it's fair to say we expected a very British-style response that you would expect if you were in a big metropolitan city. But you have to put it in context that we're in a tiny resort. But, you know, that aside, um, we, the times for these lessons to be learned will be after the investigation is finished and not now. You know, it's an ongoing investigation which has huge resources both from Portuguese and the British. They're working very, very closely with lots of expert help and I know there's hundreds of pieces of information continuing to come forward and I would strongly like to emphasise we would like anyone who's been in here in the two weeks leading up to the abduction to come forward if they have not already done so and upload their photographs because we want Madeline back and people can still influence that. Looking back, I mean, did you see anything suspicious in the days leading up to her abduction? Did you notice anything? Have you been racking your brains to try to, to think whether people might have been watching? This is a good question. If And this goes to the reminiscence effect. Is there anything they've considered since the abduction that stands out to them? And by the example I gave earlier of reminiscence effect of the parents of a missing child would be them talking about any shady person they saw. For example, the example I gave in another video was a guy wearing sunglasses at night when she was walking to the room. Anything along those lines. Someone uh, who, who didn't look like they belonged at the resort. Any small thing, or I think I remember actually seeing the light turn on in the bedroom uh, earlier in the night after Matt checked. So let's see if they reply demonstrating some reminiscence effect, or if they do not supply any other details and only talk about their alibi. Remember, since day one, they have been insistent that Madeline was kidnapped. They have not entertained any other options about anything that happened to her, which is a sign of a hoax. When someone doesn't know what happened, what, what happened, all options are open. If someone's trying to manipulate you and direct the narrative, they will only point to their alibi. In this case, the McCanns have created a script of an alibi where some third party, some random vagrant who will never be found, came in through the window, took Madeline, and disappeared into the mist. And even though they don't know who this person is, none of their friends could have done it. None of the host hotel staff have done it. They said this with their own words, right? They never pointed the finger at their friends. They never 
pointed that when they're asked directly if they think the hotel might have had something to do with it, they said no in other interviews, which is absurd. Because if you don't know what happened, everyone's a suspect. And they have not even pointed the finger at each other. So let's see how they answer this. If they are hoaxers, which I think they are, right? I think their alibi hits all the criteria of a hoax. They want you to believe in something and they're insistent you must believe this because they know if you don't believe it, the finger will point back at them. So if they were hoaxers, the only details they might mention here are ones that point towards some random third-party kidnapper who will never be caught. It will not be some reminiscence about some shady hotel staff or something Matt said when he came back from checking on the children. We didn't. If we did, we wouldn't tell you yeah. because it may be important information, but we didn't, you know. Well, that's, this is almost too on the nose. They actually answered even worse than I imagined they could have answered. Let's see. And then they said we couldn't tell you. Let's listen to the question again, the response. This is, this is absurd. I think what happened is the Portuguese police understood the truth. And then once the British and international people got involved, they muddied up the case. I think they actually pushed the Portuguese off track. And why they did that, I don't know. Maybe people don't like being seen as heartless by accusing the parents of, of a missing child of, of doing it to her. But the fact of the matter is, if, if your goal is to get to the truth, like mine is, you have to have, A, the skills to detect lies and truth. And that can be taught. That's why I'm teaching you on this channel. But you cannot teach the courage to stick by your conviction. So even if you know the truth, you have to be able to stick by the truth through thick and thin. And I think that the, the British people who got involved or the Portuguese police, someone got bullied into feeling bad about accusing the parents and they were dropped as suspects far too early. And people can still influence that. Looking back, I mean, did you see anything suspicious in the days leading up to her abduction? Did you notice anything? Have you been racking your brains to try to, to think whether people might have been watching? So he's basically asking about exactly the less, today's lesson, reminiscence effect. Do they remember anything? Now it's later in time. They've been racking their brains, supposedly. The parents of missing children would be racking their brains 24 hours a day, thinking of any slight detail that might help. They would be calling the police constantly saying, hey, I just thought of this. Uh, I saw this guy hovering by our room two days before. Maybe he, he had a beard. Maybe he's the perpetrator. That is how the parents of actual missing children act. So he asks them precisely about reminiscence. Have you remembered any details over the course of time since the first time you told us this story? And look at how they respond. This is egregious. <laughs> We didn't. If we did, we wouldn't tell you because it may be important information, but we didn't, you know. It was such a relaxing holiday. And in fact, as a fact... Wow. No details. No reminiscence effect. Right here. Extreme consistency. And I'll just read you this. This was posted to the members last week. Hopefully when the members watch this video, because I sent it to them a few hours ago to prepare, they looked back at this note. So, and I'll just read it here if you're listening on podcast mode. Two people lying together face the challenge of aligning their stories. And here on the channel, I call this scripting. And one way to spot it, the one I wanted to highlight in this video, is extreme consistency. Genuine stories evolve with more details on later tellings. So more facts are remembered over time. This is known as the reminiscence effect. However, Co-conspirators keep to a fixed script, avoiding added details that risk contradiction. In other words, the McCanns are in it together, and the best way not to get caught is to keep their story as rigid as possible. So right when Jerry sat Kate down and said, hey, this is what our story is going to be, they knew right then they could not add extra details, because if they're ever interviewed separately, 
and that that's going to be the next part of this series. I, I, it's, I've been told in the comments that they've done individual interviews, so I want to analyze those next. They know that if they're interviewed separately, the more details they add, the harder it's going to be to align their stories. So scripted stories are rigid from day one, and they're vanilla. They're very easy to remember. Everything's logical. There's no unique details. And because it's made up, there's virtually no sensory details like touch. Did the room feel colder because the window is open? We never hear that. Touch, taste, smell, these things all show up in real stories. And if you want to see an example of real stories, I've got a playlist called Honesty Benchmarks. And one of the videos on that playlist is Christy Mack, who was almost beaten to death by her boyfriend. And when she was asked, you know, did he punch you in the face? She said, I don't know. Which makes sense because she was blacking out. But then she gives a sensory detail. But I tasted blood in my mouth and my tooth was loose. My tooth was loose. Totally sensory details. The mechanics we get very, I haven't heard any sensory details in any of the tellings of the story family unit up until that night and with the friends we were here certainly for us it was as good a what did he say he said they were a family unit up until that night if madeline's still alive they could be a family unit again you've been racking your brains to try to to think whether people might have been watching we didn't if we did we wouldn't tell you yeah. because it may be important information but we didn't you know it was such a relaxing holiday and the other concerning thing, like I said, these are not sophisticated liars. Casey Anthony, if you've seen my video about her, is a sophisticated liar. Or even O.J. Simpson, if you've seen my video about him, how to, uh, I think it's How to Catch a Troll is the title of the video, is not sophisticated, but he's a flagrant liar. He can lie to your face, and he's not very good at it. He's got a ton of dupers delight, but he's, he might even be a better liar than the McCanns. If you are doing an interview about your missing daughter, the entire point of the interview is to put the details out there that would be important to the case. So the fact that Joy says, even if we did think of something we wouldn't tell you is, is very strange. It's bizarre. And in fact, as a family unit up until that night. Sorry, let me rewind. Anything suspicious in the days leading up to her abduction? Did you notice anything? Have you been racking your brains to try to, to think whether people might have been watching? We didn't. If we did, we wouldn't tell you yeah. because it may be important information, but we didn't, you know. It was such a relaxing holiday. And in fact, as a family unit up until that night, and with the friends we were here, certainly for us, it was as good a holiday as we have had with the children up until that point. You have to keep believing that Madeline is still going to be found alive and well. Absolutely. Do, do, you, do you ever, though, allow yourself to, to drift towards negative thought? I think in the early days we did, and I think that's inevitable. I think any parent who's been through this does that, certainly in the first few days. We don't now. We're actually um, a lot stronger, a lot more hopeful. This is uh, about the third time now that Kate has said any parent any parent would feel this way. Any parent who's been this would feel this way, which is unusual. It's To me, it sounds like too much persuasion that she's maybe read an article about how parents of missing children act. Why not just speak for yourself? That's how I felt. I felt that way. When people are telling the truth, they don't need to involve outside uh uh, outside stories, third parties to corroborate their story. They can just say it directly. So, for example, in the early days, I did drift that way. You know, it was tough. That's a much more reliable response than something along the lines of, well, studies show that parents of missing children do allow themselves to drift to negative places in the beginning. Uh, so that's what I did. It's it's unusual. So listen again. Listen. This is about the third time she's done it now. I didn't point it out the other two times. Um, so if you if you rewatch this, I think uh, you'll pick that up. I think she did at least once or twice before. 
but it is unusual. It's too much persuasion. She can't just speak for herself. She has to uh, justify her responses, it sounds like. Days we did, and I think that's inevitable. I think any parent who's been through this does that, certainly in the first few days. We don't now. We're actually um, a lot stronger, a lot more hopeful now. And we have to be hopeful. It's what keeps us a lot more hopeful. I believe her. I think she's a lot more hopeful that she and Jerry will get away with it now. I think that's what she feels stronger about and more hopeful about, that they will get away with it. Because the longer your kid is missing, the less hope you should have, logically. That's why there's TV shows called First 48. If it doesn't get solved in the first 48 hours, chances of it getting solved plummet. Like I said, these are not sophisticated liars. Almost every answer they've given is the total wrong response. And I wonder if people are catching that in the comments of this video. Oh, they're, so for example, they're pointing out, oh, well, what's done is done, etc. So people, I think, on an intuitive level can tell there's something wrong with the McCanns. Uh, I think most of the people on my channel, uh, my subscribers, point this out as well, that they always felt like there was something off. And I think what I'm doing here is pointing out why you felt that way. So putting a name to what you were sensing, for example, lack of reminiscence effect, or unusual responses because they're involving third parties and what should just be a, a personal response because allegedly she is the mother of a missing child. Why does she need to talk about any parent in this situation feeling that way? Keeps us going and keeps us focused. And what about Sean and Emily? What have you said to them about their big sister? They're really good. I mean, they're at an age really where they're, they're still quite young and I guess it hasn't had the same impact on them as if they were a little bit older. They do talk about Madeline. Um, they pick Another thing I, I've never pointed out before, but it's unusual. Across all these interviews, whenever they're asked about the twins, they always say they're really good, etc. But let's say Madeline was kidnapped. What if the twins woke up and saw something? Uh, are they not concerned that maybe you know maybe one twin woke up and maybe thought it was a nightmare, but saw their sister getting bundled into a bag and screaming for her life, or clawing a you know, scary man in the bedroom looking like a monster. There's no concern about the twins, you know, that maybe there might be something repressed, something they saw but didn't tell them, some sort of, tra uh, you know, that they're traumatized deep down by, by seeing Maddie, Maddie get taken or seeing the man coming through the window. There's zero concern that the twins might have seen anything or have any long-lasting repercussions from the kidnapping because the parents know it didn't happen. Also, I never see them say something along the lines of, and this is a big one, you know, we're so happy they weren't taken too. You know, thank God whoever came through the window didn't take the, the twins as well. You know, at least now we just have to find Maddie and and. The twins are at least safe, and I really hope they didn't even see it happen. I hope they slept through the night. You never see them express any concern that the twins could have were at ever were ever at risk of being taken, or ever at risk of having seen the actual kidnapping. And I've never pointed that out in another video, but it's huge. You think at least in this early interview they would express something like that, but they are so scripted and so bad at lying that they don't even entertain what uh, someone who is actually in, in the situation of a kidnapped daughter would be saying. And they pick up things and say Madeline's, you know, uh, and, and that's fine, but they're, they're really good. I think that's, you know, something that as many people have said to us that this is a parent's worst nightmare, and it is. Another thing people point out in my comments, like I said, I've got the smartest subscribers, is uh, I see a lot of comments, why wouldn't the kidnapper take the twins too? Or if this kidnapper was kidnapping ch children for trafficking, surely if they were casing the family, the twins would be of a higher value because they're younger and more unique. 
uh, or surely if they were casing the family, Madeline would be the least likely to be taken because of her unique eye fleck. She'd be the most likely of being retrieved, which are all good points. The, the case, and that's the thing. Once you go down the rabbit hole of actually entertaining their story, more and more holes appear. That's why I like to just nip it at the bud. I don't even entertain the story. It sounds scripted. Since my first analysis, it has sounded scripted. And while I try never to be 100% conclusive, if I am betting on the McCants, I'm stacking up all my chips, except for one, let's say, and I'm going almost all in that they, uh, that Kate accidentally sedated Maddie. Maddie died. Jerry took charge. Jerry came up with the script. Kate, at this point in this interview, is, is apparently still learning the script or still not comfortable reciting the script because she didn't actually give that script a response. Uh, she said she can't give talk about it, which is unusual. And then they buried Maddie somewhere cold, uh, dark, and maybe inside of a, um, a suitcase or a bag or some sort of container to keep her way down. And we came up with that last bit based on some leap gauge, I think, in um, my last McCann's video. So if you want to see how this theory has evolved and why I'm uh, very convinced of my theory about this and how it's crystallized, uh, make sure to watch this DD versus McCann's playlist. I think that's, you know, something that... Let me rewind here. Is... <laughs> I mean, they're at an age really where they're, they're still quite young and... I guess it hasn't had the same impact on them as if they were a little bit older. They do talk about Madeline. Um, they pick up things and say Madeline's, you know, uh, and, and that's fine, but they're, they're really good. I think that's, you know, something that is, many people have said to us that this is a parent's worst nightmare. And it is, it truly is, and it's as bad as you can possibly imagine. But, you know, if all three of the children had been taken, it could have been even worse than your worst nightmare. Okay, so I spoke too soon. So they actually do mention that possibility. And I was expecting them to mention it here in this early interview, so that's good. And we've got to be strong for them. However, I think he, th he says other people brought up that concern. So it wasn't spontaneous from him. He says other people brought up that this is the worst nightmare. So let's listen again. That's, you know, something that is... <laughs> Many people have said to us that this is a parent's worst nightmare, and it is, it truly is, and it's as bad as you can possibly imagine. But, you know, if all three of the children had been taken, it could have been even worse than your worst nightmare. And we've got to be strong for them. You know, they're here. Um, they do bring you back to earth. And we cannot... And this goes back to something I said earlier in this video, and I theorized in a previous video based on something Jerry said. I think the way Jerry and Kate justify disposing of their little daughter's body unceremoniously in a well or in a cavern or a cave or in the ocean in a, in a suitcase is because they understand that if they came forward to the police, there is a chance they would be arrested for negligence, in which case their family unit the twins would be taken away. They would be locked up. So I think they justify it. And he even used the word rationalize earlier. That they're rationalizing it. The way they rationalize the way they've mistreated Maddie and the lies they're telling is because it's for the benefit of the twins. It keeps the family unit together, those that remain. And I think I, caught, I detected a little bit of leakage as well here. When he said back to earth, let's listen. That this is a parent's worst nightmare and it is it truly is and it's as bad as you can possibly imagine but you know if all three of the children had been taken it could have been even worse than your worst nightmare and we've got to be strong for them you know they're here right we've got to be strong for them i think by that he means they have to be strong they have to convince everyone they're innocent they have to mislead the police they have to mislead the press for the twins they have to stay strong for the twins 
they had to take their daughter's body and hide it somewhere without giving her a proper burial uh, for the twins. That, that was hard to do. They had to be strong for the twins. He probably said that exact same thing to Kate. Look, I'm going to tell you what happened. You know, calm down. You're shaking up. Calm down. I'm going to tell you what to do. You're going to say this script and never veer off that script. You have to be strong for the twins. Um, they do bring you back to Earth. Bring you back to Earth. Could that be leakage? Possibly. Um, like I say in every video, when I point out leakage, it does not necessarily mean that I think Maddie's buried in the Earth just because he said, bring you back to Earth. Leakage is something that you have to notice a lot of instances of because it reveals what's on someone's brain. So when you're telling a lie, um, especially a fabricated lie, right? So a lie by commission, you have to invent something. And while you say it, you have to repress your memory of what actually happened. And under stress, what people tend to do is actually a leak a little bit of what they're repressing of their memory, because memory is much stronger than imagination. And they can actually use odd phrases or slips of the tongue, what people might call Freudian slip, and actually leak the truth through their word choice. One instance of it, okay. But three or more is a pattern, is a great indicator of leakage. And it doesn't necessarily mean the person's guilty, but it means if you're placing a bet on their guilt, that you should be allocating more chips to that bet. Or... Um, for example, if I were in charge of this investigation, uh, Jerry has made so many water-related comments across the interviews that we've analyzed that to me, it, it, can, it is very likely leakage. So if I were in charge of the investigation, I would allocate a lot of resources towards checking the coastline within an, a day's drive of the hotel. Or, after reading your comments, any wells or caverns in the area. I think that's a great suggestion. And we the thing with a well is that, let's say the body were retrieved. It doesn't necessarily mean that the McCanns put her in the well. Because then they can argue, well, we didn't sedate McCann. The kidnapper must have given her a sedative to keep her quiet while they kidnapped her. And then once they saw the big uh, cir media circus, they dropped her down the well. So they could get out of it even if they're caught, which is why the kidnapper angle is so good for them. But because it sounds scripted, because the leakage indicates that they know she's already dead, it would not fool us here on this channel. And we cannot, you know, grieve. One, we did grieve, of course we grieve, but ultimately... We need to... Very strange. So he said we could not grieve, which is what the parent of a missing child would not even mention grieving because they don't know if she's dead or not. They might cry or be sad. But then he says they did grieve. Grieving is something you do for a dead person. It's not something you do for a missing child. In fact, it's the last thing you do because you're... Most missing parents of missing children hope beyond hope that they will find their kid. They're actually irrational. 30 years later, 40 years later, they, you know, they say, I, 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 in my dreams, I can see my missing kid. I know she's alive. I know she's coming home. The grieving process happens when you know someone's dead. You process the death, you grieve them, and now you have catharsis. And I think the McCanns, because of the pressure of the situation, went through that process very quickly. So notice how he does admit here that they grieved for Madeline. Another red flag, another indicator that they know she's dead. You know, if all three of the children had been taken, it could have been even worse than your worst nightmare. And we've got to be strong for them. You know, they're here. Um, they do bring you back to earth. And we cannot, you know, grieve. One, we did grieve, of course we grieved, but... We grieved. So he tried to say the right thing, but then he corrected himself, right? We did grieve. Ultimately, we need to be in control. 
so that we can influence and help in any way possible, not just Sean and Amelie, but the investigation. And I think he's saying here exactly why they do so many interviews. So in my early McCann's videos, lots of people commented, well, if they're guilty, why do they do so many interviews? If they're guilty, surely they would be quiet. If they're guilty, uh, they would never go on TV. That's wrong. It's the same way that murderers always try to, or typically, try to be involved in the investigation. They, they participate in the search parties. Uh, they return to the scene of the crime. They want to be able to influence the narrative. I think the McCanns are petrified of losing control of the narrative, and I've said this many times in my video, in my videos about them. The reason they do so many interviews and wrote a book is because they have a hoax to push. They need to, for people to believe that Madeline was kidnapped. Because as soon as people start questioning that narrative or stop believing it, the finger points back at them. So all the press they do, all the interviews they do, it makes perfect sense for guilty parents. And a few weeks ago, I, I mentioned, hey, I'll, I'll do, let's analyze an interview of the parent of an actual missing child so I can show you the differences. Do you know how many interviews I found? Very few. Very, very few interviews of parents of actual missing children because they don't go on media tours. What they do is they're on the phone all day with the investigators, following, mentioning any details they have. Instead, with the McCanns, what Jerry just admitted here is that they want to be in front so that they can influence the investigation. They want to point the investigators in the direction of a kidnapper who will never be found because that way the finger does not point back at them. And this is an insane admission from him. This whole interview is, is uh, unbelievable to me. I knew they were bad liars, but this is another level. They have not learned how to lie yet in this interview, how to, well, not how to lie, how to respond with well-scripted answers yet. Because even in later interviews, when they, whenever they do give a good response, they actually contradict their response when they respond to something off the cuff. So they seem to always have a nice scripted answer for expected questions, but whenever they're asked an unexpected question or go a little bit, uh, talk for a little bit too long, they actually contradict their initial response, their, their perfectly packaged little scripted, uh, scripted answer possibly imagine but you know if all three of the children had been taken it could have been even worse than your worst nightmare and we've got to be strong for them you know they're here um, they do bring you back to earth and we cannot you know grieve one we did grieve of course we grieve but ultimately we need to be in control so that we can influence and help in any way possible not just Sean and Amelie but the investigation. I feel like this is a speech he gave to Kate. Oh my God, I over-sedated Maddie. She's dead now. What are we going to do? Grab her by the shoulders. We need to be strong. We need to be in control, not just for the twins, but to influence the investigation. And here he said influence, and then he, he said and help. Influencing the investigation is the number one priority. That came first. And then he said help. Almost as an afterthought. This seems like, a, like a, an actual speech he gave to Kate to get her on board with their scripted story. The fact that he says here in an interview that they want to influence the investigation is insane how anyone looked at anyone besides the parents in this case. We need to be in control so that we can influence and help in any way possible, not just Sean and Amelie, but the investigation. And because of them, the day may come when you have to leave here and go back to the UK. I know you've got no plans to do so at the moment, but how do you think you're going to feel if that, that day comes and you have to go to the airport and fly back? I can't think about that, Ian, to be honest. I can't think about going home without Madeline. 
So. I notice you've got um, Madeline's cuddly toy with you as always. Mm. How did that start, and and what comfort does it bring you? Where did it come from? Or no, how did the idea come to just have it in your hands all the all the time? Well, it's something that Madeline has with her every night, and if she's upset or not well, then she has cuddle cats. And so it provided me with a little bit of comfort, something of Madeline close to me. This is International Missing Children's Day. I mean, I guess Madeline... The thing with Kate's answer there is I think it's true. Like I said all the time, it's still a tragedy. Even if they over-sedated Maddie by accident and she died, it's still tragic. She's still a mother who lost a daughter. And now she has to hide that fact and point the investigators away from her and Jerry in order to protect her remaining children. So everything she said here about Cuddle Cat and how it's something of Maddie's and she keeps it close to her, I'm sure is true. I'm sure she misses Maddie. Uh, I don't think these are psychopaths. They're not good enough liars, in my opinion, to be psychopaths. Also, I'm not a clinician, so I can't diagnose them. But they're not heartless like... Uh, uh, I mean, they're not uh, as bold liars who can lie directly to people's faces perfectly like Casey Anthony and then update their lies in real time. Th these are not the type of people they are. And I've also started my Amanda Knox series. So if you haven't seen that playlist, check it out because I haven't made a conclusion one way or the other about Amanda Knox. However, her composure is very unlike the McCann's. Not well, then she has cuddle cats. And so it provided me with a little bit of comfort, something of Madeline close to me. This is International Missing Children's Day. I mean, I guess Madeline's had more publicity than just about every missing child in the world put together. I'm sure you're very grateful for, for, for that. Why do you think it has provoked such enormous public support, of which I don't think we've ever seen before? I think there's... A uh, conglomeration of circumstances that have come together in this situation. The fact that we're on holiday, um, very safe resort, recognised for that. And of course, the, the world has changed in terms of information technology and the speed of response, you know, in terms of the media coming here and us being prepared. Um, Notice how he said it's a very safe resort. If your kid was kidnapped there, I don't think you'd be calling it safe. And this goes back to what I said earlier. I think they think everyone who blames them for leaving the kids alone in the bedroom is an idiot because that's not the reason something bad happened to Maddie. In their minds, they were perfectly right to go to dinner and leave her and the twins alone in the bedroom because it worked out perfectly. Nothing would have happened unless it, but what actually happened was Maddie was over-sedated. That's my opinion. And that's the guilt they're talking about. So when he says it's a safe resort, he, he's leaking. He knows it was safe. No one broke in and stole his daughter. Um, to some extent, use that to try and influence the campaign. But above all else, it's touched everyone. everyone. You don't have to be a parent for this to have a major impact on you. And I think it's also been very very important and some of the things which we did we have done and said which we didn't realize what impact they would have but so many thousands of people are doing small things to help us find madeline because the worst feeling was helplessness the absolute worst that we had no bearing on finding her but once you start to do that no bearing over the course of this madeline mccann series I've pointed out every instance of nautical leakage because I think Jerry, when he's answering questions, is having to repress the traumatizing moment that he put Madeline's little body into a body of water, whether it was a well, a cavern, the coastline inside a bag. And we've seen multiple instances of nautical leakage. In other interviews, he used the phrase, uh, keeping my head above water, or staying afloat. Then uh, he and Kate talked about radar. 
They also talked about thermal cameras. They expected the police to use thermal cameras to find Madeline, which was strange because even if the thermal camera s- saw Madeline, it would just look like a little girl and her dad or her mom or her parents if she were kidnapped. So the thermal camera didn't make sense. But it would make sense if she were somewhere cold and the heat were dissipating. So somewhere isolated and cold, a thermal camera would help her be found. So the fact that he mentioned he expected thermal cameras was very interesting. And now we have him say he was finding his bearing, where if if you're a sailor, you know that a bearing is your direction, right? Your course that you're going to take. And I'm a sailor myself. So this is lots of nautical leakage. Now, does this mean that Madeline's buried at water? Let's say we just heard this one instance of leakage where he said bearing. Of course not. My comments are filled with people saying, well, that's just how we speak in the UK or just how we speak in Scotland. I lived in the UK for years. I lived in Scotland for years. Trust me, your English is not that different from American English. The rules of statement analysis and deception detection apply to any English speaker. Besides some exceptions for regional slang, for example, it's the same it's the same language. The, the grammar is the same. The phrases are generally the same. There is no phrase like get your bearing that is unique to the UK that we not, do not also use in America or Canada or Australia or New Zealand. So when I point out this leakage, it does not mean that, hey, he said bearing, so that's a smoking gun. Go search the water. It is something I'm adding to a long list, a growing list of nautical leakage which is helping me clarify my position on the McCanns and where I think the body would be discovered if it were ever discovered. That, then you start to feel a bit better. And I hope we're going to look back at the end of all this and say that we have done everything in our power, but also that other people are helping in so many other ways and they feel that they are part of it. Does it worry you that people might start to lose interest as, as time goes on, the media coverage diminishes inevitably? For me, um, we know that the media coverage is not going to last a long time. It's lasted much longer and we have been much, much more successful in driving our message out than we could ever possibly have imagined. Personally, I think it... Notice how he says we've been more successful in driving our message out than we could have imagined. The message they've been giving. I haven't seen them describe Madeline in this interview. The message they've been giving is that someone abducted Madeline. And I believe him. I think they have been way more successful than they expected in convincing everyone of that story and getting it spread out there. So lots of the answers he's giving, I I believe, right? When I go into a statement analysis, I don't go in expecting to say, gotcha, you're a liar. I'm actually listening closely to what they're saying and accepting what they say because I understand how difficult lying is. 99% of the time, if someone's going to lie to you, they'll do it by omission, just by leaving stuff out. So 99% of what people say is true. So when he says that they are surprised how successful they were at getting their message out, I believe him. The only difference is I think he's omitting omitting the fact that his message is that someone abducted Madeline, which is not a true story. Also, I think that based on answers they've said in this interview and other interviews, they thought that the police would actually, there there was a chance that they would find the body. I think they were actually surprised how easy it was to hide Madeline's body. So um, the more I think about it, uh, I need to give you guys credit. Uh, maybe I'll do a post about it or feature another video. But the first person to, or the few of you who have mentioned the well theory, the more I think about your theory of a well, the more it lines up with the leakage and the fact that they thought it was very likely that Madeline, or they were surprised how easy it was to hide Madeline. She may in fact be in a well. Did the Portuguese police check every well in the area? That, that would be interesting to know. Because even if they did find the body in a well, they could still argue that she was kidnapped, which is why their kidnap story is so good. 
Because they could say, well, the kidnapper sedated her and threw her in the well. And it would be down to us and the leakage we've recognized to pin it on them. These embedded confessions, the leakage they're making, the way they betray their knowledge about what actually happened to her, is why I would continue pointing the finger at them, even if the body were found and they were to argue that the kidnapper disposed of the body. I think it's gone beyond that at the minute, and that there is a feeling with many, many people out there that they will not allow this to happen. And we know that, and we pray that it doesn't happen again, but when it does, the speed of the next response and the template we have set will alter it. And there has been so much goodwill and humanity out there that it really has restored, that one evil act actually has resulted in so much good. Where do you go from here? There's to one evil act has resulted in so much good. That sounds to me like a just the justification they tell themselves. Right, another justification. What we did to Madeline was truly evil because we buried her unceremoniously. However, look at all the good that not only uh, did it uh, bring us as a family unit closer together, us and the twins, but it actually set us up financially for life. So, you know, th and that's a blessing from Madeline. It also brings awareness to other missing children, and we can be advocates for those other, for actual missing children, but it's still good out in the world. It sounds like a justification of people who have done something heinous and are justifying it to themselves. If your kid were actually kidnapped, and it's only been a few days or weeks since the kidnapping, I don't think you'd be sitting there thinking of all the silver linings of her kidnapping. I think you'd still be distraught about it and uh, frustrated with the police for not finding her and focused only on your missing daughter, not worrying about the world at large until your daughter is found. It's, yet again, it's another answer that sounds like it sounds good until you actually think about it. And that's basically what we do here on the channel. We listen closely to what is said, and we put it through the filter of uh, either studies of statement analysis rules, or just the filter of, of uh, logic, or the filter of comparing what someone's saying here to something they said in the past, right? So the filter of consistency and truth. There's talk of traveling around Europe. Have you got any firm plans as yet? We haven't got any firm plans. We're likely to travel in a few places in Europe, um, but as yet, no, no definite plans. But you've got no plans to go back to the UK for the foreseeable future? No. So travel around Europe is bizarre. Is it a search? Are they searching for Madeline around Europe? That, that whole exchange is strange, but see, the thing is the interviewer use the words travel around Europe, so it didn't really give us much. It'd be interesting if they said, yes, we're planning to travel around Europe, rather than saying, for example, we're planning to search around Europe in the hot spots of child trafficking to see if we can find any clues, something along those lines. I think that everybody has just been incredibly impressed with, with you as a couple and how you've, you've dealt with this. There was a, a period after a week or so where you, you, you looked as if you were almost broken and who could, who could uh, not understand that. And then there seemed to be a sort of a strength come from somewhere. Um, is, is that a fair point? Is that what happened? And, what and I think that's when they both got on board and realized the debate was over. We cannot go to jail. Even if it's unlikely they would convict us of negligence for over-sedating Maddie, if the small chance that we'll be taken away from the twins and locked up in a foreign country, the twins' lives will be ruined. So this is their first interview, but I'd be curious to see their first statement they made, um, if they did like a police statement, and see how they're acting there. Because maybe if they were distraught, at that point, it's because they were still debating, should we admit the truth and just see what happens? I right, put all the cards on the table. Because once you resolve to lie, there's no going back. 
Once you resolve to lie, then it's easy. Once they sit down and script the story. I brought that about. I think that's definitely true, isn't it? Um... Certainly, you know, at the end of that first week, there was so much emotion that we had spent and we actually had a period where we discussed this openly that we felt devoid, completely devoid of emotion. And Devoid. Void. I know lots of you think I'm reaching. Void. The void. A well is a void. Does his use of the word devoid mean Madeline is 100% in a well? No. Okay. But I am adding it to my list of leakage, suggesting Madeline is in water, deep cold water, or deep cold well, or deep cold cavern. And if you think it's a stretch, watch the rest of my McCann's videos and watch how this theory has formed across eight videos at this point. I went into the McCann's knowing very little about the case. The analogy that I like to use is a bit like when we were students and you got to your overdraft limit and you'd gone beyond it and there was just nothing left in the tank. Um, also, I think physically and mentally. Nothing left in the tank. Were shattered. Uh, nothing left in the tank. Strange. Maybe one of you guys. The way I'm doing my new format now, and I think it's a lot more entertaining, is I'm seeing this video for the first time, and I'm giving it one watch, and I'm pointing out the high-level stuff. Because the reason I came back to YouTube is I think the most important skill to learn is how to catch liars and manipulators, scammers, grifters, etc. in real time. Because rarely in life do you have the chance to record someone who's trying to dupe you and then go parse their words and do a deep statement analysis study of it, which I used to do in my old videos, right? I would do a deep dive into it and then present uh, a video with very deep dive uh, instructions. Here we're watching it for the first time. I'm giving you my first impressions. However, because of that, I'm not going to catch every little nuance. But the members of my channel are actually, and uh, my other subscribers as well, are catching things that I miss on my first pass through, which is great because when I read your comments, I get the same satisfying eureka moment, like when I read about the wells, that you guys get when I point out something that you missed. So it makes it more entertaining for everyone. It makes it more collaborative. And I'm sure at this part right here, where he talked about the analogy with being students or emptying the tank, I'm missing some sort of leakage. And it might be leakage that ties back to a fact that I don't even know about it. For, for example, is Jerry a scuba diver? Because I'm a, I scuba dive. And one of the most common words we're using when we're scuba diving is our tanks. You're constantly dealing with your tank. Uh, preparing it, checking the pressure, uh, checking the gauges. And if you're thinking about a body of water and putting something deep down there, tank might be a word that comes to mind. So I think, I feel like I'm missing something here, some potential bit of leakage we can add to our list. And if you're a member, I might actually create a running tally of nautical water-related leakage and put it here so we can all add to it. If you haven't become a member yet, uh, I, I suggest doing so. It's a great way to support the channel since so many of my videos do get demonetized. And you get to use all these fun emojis during the live chat it, it when I premiere each video so we can chat together live. And uh, you get a little badge to indicate how long you've been a member as well as extra lessons, extra posts I do here with a little bit more deep dive lessons that might not be uh, as interesting to the casual viewer. Um, but, you know, as you gradually get more on an even keel, we started to get back into the black. And we'd also worked tirelessly behind the scenes to put support mechanisms in place. 
including our legal team, the response with the fund, which was really driven by offers rather than us thinking that we needed it. And once these were in place, then it helped us to focus on what we really needed to focus on. Well, everyone who's watching, who's been following Madeline's case over the past three weeks, just wishes you all the best. Thanks very much, Jerry. Thanks for having me. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, so this was recorded three weeks after Madeline went missing, and it seems to me like they've already processed a death rather than the heat of the search for a missing child. If you want me to compare the McCanns to uh, someone whose child was confirmed missing, so someone who we know their kid was eventually found and kidnapped, let me know because you will see a stark difference between that person and the McCanns. How would the FBI have approached the Madeline McCann case. I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like button, subscribe button, and the notification bell. In today's video, I'm going to take you through a very important analysis. We're going to look at the first two appeals the McCanns made right when Madeline went missing on May 4th and May 5th, 2007, and put them, put them through the filter that the FBI would have put them through. So let's listen to the first appeal, and then I'll show you the filter I'm talking about. I already sent this to our members, and we'll apply it to the situation as best we can. What cannot describe... Mrs. McCann clutched a child's toy while her husband spoke. Words cannot describe the anguish and despair that we are feeling as the parents of our beautiful daughter, Madeline. We re request that anyone who may have any information related to Madeline's disappearance, no matter how trivial, contact the Portuguese police and help us get her back safely. Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her mummy, daddy, brother and sister. That was the first appeal that the McCanns made. And the reason I'm doing this video with the McCanns is simply because the McCanns are back in the news. It's part of an ongoing series I'm doing of them. So I've done eight videos on the McCanns. You can watch this playlist if you want to see them all. And this is now the ninth video of the McCanns. And one thing I mentioned in my Amanda Knox series was 911 calls. And lots of people commented wanting to understand how to assess a 911 emergency call to tell if the person making the call is guilty or innocent. And I think people are fascinated with 911 calls because in lots of true crime documentaries and shows, they typically play the 911 call. And intuitively, people understand that a guilty person will probably say something that an innocent person won't. So for the members of the channel, I did this post uh, right around the time of recording. I, did, I posted this 16 minutes ago. And... If you're listening on podcast mode, this is a checklist. Specifically, it's an FBI emergency call assessment checklist. And this is essentially the best practices the FBI suggests to assess an emergency 911 call. And since I don't have the 911 call of the McCanns, I want to run these early press conferences they did through this filter. Because just like a 911 call, the press conference should have the same priorities because they are appealing to the public, um, to officials to help them solve an emergency, an ongoing fresh emergency, their missing daughter. And if you're listening on podcast mode, I'll just walk you through these criteria. And all these criteria come from studies. So it's not just a psychologist sitting down and saying, hmm, what would a guilty person say? Or what would an innocent person say? It has to do with actual studies of about 100 911 calls that were made where uh, half were innocent people, half were guilty people, and 
by guilty, they were actually convicted of the crime. And um, a statement analyst was actually involved in the creation of this list. So the first big question when you're analyzing an emergency call, or in this case, when we're going to listen to that appeal again, is what was the call about? What is the message of the person making the statement? And innocent people typically do four things in this category. They request help for the victim. They provide relevant information. They express concern for the victim, uh, the victim, and they correct facts. So, if you hear on a nine one call, someone would say, "Hey, uh, a guy's just been shot," and the police say, "Okay, uh, can you check their pulse?" And you know they go over and they say, "You know, actually, I, I'm feeling for the pulse. This is actually a woman, not a man." That's actually a good sign. It means that they're updating the facts in real time as we get them. And if you've seen my other McCann videos, you understand that a big red flag for me with these parents is they never update the facts of their story. They never add any additional information, which is one reason I believe their story is scripted. And I've done about two videos on the way I think their story is scripted. So uh, when innocent people make a call or an appeal like this, they request help for the victim, they provide relevant info. They express concern for the victim, and they correct any incorrect facts. Guilty callers, however, do not request help for the victim. Often what they do is they request help for themselves. So they might phrase something like, you know, 911 is your emergency. Hello, I've got a problem. My son uh, isn't waking up. So rather than saying something like, my son isn't waking up, help, you know, I need help here now, here's my address. They say, I've got a problem. So their priority is themselves, which is a big red flag for guilty callers. The request, the help they're requesting is for themselves, not for the, for, you know, uh, the victim. In the case of the McCanns, I think we're going to notice that they fail this one here in this press, press conference. The second thing is they provide a lot of extraneous information. So whereas innocent callers are trying to just relay facts, you know, the address, what's going on, and try to uh, get help there as quickly as possible and make it as easy as possible for people to understand what they need. Guilty callers, guilty appeals, typically have extraneous information. So they have extra info, and usually that info is related to the crime itself. So they're trying to create a narrative. They're trying to persuade people of something that happened. They're trying to persuade people of their alibi. And in the case of the McCanns, we see this all the time with them, where there's a distinct lack of concern for Madeline, and lots of the info they provide is pointing towards their narrative of a third-party person coming in and kidnapping her. They spend a lot of time talking about the crime itself rather than the victim, Madeline. Um, and we've seen like four interviews of them now. We analyzed three or four interviews of them now with various people. And each time they have to be prompted to bring up Madeline's unique eye fleck, which would actually help her be identified. Whereas they go out of their way to provide info about the open window and the potential that someone kidnapped her. And then finally, guilty callers typically have conflicting facts. So they might say something like, my baby's not waking up. Um, and then you know, if 911 caller says, has she been breathing okay? And they say, yeah, she's been breathing fine for hours. She just is not waking up now. And then 911 says, okay, what were you doing a few minutes ago? They say, well, I, I was just woken up by a phone call. Right? So they conflict. Were you either monitoring the baby for the last few hours to make sure they were fine? Or were you just woken up by a phone call? which is different from correction of facts, right? So just because new facts are added does not make the person guilty. The new facts that are added have to conflict with existing facts. So there's two more sections, but let's listen to this call and run it through this first filter of what was the call about? What was this first appeal about? But Mrs. McCann clutched a child's toy while her husband spoke. Words cannot describe the anguish 
and despair that we are feeling as the parents of our beautiful daughter, Madeline. So already we're talking about their anguish and their despair. Does this mean that they are guilty parents? No, not necessarily. But if we are going to check on our checklist, we don't. they have not requested help for the victim yet. I think they do later though, right? So let's run it through the filter because we have two more filters to run it through. And by the end of this video, you should be able to run any 911 call that you see on TV through this filter the same way the FBI would. I don't know if they've updated this in the last few years though, but this is the FBI's best practices checklist for 911 dispatchers. Um, and then also, if someone's trying to scam you, for example, calling you and say, hey, I need help. Um, I need you to wire money to X, Y, and Z, you know, some third cousin, some distant relative, you can, you'll be able to tell if it's actually sincere or not. We request that anyone who may have any information related to Madeline's disappearance, no matter how trivial, contact the Portuguese police and help us get her back safely. Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her mummy, daddy, brother and sister. All right, so that was the first filter. Did they request help for the victim? They, they asked people if they had info to, to provide the info. Was the information they provided relevant? Not necessarily. In fact, the information they provided there was very useless. They didn't describe what Madeline looks like. They didn't say, uh, you know, what she was wearing for people to be on the lookout for. What if Madeline wandered away and she was just wandering around town? They didn't describe the pajamas she was in, her unique eye fleck. Um, so the information they provided was actually very minimal. It wasn't very useful if, if uh, they actually believe she's out there, um, nor did they offer some sort of appeal to whoever kidnapped her saying, you know, we're willing to pay. And um, you do see this with other parents of missing children. They say, please just, just uh, drop her off and we will forgive you. We, we won't ask any questions. Just leave her at the nearest library. Right, our uh, the nearest uh, where you know police station. Please, we won't pursue you. We won't look for you. Um, there's none of that here. And Madeline's just gone missing. The third criteria here is their concern for the victim. Do they express concern for Madeline? No, not there's no curiosity about what she's going through. So that's absent here. And then, uh, as far as correction of facts goes. We didn't see any of that because there's actually so few facts that they provided here. Okay, the next criteria. And th there are two appeals here. So let's go through the next criteria, and then we'll watch the second appeal, which I've not watched yet, and see if um, that has more info or, uh, for us to analyze, just so we're looking, listening to something fresh. The second set of criteria. So when you're assessing a 911 call, in this case, we're assessing... Uh, a press conference appeal for a missing girl. So it's not one for one. I'm sort of shoehorning this lesson into the McCann's case because I think it's an important lesson to cover. And I wanted to put it into my Amanda Knox series, which we're still working on. But the initial 911 call was in Italian, made by Raffaella Selecito. So I don't have a 911 call from that case either. But I want to get this lesson out there because I think it's useful. And these early press conferences are not in the heightened state, state one would make in the middle of an emergency of a 911 call. However, the emergency is still ongoing. Madeline is still missing and she just went missing. So I'm, I'm making an audible judgment call here. I think it's still appropriate to teach this lesson here. And um, I know in the comments lots of people will be saying I'm shoehorning it. I openly admit I'm shoehorning it here. I want to get this lesson out there. I think the McCanns are the videos that you guys are most likely to watch right now just because the McCanns are back in the news. And I want my members and my subscribers to have this filter. I want to give you FBI level 
uh, skills here. That's the whole reason I came back to YouTube is to help people spot liars, manipulators, and the thing I hate personally, which is sadists. All right, who was the call about? This is our second group of questions. Innocent callers request help for the victim. They focus on the victim's survival, and they do not accept, accept the victim's death. So, for example, if someone's calling the police, and the police say, check their pulse, um, let's say a mother says, you know, my, my, my boy's on the ground, he hit his head really hard, and they say, check for a pulse, and she says, There's, I don't have a pulse here, he needs help, send someone here now, I don't have a pulse. Well, if there's no pulse, her son is dead. But a mother in the heat of the moment is not going to accept the death. So that is a, an innocent caller. And there's actually a transcript very similar to that in this study. So it's, it's very sad, right? So uh, the kid has no pulse. The kid is actually rigid from being, uh, you know, from, from death. But the mother is still requesting help urgently. You know, get a 911 here. What are you guys doing? So there's no acceptance of death. Guilty callers, on the other hand, the help is requested for themselves. So even saying something as seemingly innocuous as, I've got a problem here. My, my baby's not breathing. That is a, a red flag ray, way to phrase the question. And in this study, there is also an example of someone saying exactly that. And it was later revealed that um, the baby died due to shaken baby syndrome. So the father shook the kid so hard, the kid um, passed away. And when he called the police, the way he phrased it was, I need help. The guilty callers also focus on their problems. That's more to what I said there, right? So they say, I need help, and then it's their problem. My not breathing kid is the problem. So it's their problem. Everything's framed around themselves. And they accept the victim's death. So if someone calls 911 and says, hey, a guy was just killed. I just heard a gunshot and I went over there and, and my neighbor's dead. That's also a red flag because of the conclusiveness. They're dead. Have, have you checked the pulse? People can pull through. Or how do you know they're dead? Right? Unless they're decapitated, um, accepting the victim's death in the throes of an emergency is a red flag. All right, so we have one more section to go, but let's listen to the second McCann's appeal just so we can hear it, and then we'll run it through that filter, and then we'll go through the last uh, check bit of this checklist. We would like to thank everyone here in Portugal, the UK, and elsewhere for all your support during this extremely, extremely difficult time for our family. We are pleased that the family liaison officer Notice how it's an extremely difficult time for our family. Not during this critical time for Madeline. It's a red flag. They are the priority. From Leicestershire are now working closely with the Portuguese police and in keeping us informed. We have no further information regarding the investigation, but appreciate the significant efforts everyone is making. No further information. Let's go back to our checklist. No additional facts. On our behalf, we would again... Also, look how they say that people are working on their behalf, not on Madeline's behalf. Investigation, but appreciate the significant efforts everyone is making on our behalf. On our behalf, they are the subject of of the sadness of the uh, investigation. This is not usual. By our checklist, the victim should be the priority. The vo focus should be on the victim survivor uh, survival, not their the requester's problem. Ah. We would again like to appeal for any information, however small, 
that may lead to the safe return of Madeline. Also notice how they're constantly requesting information. However, they're not providing any information. Like I said, Madeline has a distinctive eye fleck. One in how many of 100,000 people have that fleck on her pupil or on her iris. They haven't mentioned it here in either of these early press conferences, which is a huge red flag. It's not useful. The information they're providing is nil. They're not providing any information for people to help find Madeline. But they are talking about themselves. Right? The police are doing this for us. You know, thank you for investigating on our behalf. Our family is going through a tragedy right now. Instead of saying Madeline is going through a tragedy. In real pleas for help, particularly 911 calls, the focus is on the victim 100%. Okay, so here's our final set of criteria when we're running through this filter. And this is going to be an important video because let's say I've had lots of requests to do John Bonet Ramsey or Summer Wells or uh, I think Nicola Bully. I think lots of these cases actually have 911 call recordings. So the first thing we'll do if we start series on any of those, right? So right now we have our ongoing McCann series. We have our ongoing Amanda Knox series. If we start a series on one of those where there's a 911 call involved, this is the filter I will be running the 911 call through. So at least if you've watched this entire video and shared it around, or if you're a member, you can actually uh, pull this checklist here. You will already be familiar with the checklist I'm going to be running those 911 calls through. So the last series, uh, set of questions in assessing a 911 call, or in our case, assessing a plea for help about a missing child, is how was the call made? And the four criteria are voice modulation. We don't look at that sort of stuff here on this channel. We, I, I prefer to look strictly at the words people say because I feel like that has the least room for error. Um, I think body language or listening to tone, while it might have benefits, the risks of misinterpretation outweigh the benefits. So in my opinion, it's better to ignore body language, voice tone, etc. entirely than to pick and choose from it. Because I think it's too subjective and it's also too emotional. Listening to someone choking up and crying and tears welling in their eyes, if you even allow yourself to consider that, you can get fooled easily. Because I'm not a psychopath. That stuff does affect me, obviously. So it's easier for me to go into it saying, I'm going to ignore any tears, any cracking of the voice, any um, shivering, um, any dramatic displays, emotional displays, it's easier to just tell myself I'm going to ignore it from square one rather than even attempt to analyze it because it is so uh, it is so persuasive and if someone's lying, manipulative. It, it can really sway you. So I prefer to ignore it entirely. All right, so voice modulation is one criteria, however, that the FBI does analyze. Or at least they suggest 911 dispatchers do. The other great tell for uh, an innocent caller is they actually sound rude when they're requesting help. So they do not try to ingratiate themselves at all. They are urgent and they are rude. So if someone calls pol the police, you know, the police says 911 dispatch, they say, I need help. You know, uh, my kid needs help. Send someone here. Here's the address. Send them now. And the you know the dispatcher says, well, what happened? Do you have the pulse? I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Send someone now. And that is actually a sign of an innocent caller. Because they don't, because they're just relaying the truth, they don't care about making the police like them, which is known as ingratiation. So they don't care if you like them or not because they're telling the truth. They're not trying to persuade you of anything. They're literally just trying to get the police there to do their job 
which is to save whoever is in an emergency. Whereas guilty callers are more likely to be polite, so they're more likely to say, hello, you know, 901, what's your emergency? Hi, my uh, husband shot himself. That's a red flag. Or my husband cannot seem to wake up. That's a red flag. Because A, there's unnecessary words like hi. This is supposed to be an emergency, a high stress hormone situation, an ongoing situation, and you're taking time to say hi, and not using a contraction. So my husband cannot get up, cannot does not seem to be able to wake up, is also, believe it or not, a red flag. When someone's in the heat of an emergency, they dispense with all the formalities and all the niceties. And they even dispense with using full words. They use contractions. My husband can't wake up. My husband isn't waking up, right? Not my husband is not waking up. So even if something as small as a contraction can be a red flag. So how is the call made? If it's an innocent person, there's more voice modulation, which we will ignore here. The call is urgent and rude. And as you just saw with Jerry, He's this Madeline's been missing for over 24 hours at this point, and he's already taking time to thank all the people who are helping with this, you know, all the, the police who are involved in the search. It's too early to be thanking them. It to me, that is too polite and too patient. Actual parents of missing children are urgent and actually non ingratiating and rude. If the police have not found your daughter yet, you're pissed off. Don't you guys know how to do your job? She's a little girl in a pink pajamas. You can't find her. Where are the you know uh, sniffer dogs? To, with you know here, I've got her clothes here. Go search everyone's house. I don't care. That is how actual parents of missing children act. They do not take time to uh, thank and applaud the police who haven't found their daughter. It less than 72 hours after she's gone missing. That is a red flag. The third criteria under how was the call made is cooperation with the dispatcher. So innocent people cooperate with the authorities. They provide information. They answer the questions that are asked of them. Whereas guilty parties resist cooperation. So they don't answer every question. And I've seen lots of comments um, on my McCann videos of people saying that the McCanns actually refused to answer certain polygraph tests, uh, uh, polygraph questions, which is, of course, a giant red flag. If your daughter is missing, your first priority should be to cooperate with the authorities because you didn't do anything wrong. So you would expect them to submit themselves to any degree of investigation questioning, as embarrassing or humiliating as it is, in order to eliminate themselves as suspects so the police can focus on the actual kidnapper. However, that's not what the McCanns did. They were resistant, and even in the last McCanns video I did, How Repetition Reveals Lies, a, uh, the interviewer asked them, uh, are there any other details? I think that interview was done like a few weeks after the disappearance. The How Repetition Reveals Lies video I did. The interviewer asked them, are there any other details you've had time to recollect? Anything you noticed? Maybe someone you know, casing your family a few days before Madeline went missing. And they gave a very odd answer. Jerry said, first of all, both of them said no. No new g details. Which I point down that video. It violates the reminiscence effect. If you want to know what that is, you can watch that video. That video is mainly about the reminiscence effect, a very counterintuitive way to tell if someone's lying. So they said no. And then Jerry actually went on to say, even if we did remember something, it could be important. So I, I'm not going to tell you, which is bizarre, which is totally non-cooperative with people who are allegedly trying to help them find their missing daughter. The fourth, and this is actually the most indicative of a guilty caller. 
The fourth criteria is innocent callers do not have, have self-interruptions. Guilty callers do. If you see a self-interruption in an emergency appeal or um, an emergency 911 call, or in this case, an appeal, or even an interview, it's a red flag. What is a self-interruption? A self-interruption is when someone starts answering a question and s cuts themselves off and start saying something different. So for example, um, let's say uh, Jerry was asked, uh, what color pajamas, uh, what color pajamas was Madeline wearing? Well, she was wearing pink pajamas, but then we gave her a bath and we changed her into, uh, Let's see. Once again, I don't have a good example here. A self-interruption because it's so rare. It's when they start answering a question and shift to something else. So if Jerry was asked, you know, how far away, okay, how far away was the tapas bar that you guys were eating at? Is fifty meters away? At the tapas bar is fifty meters away, about one minute walk. Well, you couldn't even see the window to our room from where we were sitting, so that really doesn't matter. So that's a self-interruption where he's answering a question about the tapas bar, but then shifts his response to something totally unrelated, like how he could not see the window to his room from where he was sitting. It indicates that they have an agenda, that they want to convince you of something. Why would he mention that he couldn't see the window? All that does is bolster his story that someone came in through that window and stole Madeline. So that's a self-interruption. And if we see one in future videos, I'll be sure to point it out. This is actually the most indicative of a guilty caller is the self-interruption. So overall, if you're listening to a 911 call or an emergency appeal, like one of these pressers of parents of missing children, these are the criteria you should run it through. There's 11 of them. Innocent caller asks for help for the victim. They provide relevant info. And if the dispatcher asks a question, they answer it clearly, concisely. Their concern is solely for the victim. So they don't say anything, they don't blame the victim, right? Well, he was, he was jumping on the bed as he always does and he fell and he hit his head. That is a red flag. That is a mother who is calling probably because she hit her son on the head. So there's no victim blaming. And then the updating of facts is actually the sign of an innocent caller. So at first, if at first they say the victim was um, a man and then they get closer and see it was a woman, that's, that's an updating, a correction of a fact. Whereas if someone uh, says something that cannot, for example, like the example I gave earlier, right? Well, my baby was breathing just fine for the last few hours. Well, a phone call woke me up a few minutes ago. That is not a correction of facts. That's a conflicting fact, a sign of a fabricated story. Sign of a guilty caller. Innocent callers also request help for the victim. So they request, we should expect the mechanic to say, Maddie needs your help. Not we need your help. Right? Madeline needs all of our help now because we don't know what's happening to her. But instead, the mechanic say, we need your help. There's a focus on the victim's survival with innocent callers. So innocent callers do not accept that the victim might be dead, which is why it, that's, there's that very famous meme about if someone referring to their kid in the past tense, it means they're guilty. There's a lot of truth to that. Because if you're referring to the child in, their pa in past tense, it means you've basically given up on their survival and you likely know that they are dead. And that goes to the next point. Innocent callers do not accept the victim's death. So in the heat of an emergency, unless someone's decapitated, right, clearly dead, uh, someone in emergency will not accept the victim's death. They don't process it. They're in the state of, of shock, of uh, not shock, of emergency, right? They need to just get this person help. Um, so they don't accept. They're, they're very hopeful about them pulling through. Right now, if they're making the call or making an appeal, it's because they believe the person has a chance of surviving, which is the entire point of the appeal. 
finally, voice modulation. Innocent callers are urgent and may even come off as rude and unlikable. And uh, that's also another counterintuitive way. You'd expect that honest people would be nice and and sweet, but that's not nece- that's not necessarily true. Innocent people aren't lying, so they don't need to persuade you one one way or the other. They don't need you to like them because they're in the heat of an emergency. They are not trying to persuade you that they're good people. They actually don't care if you think they're bad people as long as it helps them find their kid, which is yet again another red flag with the McCanns. Lots of their interviews, they express concern about how people are looking at them and judging them and talking about how Madeline might be dead. And that's, and they express concern about that, right? They get offended by it or want to put injunctions. In reality, if your kid's actually missing, there is a chance that your kid might be dead. And if an investigator is actually exploring that angle or uh, an investigative journalist is exploring it, why would you put an injunction on that? You would actually be not happy about it, but you'd be happy that someone's investigating another angle about your missing kid. Because at the very least, you might get some closure, or at least retrieve her body to give her a, pro- a proper burial. But the McCanns do something totally different, where they, um, they actually shut down any sort of investigation that doesn't follow their narrative of some mysterious third-party person who stole Madeline, yet left the other two kids, and will never be found. And is also a globetrotter, because they've, we've seen them do interviews in Spain, and interviews in Sweden. We, in the last interview we analyzed of them, they were talking about, about uh, they were about to take a trip across Europe, which is strange. Uh, innocent callers also cooperate. So they're more cooperative. If the dispatcher asks them, asks them an embarrassing question, was, was the old man, did he have a heart attack in the bedroom? Were you guys engaged in, in sex at the time? I can't answer that. Well, even if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. That's not how an innocent person acts. An innocent person would be cooperative as humiliating as it is. Yes, I was having sex with the 80-year-old man. It looked like he had a heart attack. He needs help. Send someone now. Right. So they, they are cooperative, even if it embarrasses them, humiliates them, uh, might get them into a little bit of trouble. Well, we are smoking weed, and he started acting weird, and, and he flopped onto the floor. Help. Right. So they're cooperative. And finally, there's no self-interruption. So if they start answering your question, they complete the response. They don't halt themselves or or stutter and try to change the topic. That is a huge red flag. It means they either have an agenda or they're trying to hide something from the dispatcher, which makes no sense because if you're calling 911 or in the McCann's case, if you're doing a press conference to the public, you're doing it because you're trying to elicit help. So you should be uh, direct and not hiding anything. And then on the other end, Guilty callers, or in this case, I think the McCanns are are guilty parents uh, doing a public press conference. There is no request for help for the victim. So the way they phrased it, I believe, was right. We need help in getting Madeline back home. Not Madeline needs our help, and Madeline needs your help in coming back home. Let's listen to that again. So let's listen to both of them again, then we'll go through the guilty checklist. Last night, the family. Also, there are lots of famous cases where it could all boil down to the 911 call. For example, I've had requests to do the staircase. I think that entire case boils down to the 911 call that the guy made about his wife allegedly falling down the stairs. If you run it through this criteria, which which way does his call end up on the checklist? So the staircase is a case where it could all boil down to a 911 call. Uh, lots of missing children's cases do. I don't know who called 911 on behalf of the McCanns. Um, I don't. I couldn't find that call. 
Uh, let's listen to this appeal here. Family emerged to make a brief appeal for help from the public. Mrs. McCann clutched a child's toy while her husband spoke. Words cannot describe the anguish and despair that we are feeling as the parents of our beautiful daughter, Madeline. We request... Words cannot describe the despair we are feeling as the parents of Madeline. Notice how they are the priority. Yes, that anyone who may have any information related to Madeline's disappearance, no matter how trivial, contact the Portuguese police and help us get her back safely. Help us get her back safely. Not help her get home safely. Or help Madeline uh, get back. Help Madeline get back to us. The framing is always on themselves, which is a red flag. Like I said, even something as innocuous as saying, hello, 911, I've got a problem. My son isn't breathing, is a red flag. The other, there's a few more signs. For example, repetition is another sign of a guilty caller, which I call scripting, which we've looked at with the McCann's. Liars tend to repeat things a lot because it's a lot easier to script a lie and then stick to it. And in this study on the 911 calls, there's actually a case of a father saying something along the lines of, my daughter was drinking and then she spat up water and fell on the ground. Or she started throwing up water. Water, water, water. It turned out that uh, the girl was a four-year-old, was adopted, and she took a sip of her sister's drink, right? So the, the, this father's actual daughter, and to punish her, the dad zip-tied her hands behind her back and had her drink something like 64 ounces of water, a big volume of water for such a little kid, and she died of um, of basically too much water in her system, basically death by over drinking water, and uh, that goes to repetition. Water, 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 red flag. If you've seen my videos on the McCanns, you know that they do a lot of repetition, and I think it's because they've scripted their story. Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her. Right, if you have Madeline. Ever since day one with the McCanns, they have only pushed the angle that she was kidnapped. Notice how he doesn't say, for example, right, that, that's fine to say, if you have Madeline, we're willing to, please let her come home, we're willing to pay you, we'll forgive you, that's fine. But they don't even allow for the possibility that maybe she wandered away. For example, if you see Madeline on the street, please call the police. She has a, a eye fleck in her right eye. It's a little black dot. And she was wearing these pajamas. Her hair is auburn colored. You don't see any of that here. And I think even this early on, they scripted their story about the kidnapping. Notice how they don't allow for the possibility that she might have wandered away um, or... Um, anything besides a kidnapping. Her mummy, daddy, brother and sister. We would like and now to we thank have the second everyone group. here in Portugal, the UK. See, this one's a red flag. This is allegedly done on the 6th of May or 5th. Safely. Please, if you have my would like to thank everyone here in Portugal. We would All right, like so to this appeal comes from May 6th. I think that's two, one or two days after Madeline went missing. And he's already thanking everybody. Madeline's not found. So if you were looking at the checklist, how was the call made? Would you check urgently, rudely demanding? Or would you check polite and patient? Well, in this case, they're being too polite 
in two patient. And then also, let's say you went down the voice modulation route. I think lots of you guys will put this in the comments because as much as I don't like body language analysis, lots of you guys drop body language stuff in the comments. So I'm sure there'll be plenty of comments about how the parents are not acting sad enough and uh, their intonation is not strong enough. It's a fine. Also, it is odd that Jerry is doing all the talking. Lots of times in these missing children cases, the mother does the most talking. It's because the mother is, uh, like it or not, the main parent. Of uh, the motherly instinct is much is the strongest thing in the world. So, it is strange that Kate is not doing the talking. And I think, um, if you don't know my full theory, I believe that the McCanns oversedated Maddie by accident. I think Kate administered the lethal sedative. And then Jerry took control of the situation, scripted the alibi, put Madeline somewhere cold and dark, maybe a well, maybe a cavern, maybe the ocean inside a suitcase or a, a compartment. But I think it was Kate who administered the sedative. One reason for that is you see that Jerry does most of the talking. He has most of the composure. Kate is much more distraught, I think, because she is actually the guilty party. She's the one who made the mistake. And now Jerry is doing everything he can to save her and the remaining family members, or the twins, to keep their family unit together. I also think Kate is the guilty one because if it were the other way around, if Jerry had administered the sedative that killed Madeline, I think Kate would have turned on him. Just That's just the way motherly instinct goes. She would put her kids above anyone, even her husband. So that's why I think it has to be that way. It has to be Kate who did it. And Jerry is defending her and the rest of the kids by making sure they effectively get away with any crime they committed. Because they might go to jail for negligence if it's found that they oversedated her and then the, the twins would be taken away into foster care. So I think that's why Jerry's doing most of the talking here, which is unusual. Typically, it's the mother. In both of these early pressers, we see that Jerry is the only one talking, and he's reading off a script. And I think that's because he is a little bit more composed because he's in fight or flight mode, and he switched into fight mode. He scripted the story, and he's doing whatever he can now to protect the family, whereas Kate is still... And also, Kate stopped practicing medicine, which to me is another indicator that she no longer trusts herself because she administered the lethal dose. So Jerry, in this second presser, is still doing all the talking, which is a red flag. Typically, it's the mother in these situations. And he's thanking the police too early. They haven't found Madeline yet. They don't even have a suspect yet. But yet he's thanking them. Really, deep down, he might be thanking them because he's thankful they didn't capture him. He has a lot to be grateful for, the fact that they didn't pursue him as strongly as they Everyone should Everyone here in Portugal, the UK, daddy, brother and sister. So we would like to appeal. thank everyone here in Portugal, the UK and elsewhere for all your support during this extremely, extremely difficult time for our family. For our family. Once again, not for Madeline. So if we run this through the checklist, there's no urgent demanding. The focus is not on the victim. There's no concern for the victim. And there's actually no request for help for the victim in this second one. He's, he's thanking them like, like the search is over, like they've actually, um, like it's case closed, which is not the case at all. So he's polite and patient. No request. He's, he's, Thanking people. We are pleased that the family liaison officers from Leicestershire are now working closely with the Portuguese police. They're pleased. There's nothing to be pleased about. If it were my kid, I'd be saying, You still haven't found my kid. What are we doing here? Go find my kid. Instead, they're over here having, uh, they're popping the champagne. Peace and in keeping us informed 
We have no further information regarding the investigation. And then once again, no further information. No relevant information. But appreciate the significant efforts everyone is making on our behalf. Right? They appreciate, so they appreciate everyone in Portugal. Well, isn't one person in Portugal the kidnapper, according to their story? How are they thanking everyone in Portugal? So they're thanking everyone in Portugal. They're thanking the people in the, U the UK police, the Portuguese police. It's a whole little litany of people they're thanking, and Madeline still isn't here yet. It's too early for this. We have no further information regarding the investigation. And once again, they're, they have the media's attention here. What do they do? They focus on ingratiation, ingratiating themselves with the locals and with the police, rather than describing Madeline, rather than making another plea to the kidnapper. You, and I know some of you guys think, well, you're looking way too deep into this. Right, DD, you're clutching at straws. No, this is a routine analysis. These are not advanced liars. This is literally if you had run, if anyone had run this checklist on them, the the red flags are all over the place with this case. Even if this were the only thing I had seen of the McCanns, it would be a red flag to me. That's my point. That that uh, the McCanns are. Um, for example, I see lots of conspiracy theories in the comments. You know, the, the McCanns have friends in high places. That's why they get away with it. I don't think it's necessarily that nefarious. I think the people who want to believe the conspiracy theories aren't too different from the people who think they're innocent. In reality, no one wants to believe that two doctors killed their kid. You don't want to believe it. So part of the people just don't believe it and say they're innocent and they ignore the red flags. And then the other part of people don't want them to just be two normal doctors. They want them to be villains, right? Well, they did nasty stuff to Madeline. I haven't seen any evidence of that besides um, maybe being a little bit too lax with medication with her. It seems like they routinely sedated her, which is odd, which is bad. But it doesn't, it's not a villain, right? So some people... Just say, hey, you're looking too deep into this. They're innocent. She was kidnapped. And the same type of people, but on the other side, want it to be want them to be evil, nefarious villains, right? They did nasty stuff to Madeline. They sold her into slavery. It, I, I don't see any of that. I just see two parents who were too lax with uh, administering a sedative to their daughter. And then in their mind, in their mind, right? I'm not saying I think this is what I would do or even a good thing to do. But in their mind, they had to make a decision. Do we come forward and admit we screwed up and lose both of our medical licenses and potentially be locked up in a Portuguese prison for manslaughter and let our twins go into foster care. That's one option. Or do we lie? Do we hide the body and keep our family unit together and, and look at the silver lining that Madeline's death was not in vain? We will spend the rest of our lives raising awareness about missing children. Yes, yes, you know, that's what we'll do. And we'll take any money we make and put the twins through college. Okay. Yeah. That's what we'll do. Uh, and basically convince, you know, and stick together as a family unit. And we will take this lie to our graves. I think that's just what happened. I don't think there's some evil caricature, super villains who did all this nasty stuff to Madeline, nor do I think they're innocent. I think they're two relatively normal people who were put in a tragic, scary situation and were put into fight or flight mode and decided to lie rather than come clean. And now they're dealing with that. And I see lots of comments asking, well, do you think we'll get a deathbed confession from them? 
No, I don't think we will ever get a deathbed confession from them because confessing on their deathbed will only put the twins into trouble, right? People will be pestering the twins. Did you know your parents were killers? Right? So the fallout can only hurt the twins. So I don't think there will be any deathbed confession. I think if people had been objective and run the McCanns through the checklist, the red flags were there. I think any FBI analyst uh, would have seen the signs, but the FBI was not involved in this case, obviously. So what you had were people who did not want to believe that these two seemingly normal parents killed their daughter. It's a lot easier to just tell yourself, well, she was kidnapped and she'll be found. Because at least that way, the story has a happy ending. From all the analysis I've done on McCann's, there is no happy ending. It's just, that's life. Will we ever find her body? Probably not. At this point. But appreciate the significant efforts everyone is making on our behalf. Right. The significant efforts everyone is making on our behalf. They are the focus. The focus is not Madeline. They should be saying on Madeline's behalf. And they should be saying her name. I don't know if they said her name once in this second presser. You know, I thank you for everyone who's out there looking for Madeline. There's a fleck in her eye. If you see that fleck, please call the Portuguese, Portuguese police. Call us. If you have her, please just drop her off at the nearest police station. We won't ask any questions. We won't pursue you. Um, we'll pay you. Just let us know what you want. We would again like to appeal for any. Also, if you don't give her back, please don't hurt her. All right. Total priority for the victim. Information, however small, that may lead to the safe return of Madeline. That may, so he finally said her name right at the end there. That may lead to the safe return of Madeline. Overall, I think, like I said, I'm shoehorning this analysis into this video, but I think this will be a benchmark video for future ones where we actually analyze 911 calls because now you'll have the tools. If you're a member, I'll continue adding extra uh, materials here in the member section for you. If you're not a member yet, please consider joining. All you have to do is just hit the join button on my YouTube page. And you can sign up as a member and join in the live chats during the premieres. You get extra content. Um, and you can also use fun, cool emojis, which I've created for the channel, uh, in the live chat or in the comments. And also get a little Deception Detective badge, basically progressing from a little baby, uh, fresh face Deception Detective to getting the beard, to getting the glasses and the beard. Well, actually, you start off baby-faced with the hat, then you get the hat and beard. Hat, beard, glasses, hat, beard, glasses, headphones. Then you get the mic, and then you turn golden, and, and it's just fun. So if you want to participate in that, please consider becoming a member. And you can also download this checklist for future videos. Let me know if there's any good 901 call cases you want me to analyze. We could add that to a series. I'm also continuing the Amanda Knox series, so make sure to subscribe if you want to get notifications when I add the next section to that. And of course, the McCann series is, is ongoing. This is one of my favorite series just because there's so many lessons to teach in this situation. So what can we learn by comparing the McCanns and other parents of missing children? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, we're going to analyze a statement Madeline McCann's parents made um, just a few days after she went missing. So this statement was made on May 14th, 2007. She went missing on May 3rd, 2007. We're going to analyze that, and then we're going to compare it to statements made by two other sets of parents whose children went missing. And by comparing them, spot the differences and see what we can glean from that. Good morning. 
Kate and I would like to make a short statement regarding three main issues. We'd like to talk about the offers of support that we've had over the last few days, the role of the International Family Law Group who were here over the weekend, and three, we'd like to talk about how we'd like to communicate with the media. We will take two or three very short questions at the end of the statement, but as you all understand, we cannot talk about the investigation. And I hope you understand that there are certain things that we are just not ready to talk about at this time. First of all, you know that we've taken tremendous strength from the warmth and the um, spiritual outpouring which we've received here and from all, all around the world. The first thing here about this statement is it looks almost like a political statement. It looks almost like a politician who's had a scandal and he's standing there with his wife confronting the media because he knows he has to talk about it. Unlike what you would expect in this situation, which is a plea for help and which we will see in the upcoming videos. And I'm not going to tell you yet whether or not these parents are guilty or not. The children are both missing. Both have been found. But I think it'll be more interesting for the analysis if I don't reveal if the parents were ultimately responsible until we've done the analysis, just so you can analyze it for yourself as we watch and spot the differences. Remember, again, these are the McCanns giving us a, a press conference um, like 10 or 11 days, 14th of May, she went missing on the 3rd, so about 10 or 11 days um, after Madeline went missing, depending if you count it from midnight or wherever the, the exact time she allegedly was kidnapped. And that has given us great encouragement and hope that we will bring back Madeline safely. More recently, there have been multiple offers of different forms of help, including many financial pledges of people wishing to help Madeline. We warmly welcome these offers, but this created a problem for us and that how we were going to deal with it. We have brought in our lawyers to help us decide how to best use these offers of support to help us find Madeline. Since the lawyers have come here, we have visibly felt a burden being lifted from our shoulders because it's one less thing that we do not have to immediately think about and how we can coordinate them. This has allowed us to concentrate more in our, on our own physical and mental well-being. Lots of this statement is about the parents themselves, which we might not expect when their child is missing. You would expect typically lots of any attention they get or press to be about Madeline. For example, holding up a picture of Madeline, describing Madeline, eliciting sympathy for Madeline. However, by this point, if the media had been attacking them, so for example, suggesting that they were suspects and publishing a bunch of articles about them, then this dis defensive posturing is a little bit more understandable. So I'm not going to jump to any conclusions here and say that this is a total fail because we've analyzed their very first press conferences that they made like a day or two uh, the very next day after Madeline went missing um, in my video, How to Analyze an Emergency. And those were a little bit better than this, but they were still fails. So let's keep watching this, then we'll compare this to the other two parents so we can spot some differences. And as you know, if you've binged on my videos or if you've been on my channel for a while, I don't analyze body language. I think body language is, there might be some benefits to it, but the benefits aren't worth the risk. I think the risk of body language is just too high. It's too subjective. It's not how we evolve to communicate. It's not how we evolve to deceive. We evolve to deceive with our words. And that's why you are able to spot lies through language, because the brain has to perform a lot of functions 
when it's trying to mask the truth, fabricate a lie, build the lie in short-term memory, store it in long-term memory so it can be retrieved, retrieved later so that you don't contradict yourself in a future interview. And it requires a ton of imagination. You have to be thinking in four dimensions to put yourself in the place of position of a kidnapped kid if you are not, uh, the position of a parent of a kidnapped kid if that's not what you are. And I recently posted on X um, a great example of how hard it is to lie with your words and fabricate a story is plot holes in movies. Movies have huge budgets. They have a virtually, blockbusters have virtually unlimited budgets, unlimited time. They have multiple professional storytellers and script supervisors, and still they cannot fabricate an airtight story, an airtight fabricated story. So parents who accidentally killed their child, like I think the McCanns are, I think they accidentally killed Madeline, and then they covered it up with this kidnapping story to protect themselves and their twins, have a very small chance of actually fabricating a perfect uh, cover-up. Same with the Ramses, John Benet's parents. All that is to say, we're not going to analyze body language because body language is a lot easier to fake. It's easier to fake tears. It's easier to fake a cracked voice and, you know, furrow your brows or I don't know what body, body language people do. I've seen a couple of videos. They're like He's looking over here, so he's lying, or they're looking over there, so they're like, it's too easy to fake. It misleads you too much. So we're going to focus on the words and where the words don't add up and where the words in a particular context don't add up. For example, contextually, this seems weird when their child was allegedly abducted 10 days ago and they're giving a very defensive almost political um, talk to the press. It's almost like they're celebrities meeting the paparazzi and they're setting the agenda. Here's what we will and will not talk about. However, if the press at this point, this early on, was attacking them as potentially killing their daughter, then it's understandable. We do need to spend more time at this point considering ourselves our family with Sean and Amelie and contemplating about the situation that we were in. I think that might be a little bit of leakage. We need to think about ourselves, our family. And when he says family, he elaborates that the family only includes the twins, Sean and Emily. Why is Madeline not included in the family? For example, we need to think about ourselves Sean and Emily, and of course, most of all, we should all be thinking about Madeline. That's what you would expect. So the fact that Madeline isn't included in the breakdown of the family could be a little bit of leakage that they already know she's dead, or that they think she's dead. Now, does this mean they know she's dead, or does this mean they killed her? Of course not. And since I have so many new subscribers, and thank you everyone who has subscribed in the past few weeks, um, these videos are doing very well. This series is doing very well. But because I have so many new subscribers, I'm trying to reiterate some of the caveats that those of you who have been around for a while might already know. So one of those caveats is we need to find multiple signs of deception before we conclude that someone is being deceptive. So if I point out a sign of deception, that does not necessarily mean that I think the speaker is lying. I'm simply pointing it out so that if we see more signs of it as we go on, we can all agree that we feel more confident accusing the person of being a liar. The analogy I give is the poker chips. If I point out one sign of deception, I'm stacking one chip. If I point out two or three, maybe I'll stack up a couple more chips. And once I feel confident, I'll go all in and say this person's a liar. In the case of the McCanns, we're already about 10 videos into the McCann's now. Uh, I think this is the 10th McCann's video. And by now, you can watch all of them here on my DD vs. McCann's playlist. I'm fairly confident in my theory that they accidentally, that Kate specifically accidentally killed Madeline. And then Jerry took charge. They created, they fabricated this story of the kidnapper. 
And then they've been sticking to that story ever since, not just to save themselves, but also the way they rationalize it is to protect the twins. Concentrate more in our, on our own physical and mental well-being. We do need to spend more time at this point considering ourselves, our family with Sean and Amelie, and contemplating about the situation that Okay, so we need to think more about ourselves and Sean and Emily. I think this is a little bit of leakage that they know Madeline is beyond the need for contemplation or worrying. Now they need to think about themselves. And this might actually be them setting, up, setting the table to use some of those funds for themselves, for our mental, mental health. Basically, this speech looks pretty coached. I think by this point, I, he even said they have counsel. So their counsel's probably setting the stage for them. They probably helped them script this speech in order to set the table that, that so there won't be a scandal when it's revealed that lots of the funds provided to find Madeline were used on the family themselves. And they're already setting the table that we need it for our mental health, our physical health. So if we fly first class to Sweden to do a talk show, to raise awareness about Madeline, well, that's our physical health. Or if they put the kids into a private school, or I think in the UK it would be called a public school, right? It's the inverse. Um, that, you know, we're looking out for the rest of our family. This is for their mental health. They've suffered a trauma because of their sister. Overall, this looks like a very political, scripted speech within 10 days of Madeline going missing. Not we were in. We do, of course, wish to keep communicating with the media. I mean the other thing here is if you've seen my uh, John Benet Ramsey videos, I've started a playlist about John Benet Ramsey. Her parents early on offered a reward, a $100,000 reward, for any information that led to the arrest of the person who allegedly killed their daughter, right, who allegedly kidnapped and killed their daughter. But we don't see a reward offered here. And we didn't see a reward offered in the early uh, pressers that the McCanns did, which we analyzed in my last McCanns video, How to Analyze an Emergency. So that is a slight bit of red flag, especially when funds are being provided now. You would expect desperate, distraught parents who think someone has kidnapped their kid to at least offer a reward for tips or to the kidnapper themselves. And we actually see that in one of the interview in one of the uh, other sets of parents we're going to analyze next. And we would like to thank you all publicly for the excellent job you have done to keep Madeline's profile so high. We believe and have been advised that this is essential in the search for her. Okay. So that was the McCann's doing a presser about 10 days after Madeline went missing. These ones, I think, are a little bit closer to the fact we're going to start off with the parents of a boy, a uh, little boy who went missing, and look at their first presser that they did. It's unlike our son to wander off of our property. And if he did, he would always have our dog with him. Chase has vanished without a trace. We are looking for answers. All right, so their little boy went missing. As they say, vanished without a, tra a trace. Notice this: the difference between this and the McCanns. Ever since day one, the McCanns have insisted that Madeline was kidnapped. And the conclusiveness of that assertion to me is a red flag of a hoax. It's the red flag of a cover-up. And the Ramses, who I think actually covered up the death of their daughter, even went as far as writing a fake ransom note, in my opinion, a forged ransom note to set up their alibi even further. So the big green flag here is that they are not conclusive about what happened to their son. All they're saying is he's vanished. 
And if they provide other theories later, that is fine because at least they've established that they don't know what happened. The McCann since day one were resolute that, that Madeline had been kidnapped. That was a red flag. For any information that can help bring us, bring our son home, we are overwhelmed with the support we have and how the community has come together to help us and find Chase. Anyone with information, please find it in your hearts to do the right thing and come forward. Any information is helpful. If someone has our son, please bring him home. So this is something the McCanns also failed to do in their early pressers, where you, if you actually think your kid is kidnapped, you speak directly to the kidnapper and plead for them to return your kid. And that's what the father is doing here. We won't be angry. So let's listen Any again. Fine, Chase. Also remember, I haven't said yet whether or not these parents are responsible. So a good practice is do not be swayed by the body language. Just listen to the words, which is hard to do, I'm aware. That's one reason I go into everything telling myself I'm going to ignore the body language because I'm human too. I can be swayed by it. A crying mother can definitely sway me. The father, the voice cracking can obviously sway me. But you get more things right. You make fewer mistakes if you can block that out and just listen to the words. Anyone with information, please find it in your hearts to do the right thing and come forward. Any information is helpful. If someone has our son, please bring him home. We won't be angry. We will be forgiving and grateful. We are just devastated to have our son taken from us. Now the RCMP continue to. Okay, so notice what they did there. They spoke directly. First of all, they did not. They were not conclusive that their son was kidnapped. They said he vanished. He could have wandered off. He could have been kidnapped. He could be playing hide and seek, and be hiding under the floorboards. Or a dingo could have taken him. Like it happened in Australia, an example I love to use because it just shows that anything is possible. Unless you have concrete evidence that the kid was kidnapped, as a parent, it's actually the last thing you want to believe happened. Out of all the possibilities, that's the last one you want to consider. You might not even be able to accept it even if there is evidence that your kid was kidnapped. You would rather not believe it. So the fact that the McCanns jumped to kidnapping is was a red flag for me from day one. So these parents say that their son was vanished, so all options are open. But in, just in case a kidnapper has their son, they spoke directly to the kidnapper and pleaded with the kidnapper, please just return our son. We won't be angry. We'll just be grateful. We won't pursue you. And in my other McCann's video where I actually analyzed their very early pressers, I said that it was strange they did not say basically what this father said here exactly. So I'll reveal what happened, what the full story is here with these parents after we analyze the next video. But for now, just notice the green flags, the correct things they did. Also, did, even though the father here had a script he was reading from, that does not mean that this was um, nefarious. Lots of times, if you're emotional, uh, it's actually good to have the points you want to cover. And the points they did cover were good ones. So I don't fault people for having a script. I don't fault them for lawyer lawyering up. Um, these are all just good practices to do, whether you're innocent or guilty. If you want to get your message across about your little boy, it might be a smart idea to script it out to make sure you don't miss anything. All right, here's the next one. 
Now we have a mother talking about um, another missing boy, 11 year old. Hyatt Gannon's mom. And also, just as a note, this audio on this one was recorded in mono. So you might not hear it in your left headphone or your left speaker in case you're only using one headphone. Just be aware of that if you don't hear the video playing, you might need to use your other headphone. I don't know why they do that, but that's just that's just the way this is. And I encourage you guys, I know many of you mothers and fathers, I encourage you just to seek, find him. I'm so thankful for all the outpouring help that this case has brought. My son is a very loving kid. He wouldn't want harm on anybody at all. And it's so hard to just think, why is this happening to him? I have no clue, but my kid deserves to come home. My kid has a purpose. My kid has a life. And it's important to me, and it's important to everybody to stand. First of all, you'll notice we're going to ignore the emotions. Notice the persuasion in the mother. She is begging the audience to feel some sort of attachment to her kid. His life is important to me. And it's important to you. This is how you plead for help. This is the point of a press conference. To plead, to beg for help. To find your kid. Whereas in this McCann's video we just watched, what was the point of it? It certainly wasn't Madeline. It almost seemed like CYA, like cover your ass. They were basically talking about receiving funds and then talking about how they needed to focus on themselves and like I suspect laying the groundwork for spending those funds on themselves whether that's right or wrong personally I think it's wrong I, I would have taken those funds and offered it as a bounty to, for any information so notice the difference where the McCann's have attention from the press and seem to be squandering it. And they even squandered their early pressers, which we analyzed in, in my other video. So here, 10 days later, they still seem to be wasting press attention. Whereas Gannon's mother is using this press platform to beg, literally try to get people to feel some connection to her son. Right? You don't see her saying, well, we can't discuss this case. Are there certain details I just won't tell you, which the McCanns did even 24 hours after Madeline went missing. And then they did again in this interview 10 days later. Standing in this room, Gannon, Bubba, little man, mommy's hero, wherever you're at. Here's another thing Gannon's mother is doing. She's speaking directly to Gannon. And I support it. And that's something I said when we analyzed the McCann's first presser, and even this one, 10 days later, they continue to fail to do, is looking into the camera and basically talking to their missing kid. You know, we love you. We're going to find you. I promise. Just stay tight. You know, hang tight. Behave. Uh, you know, so they don't get hurt or get into more trouble. And we're going to find you. Now, is she looking directly into the camera? We're looking through, no, right? If you're watching the video, she's looking directly ahead. She's probably looking into another camera, though. Report it to everybody that's standing in this room. Gannon, Bubba, little man, mommy's hero, wherever you're at, mommy and daddy's here. We're begging and pleading for you to come home. I know that's your biggest wish. Was to see mommy and daddy standing here. We're here, Bubba. We're here for you. And I can't wait till you're found. Because I have hope that you are going to be found. Also, notice how she says found. Why the word found? Because her kid is missing. She's not sure what happened to Gannon. He might have been kidnapped. He might have wandered off. He might be, like I said, playing, playing hide and seek. A dingo might have dragged him away. But found is the appropriate word because she does not know what happened. Unlike um, words like returned, which implies that someone, that you know someone took your kid. 
Well, if that's not in evidence, if there's no concrete evidence that your kid was kidnapped, the word returned is an odd one to choose. It implies that you know what happened when there's no evidence to, to prove that, which is a sign of deception. Or even worse, it implies that you're trying to push a narrative that your kid was kidnapped because that's your alibi. That's your cover-up story. So found is actually a great uh, word choice here. You are my hero. You are the reason why I have life. He's so special to me. I don't think many people can understand. My child was a one pound, six ounce baby. Notice how she she's talking about Gannon the day he was born. Why is she doing this? Well, it's kind of like what they tell you if someone's a, a kidnapper has you. You tell them your name because they develop a bond with you. And it's harder to kill you. Right? That's the old saying. So it's persuasion. This mother is trying to persuade everyone to care about her little boy, Gannon. So she's painting him as a baby because that's probably, she understands. If you picture him as a baby, your instinct to protect him goes up even further. This, this means she's innocent, not necessarily, right? A psychopath could do this. A psychopath knows how people work. They know how to manipulate. A psychopath would definitely think of doing that and also putting on fake tears, which is why I ignore body language. He had a 10% chance of survival. If he survived, he would be profoundly disabled. None of that is accurate. He's gifted and talented. Do anything for anybody. So I'm begging, I'm pleading, if anybody has any type of lead, put yourself in my situation. Ask yourself, what would you do? My Savior is a great Savior. And I know I have hope and that my son's going to be here. Notice the hope, reiteration of hope that he'll be found. One thing we like to look for in uh, emergency situations is the, especially missing children or, you know, someone who's uh, doing a 911 call to prove that they're not the one who committed the crime they're calling about, is the non-acceptance of death. So once the parents accept the possibility of death of their kid, it is a an actual red flag. Because parents who don't know what happened to their kid 30, 40 years later still have hope that the kid is out there alive. It's a very common phenomenon, the non-acceptance of death. So, for example, if you have a parent who calls 911 and says, my kid is on the ground. You know, I walked in my kid's room. He's not moving. And uh, the dispatcher says, you know, go over, take take his pulse. What's his pulse? And they say, well, he has no pulse. So send someone over here now to help. Right? If there's no pulse, the kid is already dead. It's very obvious. Right? Or he's bl he, there's blood all over the place. I don't have a pulse. Send uh, the ambulance now. If you're logical, you understand that the, your kid is dead. There's no pulse. They bled out. It's over. But parents in an emergency situation do not accept the possibility of death. And this is not just something a psychologist sat down one day and said, okay, yeah, parents shouldn't accept death. Right? This is uh, over the course of hundreds of 911 calls in emergency situations. This is consistent, right? So chances are, if a parent is accepting death, it's more likely that they are guilty or that they know the kid is actually dead. I'm thankful for the churches, the pastors, the outpouring support from this community, from Albert's military, family, everybody, the detectives. I had, it was you that was sitting at the table and you told me that 90% success rate. And you told me that I'm going to find Gannon. I believe. So look at her. Now she's calling out one investigator or one detective and saying, you told me you were going to find my boy, right? You told me 90% success rate. That sounds like a mother who is actually going through it and actually having an emergency. And 
She is willing to be rude. She's willing to be primal. She's willing to be manipulative. Anything possible to get her son back. Could a psychopath do this? Yes. That's the scary thing about psychopaths. And I think Casey Anthony is a psychopath. And if you haven't seen my video on her, you'll see the difference between the, the lies she tells and the way that, um, for example, the McCann's lie or the way that the Ramsey's lie. I had, it was you that was sitting at the table and you told me that 90% success rate and you told me that I'm going to find Gannon. I believe that. It's the first time I had hope since I got that call on Monday. I have hope. So please have hope with me. I'm begging. Bring my baby home. Bubba, I love you. Mommy loves you so much. Nova loves you. Lena loves you. This room is filled with people that love you, and this community loves you too. So please come home, baby. Please come home. <sighs> Yeah, I'd like to reiterate what Landon said that um, well, 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 what an incredible community we have. I mean, everybody in here and, and a team, incredible team that um, I, yeah, I came out my front door, I think it was Tuesday, and there was 300 people out there searching my neighborhood. It blew, blew me away. So, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> The other difference between these people and the McCanns in their early press release, here they're thanking people for caring, being interested, searching, and they're crying and you know, trying still trying to build that rapport with them and even bullying, as you saw the mother, right, holding him accountable. One particular guy, you said you'd find my son. Which is different than the McCanns when Two days after Madeline was missing, they were already thanking people like the case was over, right? Thank you to the sheriffs. Thank you to um, the liaison from the UK for flying in like it was an award ceremony. These people are thanking them in a way that's almost like they're trying to manipulate them into continuing their search. Again, and daddy loves you so much. And once again, talking directly to their son through the presser. Did the McCanns do this even 10 days later? No. Please come home. I'm Landon. All right, so what is the reality between both of these stories? The first one, the parents standing in the field. This have one. a dog with him. Chase has... These are the parents of Chase Martins, who went missing in Canada. And they found his body in a creek, not far from the house, with no signs of foul play. So basically, the, the two-year-old, uh, a very sad story, right, wandered off and drowned in a creek near the house. So it, it's a genuine tragedy. Uh, he wandered off, no kidnapping, no foul play. The parents emotions were real and that was reflected in the desperacy of their plea and also the non-conclusiveness of their plea. They didn't say whether he was kidnapped or wandered off or taken by a dingo because they simply don't know and that's what you would expect. If the parents don't know, all options are open because they want every avenue explored, which is dissimilar from the McCanns who wanted Everything narrowed down to a stranger kidnapping, and no other avenues were open to them, even down from the words they chose in their first press release. 
And you can see their narrative building that early on in the fact that they did not accuse any of, accuse any of their friends of doing it. Whereas if someone kidnapped your daughter, you have no clue who did it, right? So why would you not accuse the friends? Um, you know, maybe one of them has a, some skeletons in their closet, some sick perversions that you didn't know about. And they also absolved the hotel in another interview, which was very bizarre. So here with Chase Barnes, the parents keep all options open. They offered uh, a plea directly to any potential kidnappers, but they used the word um, vanished or something like that, right? Their, their child vanished, which was appropriate. So that's just a sad story. Uh, the child wandered off into the creek. All right, the second ones. These are the parents of Gannon Stouch, 11-year-old boy. Gannon Stouch was actually uh, kidnapped and murdered by his uh, and murdered by his stepmother. And the reason they think is because uh, that uh, that um, the stepmother didn't he didn't like the stepmother as much as his actual mother. Right, this woman giving the speech here is his actual biological mother. So Gannon was kidnapped by his stepmother and killed, and she is now serving life in prison. So the tears here are genuine. But whether you were able to tell they're genuine or not doesn't matter because I was ignoring them, and you should have been ignoring them too. What we listened for were the words. And they, the level of manipulation in the words and bullying and pestering and ingratiation in thinking were all actually geared towards bullying people, manipulating them, convincing them to search for their son, which was appropriate. Unlike the McCanns, who were not open with all possibilities, wanted to restrict the conversation to a kidnapping and when it came down to ingratiation, the ingratiation was about getting people to like them. Do you think this mother cares if anyone in that room likes her? I barely know anything about her. But I do know a lot about Gannon. I know that he was a, a preemie baby, right? He was premature. He survived the odds. Maybe he survived the odds again. Maybe if I live in that neighborhood, I'll, when I'm walking my dog, I'll I'll check. I'll go a little bit deeper into the woods and see if I can see if I can help. Maybe I'll do a little search on my own because this mother convinced me that this kid might survive the odds, right? So all their ingratiation is in order to benefit their son, not to get you to like them personally, and that's a huge point. So manipulation, ingratiation, bullying, pestering, all those things can be signs of deception if someone is doing them to get you to like them. Because if they have a missing child, getting you to like them is unnecessary. Right? That might actually imply guilt, that they want you to like them so that you don't point the finger at them and suspect them. These parents, especially the mother, is called out one guy, is trying to build up rapport between her son, not herself, and the audience. And seems to be doing everything in her power to get people to care about her son. So it's the same tactics a psychopath might use, except a psychopath would use those tactics to get you to like them. Whereas she's doing all these things to get you to care about her son. So I hope that distinction makes sense. And is also why statement analysis is one of the tools we use, but the other tool we use in deception detection here on the channel is context as well. So some things people might say indicate deception, right? That they're lying. But then we have to figure out why are they lying? Are they lying to hide something? Or um, are they lying to protect someone else? Are they lying because they don't trust me? So there's more layers to just knowing whether or not someone's lying. And contextually, right? Or, or even, uh, Manipulation tactics. If someone's using manipulation 
Is it necessarily because they're trying to harm me? No. Here, the mother's doing a ton of manipulation tactics, but it's all to try to compel me to search for her son, which is a sign of an innocent mother, right? The urgency you'd expect from a mother who's doing everything she can to get me to care about her son. So let me know if these uh, comparisons helped. I'm going to do more McCann's videos over the next week because uh, Madeline McCann is winning the community poll right now. Um, I think the case is fascinating because it's um, the, the McCanns are not particularly sophisticated liars. So there's lots of lessons to be learned when we analyze them. Um, and then um, Jumpin' A. Ramsey is in second place. So if you haven't seen that series, it's a new one. I've done two videos on her so far. Uh, please do check them out. My most recent JonBenet Ramsey video, uh, which is titled How to Analyze a Kidnapping. Why do good detectives fumble easy cases? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, we're going to analyze why the McCann case got derailed so early on. And this seems to be a theme that crosses lots of my recent series. For example, the Ramseys had a seemingly good detective from the Colorado PD who just couldn't close what appears to me to be a very simple case of murder from within the family, in my opinion. Also in my Amanda Knox series, it looks like the police had the right uh, suspicion early on in the case, and then they seemed to bungle all the evidence and all the leads. And similar to the McCanns, if you've been following my McCann series, it looked like the Portuguese police were on the right track in suspecting Kate and Jerry McCann of killing their daughter, but very quickly they were dropped as suspects by the Portuguese police. So in today's video, we're going to analyze why I think this happened in the McCann's case, and I think it's a fascinating reason and a reason that we need to be on the lookout for more and more in the age of social media. Basically, in the age of people having bigger platforms than other people. And better ability to censor other people. But just quickly to touch on these two since I mentioned them. I think in the Amanda Knox case, it just boiled down to Italian Carabinieri being better police than the people who came in after them. Um, such as the Italian CSI investigators who were there to collect the evidence. So in the case of Amanda Knox, I think it just boiled down to incompetence on um, within their, their version of CSI, right? Their crime scene investigators, the people who were responsible for collecting all the forensic evidence in that case. I think they bungled the case, and I think the Italian Car Carabinieri did a great job. In the case of the Ramses, I think it may have boiled down to just the power of money, the power of John Ramsey to influence the narrative by A, getting very, very good, experienced attorneys who correctly told him and his wife not to talk to the police early on in the investigation. And I think even now, the Ramseys actually, or John, because um, Patsy's dead, continue to conduct a PR campaign. On my Ramsey videos, I get comments of people dogmatically declaring their innocence that appear to me to be bots. It's almost like a paid bot farm campaign to comment on every single Ramsey's video. So if you want to see examples of what I think are PR uh, bots, look at the comments on my Ramsey videos, particularly the ones that are extremely dogmatic about the Ramsey's innocence. It's bizarre because the points they raise aren't necessarily points I even mention in the video. Okay, so regarding the McCanns, 
what is my theory about the McCanns? Why were the Portuguese police focused on Kate and Jerry McCann as the prime suspects, which was accurate because even the McCanns themselves say that 99% of the time, if a child dies, the parents are responsible. Or if a child goes missing, the parents are responsible. These statistics are well known. So why do the Portuguese police who had the prime suspects in their sights, also prime suspects who are not particularly good at lying, if you've seen my McCann series, you know that the McCanns, in my opinion, are not psychopaths. They do not possess the skills of psychopathic liars. They actually have a ton of leakage. They have a ton of repetition, which is a sign of an amateur liar, the sign that a liar has scripted their story because they know they cannot improv on the spot and fabricate on the spot, unlike someone like Casey Anthony, who, who is actually a sophisticated liar and a psychopath, in my opinion. So they had clear suspects. These suspects were not particularly sophisticated in order to pull off a hoax, a cover-up crime. Yet the, Carib uh, the Portuguese police shifted all of a sudden their focus from the McCanns to the narrative that the McCanns themselves were pushing of a stranger kidnapper. And I think that is another fascinating aspect of the case. The quick uh, switch between being totally on track to being totally off track from the Portuguese police. And one of the uh, suspicions in my comments that I get a lot is because um, Jerry is a Freemason. So somehow because Jerry is part of... Uh, the Freemasons, the, these puppet masters were pulling the strings over in Portugal and the UK and all around the world, puppeteering everybody to get Jerry off the hook, even though they knew that he was responsible for his daughter's death. So tons of these Freemason conspiracy posts. Ever since day one, the Freemason thing is just a non entity to me. There are much more reasonable, still fascinating, but reasonable explanations why good investigators, good detectives, good police will bungle a case like the Portuguese police did. Also, I posted this on X. If you don't follow me there, I post some extra comments and thoughts there and hot takes. I just want to show you this video of an actual Freemason initiation ceremony. I'll show you, you know, a couple seconds of it, maybe a minute of it. And let me know if you think that these people are global puppet masters. Okay, this is a Freemason initiation ceremony. Do these look like global puppet masters to you? <laughs> and if you're listening on podcast mode, this is looks like the rec room in a local church, almost like a little government building, stark walls, a bunch of middle-aged guys standing around in what looks like uh, ceremonial Halloween costumes. Grand Master Iravet, I'm glad to meet you. Give me the secrets of a master mason, or I will take your life. This is no time and place for the man, no secrets. Talk to, talk, talk to me about time, place, stations, or the completion of the temple. Give me the secrets of a master mason, or I will take your life. We have behooved you in this rude and violent manner, and thus to the man, no secrets. So we have one guy talking to a blindfolded guy saying, Give me the secrets of a master mason. This looks totally amateur, totally lame. This does not look like people who can get a man off a crime in another country. I don't think any UK Freemasons and little rec rooms like this are manipulating the Portuguese police. Well, let's just watch a little bit more because this just gets absurd. I think it's interesting and entertaining. Also, I don't have enough enemies, so let's get the Freemasons after me too. When the temple's completed, if found worthy, you'll then receive them lawfully as I have. 
You have passed Jubilee, Jubilee. Me, you cannot pass. My name is Jubilee, well known for my determination of character. What I undertake, as I do. Give me the secrets of a master mason instantly, for I will take your life. I will not. What still persists? Then die. Okay, that's enough of that. All right, so I don't think Jerry being a Freemason, if even if he was, is the reason he got away with um, the reason the Portuguese uh, investigation was derailed. In an earlier video, I theorized that the reason people stopped accusing the parents was because the British... Uh, Basically, British ambassadors, British uh, politicians got involved in the case. So the British uh, Foreign Office, I think, got involved with the case very early on. And I think the British politicians basically did not want to be seen as bad people. They did not want to come off as heartless by accusing the parents of a missing little girl of having killed her themselves because the risk if you are wrong in that situation is very high it's better to stand by them politically because they're getting a lot of attention the the british politicians had to comment on it and if you consider just basic human nature right no nefarious uh, illuminati or freemason stuff just basically if a politician's asked you know, what do you think about the Madeleine McCann case? The politically correct low chance of being pilloried later response is, I think they're innocent and I want to provide as much help as I possibly can. That's, that's just the political, politically correct way to answer the question. Whether or not you think they actually did it. Because if it turns out that the parents did kill their daughter, well, you come off looking like someone who believes in humanity, and you can always just say, well, I was wrong. I can't believe they did that. Low stakes. Whereas if you say you think they killed their daughter and you turn out to be wrong, now you're painted as an evil monster for accusing two innocent parents of killing their daughter. So when you just balance the scales of risk, of course the politicians are going to side on, on the low risk response, which is to support the parents. So I think that is why when the UK got involved, they were pro McCanns. Also the fact that the McCanns are British citizens. So is the UK uh, politicians getting involved in the case supporting the parents enough to derail the Portuguese investigation? Possibly, because Portugal is a much smaller country, less influence. They probably don't want to piss off their liaisons or the British ambassador in Portugal and might uh, be more willing to cooperate or at least pursue other, uh, like a, this stranger kidnapping theory, just to appease the British politicians who got involved in the case. And as I said in previous videos, I think it's, as far as why people were supporting the McCanns early on, it's as simple as that. You don't want to be the bad guy pointing the finger at two parents, accusing them of killing their daughter. And even I get comments, uh, my videos, you know, how you're heartless. How could you accuse these poor parents? Even though I've developed my theory over 10 or 11 videos now, right? Where this is the 11th video I've done on the McCanns. And if you've watched all my videos from the first one uh, to this one, you've seen how I crystallized my theory about them and why I'm so confident, in my opinion, that they did kill their daughter. And if you're new here, my theory basically boils down to this. I think Kate accidentally over-sedated Maddie. Maddie died. Jerry uh, took charge from that point. He, I think he was there when Maddie actually passed away. And then they buried her somewhere cold, deep, and watery, uh, possibly a well, 
possibly the coastline, possibly a cavern, um, something along those lines. And that's all based on their leakage uh, from multiple interviews now that I've analyzed. But what was the deciding factor? Let's say that wasn't enough to get uh, right the head detective on the case off the tr off track. I think this right here, Clarence Mitchell, might be the ultimate deciding factor in dissuading the Portuguese police from pursuing the McCanns. If you've seen this guy speak, he is a powerhouse of persuasion. And not the good type of persuasion uh, where you, um, right, like a salesman persuasion where you're finessing someone or selling them on an idea. He is persuasive in the fact that he is a bully. And we're going to watch a video of him here, um, a short video of him addressing the 48 questions that Kate McCann refused to answer on a British talk show. And I'm going to point out some of the tactics he uses and why I think he is a powerhouse strong enough to dissuade the Portuguese police from pursuing Kate and Jerry McCann the way they should have. So before we get into uh, this interview and the tactics uh, Clarence Mitchell uses to bully, and I think bully in a way that is strong enough to derail an entire investigation, I'm just going to go over who he is um, in case you're not familiar with him. So who is Clarence Mitchell? Clarence Mitchell said he first met the McCanns two weeks after Madeline's disappearance. And he was working as part of, I think, the British Foreign Office. So two weeks after Maddie went missing, Clarence Mitchell got involved in the Madeline's case. And I think that's around the time that everything turned. Clarence Mitchell's job in that capacity was to act as a spokesperson for the McCanns and basically coach them in how to speak to the press, also get involved with the investigation to point investigators to where he wanted them to be looking, and basically bully and cajole, cajole people into not suspecting the McCanns, similar to the way an attorney might, might do except this guy is much more powerful in his persuasion skills than the average attorney. Also, the fact that he was not their legal counsel means that he can act almost as a fixer. He can do things and say things that an attorney just wouldn't be able to do if they, were, if they had to represent the McCanns in court. So um, Clarence Mitchell got involved around two weeks into the case which actually happens to be when uh, the McCanns gave that strange press conference uh, to the uh, press outside where they were staying in Portugal, basically declaring how they were going to spend the funds they received from people supporting them in uh, uh, through the McCann Fund, which I analyzed in my last McCanns video, What Do Innocent Parents Look Like? So he might have been involved in actually one of the coaches who helped them prepare for that very odd presser, which we analyzed, which I said looked almost like um, they were two politicians addressing a scandal where they set the agenda of the press, of the presser, told the press what they would and would not talk about. Basically, I think that might have had the fingerprints of Car uh, Clarence Mitchell on it. All right, so without further ado, Let's listen to how Clarence Mitchell persuades, how he bullies and cajoles on this BBC News clip. Jerry in Port the lawyers act in for Kate and Jerry in Portugal have seen. Also, one last thing about Clarence Mitchell is eventually he was actually hired full time as a spokesperson for the McCanns. So after he represented them as a 
a member of the British Foreign Office in, in an official political capacity. They hired him to continue representing him, representing them. That's how effective he is. So let's listen closely here. He's going to be discussing why Kate did not answer 48 questions uh, when the Portuguese police were interviewing her regarding her missing daughter. Seen this. The, lawyer, the lawyers acting for Kate and Jerry in Portugal have seen this since last Thursday, so they've had a, a slight head start on the media, but not much of one. Uh, they are going to go through it incredibly methodically. They're looking for two areas, really. The first priority is anything in there that could help to find Madeleine. Mm. It's obvious, but it has to be said. What wasn't done? What, where mm. wasn't searched? What sightings or leads weren't followed up? That needs to be gone through. So at the start of this interview, he's talking about the McCann's petition for the Portuguese police to reopen their investigation. So this isn't an interview he did right around the time of the uh, disappearance of what I suspect was Madeline's death. This was done later when the McCann's were petitioning Portuguese police to reopen the investigation. However, it is illustrated illustrative of his persuasive skills. And that could take them a good part of a month to do that. Uh, secondly, the lawyers will also be looking at it from the legal perspective. If there is any incompetence or, or, or anything worse than that, then uh, under Portuguese law, they could bring uh, charges against individuals or the police as a whole. So notice what he says here. They, he, the McCann's and McCann's attorneys are petitioning the Portuguese police to reopen the investigation. And if they find any evidence of incompetence, according to him, right? What, what would constitute incompetence? We don't know precisely. But if they find that the Portuguese police did anything wrong, though they will pursue legal action against the Portuguese police as well as individuals. And this is a tactic that Scientology uses a lot, where if you say anything about them, they will come after you and your organization, but they will also come after you personally. And that is a great tactic to scare people who don't have the cojones to stand by what they say into cowering down. And early on when I started my McCann series, people continued to point out to me how litigious the McCanns are. You know, they, they, they sued this person, they sued that person, they can get your t- channel taken down. Well, one great defense of defamation and slander, let's say they tried to sue me, is truth. So let's say Clarence or anybody else came after me. My defense would be the truth, and I would make it my life's mission to prove that they killed Madeline. So right now, it's just my opinion. I haven't gone to Portugal to look for evidence. I haven't deposed the McCanns to, to get them to confess to me or trap them in an inconsistency in their story right in front of my face. But you can see how these veiled threats Clarence Mitchell is making could scare a Portuguese police officer who's just trying to get his paycheck, to do his job, and then this guy shows up and says, hey, if you do anything wrong here, I'm going to be watching you. And if you do something that incriminates, if you plant some evidence, or you ask them a question that's misleading, or a question, or a question for too long, and I think you're compelling them to say stuff, or you're doing uh, cruel and unusual punishment to them. I'm going to come after you. I'm going to come after your department, and I'm going to come after you personally. What do you think the the uh, foot soldier policeman on the job is going to do? They're probably going to say, you know what, this isn't worth it. This isn't worth me losing my job, worth me getting sued. The chief might even say, listen, he might even call his whole team and, hey, we're being watched very closely by the British here and the media. Let's do everything by the book. Leave the parents alone because if we do anything there, hell is going to rain down on us. And I think that could be enough to dissuade a small police department from pursuing the suspects they know are guilty of the crime. So listen to this. Even years later, he's still threatening them. Listen to the veiled threats. If we find that they did anything wrong, any misstep, 
anything that was 100% by the books, we have the capacity and the willingness to sue them personally. So that's one of his tactics. The lawyers acting for Kate and Jerry and Billy, the first priority is anything in there that could help to find Madeleine. Mm. It's obvious, but it has to be said. What wasn't done? What, where wasn't searched? What sightings or leads weren't followed up? That needs to be... See, what wasn't followed up on? So, I'm, at, I, I'm sure he said that to them there. If we find that you didn't pursue other leads, you only pursued Kate and Jerry, well, then this wasn't a real investigation. You, this was a witch hunt because you didn't pursue any other leads. And this is actually a favorite tactic of defense attorneys. So in a, uh, an open and shut case, let's say it's extremely clear the parents killed their kid. So the police have all the evidence, they arrest the parents, they put them on trial. What does the defense attorney say? How do you draw doubt into the minds of the jury? How do you make the police look like bad guys? Well, the first question you ask is, did you pursue any other leads? Well, no, we didn't. So the only person you considered was my client. Yes. Did you know that there was a pedophile in the area? That there was an abuser in the area? That there was a kidnapping ring in the area on the night the daughter died? No. You didn't know that. You didn't pursue that. The only people you pursued were my clients. And that is a common tactic of defense attorneys. It's extremely effective. Because the more open and shut case, the more open and shut the case, the fewer suspects the police consider. And it looks worse on the jury, you know, to the jury, if you're able to get the police to admit that they didn't pursue other leads, even though that was precisely the logical thing to do because it was an open and shut, shut case. You can paint it to look bad. So he's pointing that out here. Uh, we're going to follow them up. Did they pursue every lead? I'm sure he said that to them at the time. Are you only pursuing Kate and Jerry? Or are you looking at other leads? Trying to get them to, def you know, to der derail the investigation. To get them to look outside. By trying to make them feel guilty for only looking at Kate and Jerry. Who, in reality, very obviously, in my opinion, were responsible priority is anything in there that could help to find Madeline. Mm. It's obvious, but it has to be said. What wasn't done? What, where wasn't searched? What sightings or leads weren't followed up? That needs to be gone through. And that could take them a good part of a month. To right. What, wasn't, what sighting wasn't followed up on? What lead wasn't followed up on? Because if you guys didn't follow up on every random nonsensical tip, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire do that. Uh, secondly, the lawyers will also be looking at it from the legal perspective. If there is any incompetence or, or, or anything worse than that, then uh, under Portuguese law, they could bring uh, charges against individuals or the police as a whole. But that's, that's not the priority. The priority is finding money. Right. So he throws in the veiled threat, just like Scientology. But that's not the priority. So this video, please do make sure to, to subscribe because we're making lots of enemies here. Is there anything that's leapt out at them so far? If there is, I'm not aware of it yet. But as I say, this is a very methodical process. A lot of it will mean a lot to the investigators, and that will, all of that will be done privately. We are not going to give a running commentary on what we're finding in there. Right. One thing that has emerged that's been picked up by one of the papers was the questioning of Kate McCann by detectives. Uh, and uh, it's on the record that she, there were 48 questions during her questioning which she refused to answer. Why? All right, so here's the money shot. He's asking Clarence, Kate McCann did not answer 48 questions when she was being questioned by the police. Is that suspicious? In a missing persons case? Yes. Ostensibly, they called the police to help them find their daughter. So you would expect them to be candid. Lawyering up, I always think, is, is a smart, intelligent thing to do. So I do not fault people for lawyering up. However, I'm curious what those 48 questions were, and they're actually going to get into it. And I think that these are questions that should have been answered if you actually wanted to help the police find your daughter. So let's listen to how Clarence Mitchell handles this. Who do you th who, how do you think he's going to handle this? Right, This is a, a powerhouse of bullying, manipulation, 
This guy's asking about Kate not answering 48 questions. Why so many? Why so many questions? Well, I have to ask the Why police. Why should know? Why did she refuse to answer? Because her lawyer advised her not to answer. She had been made a guida, and that gives you rights under Portuguese law not to answer incriminating evidence, and nor should any inference be taken from that refusal to answer. Her lawyer advised her not to answer uh, for fear, basically, that the questions were going to be leading and take her into areas that were possibly incriminating. But, I mean, some of them seem sort of fairly straightforward as to how she raised the alarm, what she first Right, so these are questions about how she raised the alarm. So what the state of the room? How she first saw the state of the room. Right, questions that would actually help police decipher what happened to Madeline. Also, these are things that I've said repeatedly now. Over, if you've binged all my videos, if you've watched this playlist, Kate entering the room is the money shot of this case. That is the part that I believe Kate and Jerry scripted. Because whenever Kate describes entering the room to discover that Madeline is missing, it follows the exact same beats every single time, almost down to the word, which is the sign of a scripted story. Because it stays the same over interviews over years from day one to five years later, um, I think is the most recent interview of, the, of theirs I've analyzed. Whereas true stories have a thing called the reminiscence effect, where you tell a story once, and then as new things pop up or new details, you know, new leads emerge, you, you consider, hey, um, you know, maybe I do remember, actually, I remember that the door... Um, the handle was depressed when I came in, right? So you remember other details because you're searching your memory. You're, rem you're reminiscing based on new things that might pop up or new leads. So true stories counterintuitively actually um, change a little bit with each telling because new things are focused on. Uh, new details are recalled. Whereas fake stories often are very rigid, very vanilla, and scripted. And I've done a whole video about this on how to spot a fake story, about the signs of a scripted story. So I'm not surprised that Kate refused to answer questions about discovering that Madeline was missing, because I think that is the money shot of their hoax. That is the part where they have to do the most complex type of lying, so it's scripted. And she probably knew if I answer these questions, there's going to be a record of it. And if I haven't perfectly memorized my script, or if Jerry says something that contradicts what I say, we're screwed. And then later down the road, she started reciting her script. So she had more time to memorize it or to speak to Jerry to make sure they coordinated their stories. The room was all that sort of thing. Um, Surely would have help them develop the inquiry. Her lawyer advised her not to answer the questions. And in that situation, Bill, if you had your lawyer telling you... All right, so now, how does Clarence shut this down? All right, so th this is a journalist. Like I said early on, I think the media, the Portuguese police, were on the right track. Early on, the media were accusing the parents because it was so damn obvious. It's obvious. But the, the Portuguese police got derailed and the media also backed down. Why? Look how Clarence handles this reporter. He shuts him down. And he basically says, I've already answered that. And it's inappropriate for you to make any inferences about that. Possibly because you might get sued too. I already threatened to sue the Portuguese police. You think I'd, I'd wait to, to sue you? to answer uh, for fear, basically, that the questions were going to be leading and take her into areas that were possibly incriminating. But, I mean, some of them seem sort of fairly straightforward as to how she raised the alarm, what she first saw, what the state of the room was, all that sort of thing. Her, Surely would have helped them develop the inquiry. Her lawyer advised her not to answer the questions. And in that situation, Bill, if you had your lawyer telling you not to do something... All right, and now he makes it personal. Bill, if you had your lawyer telling you not to do something what the state of the room was, all that sort of thing, her, surely would have 
help them develop the inquiry. Her lawyer advised her not to answer the questions. And in that situation, Bill, if you had your lawyer telling you not to do something, I'm sure you probably wouldn't do it. Uh, what do you make of the, this eyewitness uh, lead, of the Irish eyewitness that Steve King was oh, referring to? All right, so now we're off of that. Kate did not answer 48 questions some questions of which involved her discovering that Madeline was gone, the state of the room when she discovered Madeline was gone, and questions about how she raised the alarm, the timing of everything, things that would be critical to finding her daughter. And within one follow-up question, Clarence has stonewalled the reporter and basically bullied him into changing topics. And this is what I mean by this guy is a powerhouse of persuasion. Is he a bully? Yes. However, if you're the McCanns, you want him on your side. I am diametrically opposed to him. I think they're guilty. I would love to go head to head with him. I don't like bullies. But if you're the McCanns, this is the guy you want. I'm not, I'm not surprised that they hired him full time to uh, represent them. Because when you're guilty, what you want is someone who will not divulge any extra information, will not waver. And if your story's in the press, you want a guy like this who can stay composed in a heated argument and basically shut down spineless journalists. Well, as I just said, we're not going to go into a running commentary on blow by blow. As you said, 20,000 pages. I'm not going to do that. However, as Steve correctly said, there are a number of independent witnesses that place Jerry very, very clearly at the tapas bar having a meal uh, at the time that uh, this alleged statement was made. And also the man concerned is said to have made his views known based on seeing Jerry on television weeks later. Uh, Fifteen months now since yep. Madeline disappeared. And surely, slowly, regrettably... Okay, so this was actually recorded 15 months after Madeline disappeared. So within 15 months, he's now their go-to um, PR guy. I don't blame them. And as he said in uh, this article, which I shared a quote from, he first met them two weeks after Madeline's disappearance, right around the time of that interview we analyzed in my last McCann's video, What Do Innocent Parents Look Like?, where they basically took control of the press. They basically set the agenda for the press. Like I said in that video, they looked like politicians dealing with the scandal. I feel like that had his fingerprints all over it. Tragically, hope must slowly be fading. That's an obvious assumption to make, but for Kate and Jerry, it doesn't. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest Madeline has been harmed, let alone killed, as many people assume. And the longer, actually, it goes on without a single trace of her, they actually draw strength from that because they hope, against hope, that she is being held somewhere and hopefully being looked after until their private investigators have exhausted... That's a, little, that's a strange... The other thing is, I wonder if he knows the truth. So I actually asked this on X... Um, as I was preparing for this video, before I stumbled across this Clarence Mitchell guy, who I think um, you can actually learn from if you use it for good. I don't think he's particularly using his skills for good here. But on X, I asked, are there any good statements by politicians backing the McCanns? Because I wondered to myself if those politicians leaked their true sentiments about Maddie's case. And I asked that when I was thinking about doing a video of showing, explaining how it's more politically correct to just, um, to just say that they're innocent, to try to not look like a bad guy. Um, to try to look like the good guy and say that they're innocent. And um, I was trying to basically find like a statement from Gordon Brown or someone, someone who was in charge at the time, talking about the McCanns and maybe leaking that they thought she was dead. So leaking that they knew the truth, but they were just saying the parents were innocent because it was politically correct. And I think uh, Clarence might have done that here. First of all, having a meal uh, at the time that uh, is, I'm not going to. Uh, what do you make of the, this? I want to hear this part where he's talking about losing hope, hope beyond hope, something along that, something that might, 
actually indicate that he believes Madeline is dead. Why might he believe that? Well, the McCanns might have disclosed that to their attorneys. Uh, because um, right, an attorney can't necessarily divulge the information. I don't know if the rules are, are like that in the UK. But over here, you can, you can disclose to your attorney that you're guilty. They just can't argue your innocence in court because um, if they know that you're guilty. I mean, in some situations, it's actually better to just be totally honest with your attorney so that they can craft a defense for you that basically revolves around whatever the police have collected and is in their evidence. And you're basically just aiming at picking apart the police's investigation to show that they can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And of course, if you have an unethical attorney and they know you're guilty, they might still continue to argue innocence um, at the risk of their bar card. This eyewitness uh, lead, the Irish eyewitness that Steve King was referring to. Well, as I just said, we're not going to go into a running commentary on blow by blow. As you said, 20,000 pages. I'm not going to do that. However, uh, as Steve correctly said, there are a number of independent witnesses that place Jerry very, very clearly at the tapas bar having a meal uh, at the time that uh, this alleged statement was made. And also the man concerned is said to have made his views known based on seeing Jerry on television weeks later. Uh, Fifteen months now since yep. Madeline disappeared and surely, slowly, regrettably, tragically, hope must slowly be fading. That's an obvious assumption to make, but for Kate and Jerry, it doesn't. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest Madeline has been harmed, let alone... No evidence to suggest Madeline has been harmed. Is that a bold-faced lie? I think Madeline's blood was found, right? Uh... I think there actually is some cadaver dog evidence or something of Madeline's blood in the apartment. Flown killed, as many people assume. And the lo no evidence that she was killed. That's an obvious assumption to make, but for Kate and Jerry, it doesn't. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest Madeline has been harmed, let alone killed, as many people assume. And the longer actually it goes on without a single trace of her, they actually draw strength from that because they hope against hope that she is being held somewhere and hopefully being looked after until they're they hope that she's being held somewhere and looked after there's some sort of leakage there i'm just not picking up on it because i'm 40 minutes into recording now so my brain's a little bit fried but if you spotted something there uh please do drop it into the comments i try to read every single comment and as you know, I think I have the smartest subscribers on YouTube, and it would not be the first time that you guys caught something that I missed. Their private investigators have exhausted every possibility. They are never going to give up that hope or give up looking for their daughter. All right, interesting. So I just wanted to feature this guy in a video because I think this is why the Portuguese investigation got derailed. I think it was a combination of British politicians wanting to look like good guys, getting involved in the Portuguese case, and then I think in particular, a powerhouse like Clarence Mitchell getting involved using Scientology level threats of lawsuits and bullying and stonewalling to get weaker people to basically um, move off the scent of the parents, which was, of course, the obvious. Um, obviously, that should have been pursued. There's no way that should have been dropped two weeks into the investigation, which is absurd. Um, was Madeline McCann actually kidnapped? I'm a deception detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis. And this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, I'm going to teach you how to spot fake news. And whether you came to my channel through my Ramsey's playlist, my McCann's playlist, my Amanda Knox playlist, my false accusers playlist, my hoaxers playlist, this video will be interesting and important for you. I think it might be one of the most important videos I've made, the skills I'm going to teach you here, since coming back to YouTube. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to watch this news clip together. It's a news clip from Talk TV, and they're basically talking about Christian Bruckner, who allegedly kidnapped Madeleine McCann. And we're going to parse the ways you can tell whether or not the news actually believes what they're saying and the techniques they use to manipulate your opinion. Now, our top story tonight, a sensational development in the Madeleine McCann case as a friend of the prime suspect says he confessed to killing the three-year-old, saying she didn't even scream. All right, so how do we start off? This all sounds really damning, right? This sounds very, very uh, conclusive. We have sensational news. We have a friend of Christian Bruckner saying, Christian Bruckner said she didn't even scream. I've watched this clip already, so I can tell you the actual information they have is very dubious. When they say it's sensational, they are being honest in that they are sensationalizing a nothing burger, right? They're taking something out of context. Also, the quote which they have on the uh, the cryon or Chiron or whatever it's called down here at the bottom of the screen, at the bottom of the screen, prime suspect told pal she didn't even scream. Do you think Christian, Christian Bruckner told his friend, Madeline did not even scream when I kidnapped her? Or do you think this very short pull quote is taken out of context? If you haven't seen the clip yet, I think you can already guess if you're on my channel and you've seen enough of my videos that when people want to deceive you, 99% of the time, they lie by omission. In other words, they leave out the context. So did Christian Bruckner technically say the words, she didn't even scream? Yes. Now let's see if the actual context is what the news is trying to imply. Christian Bruckner is accused by German authorities of kidnapping and murdering Madeleine in Portugal in 2007, allegations that he denies. Well, tonight, Bruckner's best friend has given an interview revealing that he told British police about the confession and that Scotland Yard detectives ignored him. Now, this man, Helga Bushing, a new Bruckner when they lived in the Algarve in 2008, and his testimony is a key plank of the German prosecutor's case. Now, Kai Feldhaus is the reporter who broke the story. I spoke to him a little earlier and asked him who Helga Bushing is and why he's such an important witness. We have an important witness, a key witness. Helga Bushing got a confession. Notice how they're building up, and I think that even print news does this, where they put what they want you to believe into the headline, and then the little blur below the headline, because they know 99% of people do not read the full article. Especially uh, outlets like Forbes, for example, or the New York Times, which are behind a paywall. So they know that if you're coming for free, you're likely not subscribed to them. You're likely not paying to read the full story. So you are limited to the headline and the blurb. And this is a very manipulative technique because often what they do is contradict themselves or add their caveats later in the same article. So you're left with the sensational impression that they want you to take away, which will cause you to share the story, sensationalize it, However, the important context is behind a paywall or left out altogether. So let's learn about this Bushing guy. Is he a reliable witness? Is he someone we can trust? Helgi used to be a friend of our main suspect, uh, Christian Bruckner, uh, who shared time with him in Portugal in the relevant years of the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Um, they have been committing all kinds of crimes, uh, selling... And the penny drops. Bushing is a criminal, a thief. In the court of law, if I were representing um, someone in this case, if I were representing Christian Bruckner, I'd be pointing out that this guy's unreliable. He probably made up a story in order to reduce his sentence or to get curry some favor with the, the police or the prosecutor. Also, I would talk about his character in that I cannot trust anything a, a thief says. 
So do I think Christian Bruckner is a good guy? Of course not. I think Christian Bruckner is a despicable guy and belongs in prison for the rest of his life. However, so far in this story, this sensational story with some big bombshell, uh, an apparent confession, so far I'm not convinced. We haven't heard the context of this phrase, she didn't even scream yet, and we will. And so far the person reporting that Christian Bruckner said this is a thief, is a convicted criminal, basically. Any drugs, stealing stuff and everything. Uh, and at one point, um, Helge B. and another friend climbed into Christian Bruckner's flat and stole a video camera. And this video camera apparently contained tapes that showed how the suspect raped women. And this is basically how it all started. Uh, this is what led to the conviction of Christian Bruckner that brought him to jail now. Okay. So we have this guy, a thief who broke into Christian Bruckner's house, stole a video camera, showing Christian B Bruckner. I'm not going to use the R word because I don't want uh, to anger YouTube. So showing Christian Bruckner assaulting women. Does this mean Christian Bruckner kidnapped Maddie? No. And this is something I've had to point out a lot on my videos early on. My subscribers who have been around for a while obviously are familiar with this concept and I don't need to point out to them, but I have so many new subscribers um, and thank you all for subscribing. But I do want to make this clear. You have to escape binary thinking. So Christian Bruckner bad does not mean Christian Bruckner kidnapper. Also, if I say Christian Bruckner did not kidnap Madeline, that does not mean I think Christian Bruckner is good. Both things can be true simultaneously. Christian Bruckner can be an evil uh, person who assaults women, kidnaps children, belongs in jail for the rest of his life. I've got no sympathy for the guy. But he can also be innocent of kidnapping Madeline. And what the news loves to do is trap people who lack critical thinking skills into binary thinking. So if you don't support this side, you're evil. You support that side, well then you're bad. You, you can't support both. You can't not care. You have to have an opinion. No, you don't, right? You don't have to have an opinion on everything, especially one assigned to you by the news. And I think that is probably the most important thing I've said on the channel since coming back to YouTube. You have to escape binary thinking. Okay, so uh, where's the connection then between uh, this uh, Christian Bru Bruckner being clearly a nasty piece of work and Madeleine McCann? In 2008, the two men... And that's the money shot of this interview. All right, so you have all this stuff on Christian Bruckner. How does it connect to Madeleine McCann? Now let's see if this is the bombshell sensational thing that they've been building up at the intro to this news story. Or is this a nothing burger? Is this manipulation? Are they using priming in the early part of the news report to prime you to think that whatever they say next is more important than it is? Just like the headline on an article that does not reflect what's actually said in the article. Man, we're talking about met again at a festival in Spain called the Dragon, Fest Dragon Festival. It was kind of a hippie techno festival. And according to the witness, uh, they had a brief exchange. Uh, Christian Bruckner asked um, Helge B., our witness, if he might go back to Portugal at some point to do business, as they call it, uh, to meet, commit further crimes. And Helge B. said, no, I can't go there because there's too much police. And then the, uh, there was this, this exchange that basically shows the connection to the Maddie McCann case because Helge B. claims he said, uh, how can a child disappear just like that? So Helge B., this uh, key witness who is a convicted criminal, thief, likely a liar, is reporting that he had a hypothetical conversation with Bruckner. This is already not looking like a bombshell to me. This is already not looking like a confession. If you look at the cry on here, it says, Maddie confession. Prime suspect told pal she didn't even scream. Let's listen here. So they, he's reporting an unreliable witness. A witness with no credibility is reporting 
a hypothetical conversation about Madeline. Let's see if this is a bombshell. In Portugal at some point, to do business, as they call it, uh, to meet, commit further crimes. And uh, he said, no, I can't go there because there's too much police. And then the, uh, there was this, this exchange that basically shows the connection to the Maddie McCann case because Helge B. claims he said, uh, how can a child disappear just like that? And according to him, How can a child disappear like that? I could have that same conversation too. In fact, if I were in the business of kidnapping children or breaking into women's houses, I might actually have this conversation, right? Just like these two criminals had. Him, Christian Brickman then said uh, the now infamous sentence, well, she didn't scream. And that is what... Yes, he's answering a hypothetical scenario. How did people not notice she was taken out of the house? Well, she didn't scream, obviously. It's a hypothetical conversation reported by a non-credible witness. However, the news reports it as a confession. The news is trying to set up Christian Bruckner as a fall guy. And what they have so far is very weak. So I see lots of people in my comments saying, I see lots of people in my comments saying, Christian Bruckner did it. Haven't you seen the news? Christian Bruckner has been charged. Christian Bruckner is going to get convicted. This is the evidence. What that tells me is these people who think Christian Bruckner did it are not reading past the headlines. For example, comments saying, didn't Christian Bruckner confess to this? No, he didn't, right? This is being reported as a confession. This is not a confession. This is a reported, a hearsay conversation reported by a non-credible witness who is likely trying to make a deal with the prosecutor by throwing Christian Bruckner under the bus. And even then, the conversation reported is not a confession. It's Christian Bruckner replying to a hypothetical question, how could someone have kidnapped Maddie without getting caught? This is what Helge B. later told uh, police and Scotland Yard, and this is how basically um, things started and uh, police started investigating Christian Bruckner. Right. So, and Bushing says that he, he, he alerted uh, Scotland uh, Yard. Another question I get a lot on my uh, channel is why are... Um, why are people covering up for Jerry and Kate, right? Let's say Jerry and Kate did it. Why are the police not pursuing Jerry and Kate? Why does the British government provide so much money to them every year to look for Madeline? Why is the German government pursuing uh, Christian Bruckner so hard rather than focusing on Jerry and Kate? And I get lots of people saying, well, you know, Jerry's in the Freemasons, so that must be it. Or it's some big conspiracy that goes up to the top, or some ring of child traffickers that Jerry and, and Kate are part of. None of that holds any water with me. I've already actually addressed the Freemason thing in a previous McCann's video. So if you haven't seen what I think of the Freemasons, I spoke about them in a previous McCann's video the one called, uh, where is it? How to derail an investigation. So if you want to see what I think of Freemasons, watch this one. In that one, I actually showed a clip of a Freemason ceremony, right? Something that's a big taboo in the Freemason society. You're not supposed to show a clip, a secret clip of a ceremony. I showed it, nothing's happened. And the ceremony itself was laughable. So do I think Freemasons are the reason that Kate and Jerry are getting away with um, what I think they did, which was accidentally killing their daughter? No. I think it's a lot easier, more human explanation. So as I posited in that video, I believe that politicians just don't want to accuse parents of killing their daughter. So what they do is they take the low stakes position of saying, okay, these are British citizens, they're in another country, if I have to comment on it, I'm going to say, I, I don't think they did it, we're going to offer them all the support we can, we'll send someone from the foreign office to help, because that way, if the daughter is found, and the parents didn't do it, the politician looks great. However, let's say they do find the daughter, and it is proven that the parents killed her, the pol politician can simply say, oh, wow, I, you know, I can't believe they did that, that's insane. You know, what a shame. Poor, poor girl. 
It doesn't look bad. The alternative would be to say, I think the parents did it, just like I do on this channel and many other analysts have done. Uh, it's You actually have to stick your neck on the line to be in my position. Because sensitive people who are not thinking critically will call you an, a villain for doing this, even though, in my opinion, I'm 100% correct. So if a politician took the brave route and said, you know what, there's something off here. I think the parents are responsible. We need to look into them. If it is later proven that the parents didn't do it, that politician will look like a villain. So the low stakes thing to do is simply support the parents. And if you are wrong, hey, you know, I believe in humanity. I'm surprised they did it. You know, woe is me. Rather than getting pilloried for accusing innocent parents of killing their daughter. Now, when it comes to why do the why does the British government continue to fund the search for Madeline? Let me know in the comments before I answer this, if you can figure it out. So why would the government, once they've approved a budget, and I'll give you a hint, it relates to my previous answer I just gave about why the British government supported the McCanns in the past. So why would a government, once it's approved a budget to search for a missing girl, continue to approve that budget? Why would they do that? Is it the Illuminati? Is it Freemasons? Is it a, a, a sex trafficking ring that goes all the way up to the prime minister and the queen or the king now? No. It's because no politician wants to be the one to cut off funding. Imagine being the politician that says, all right, we're done funding the Maddie investigation. What would the headline say? Heartless politician and search for Maddie. Evil politician condemns Maddie to death. Evil politician is part of sex trafficking, sex trafficking ring probably because they do not want to find where Maddie is and Maddie's probably with the sex trafficking ring. Right? So no politician wants to be the one to cut off the funding. So it persists. It's a form of weakness via virtue signaling. No one wants to be the bad guy even though they know what they're doing is wasteful and wrong. I don't think the politicians actually believe the McCanns are innocent, because if you've seen my entire series on the McCanns, it's very obvious. They are not sophisticated liars. They demonstrate all the tells of people who are being deceptive about covering up the truth, in which it, where they have a lot of similarities with the Ramses as well, who I also believe are uh, accidentally killed their daughter. Or at least if Burke killed JonBenet, the parents were responsible for covering it up. So that is why, th those are basically the simple explanations for why the British government supported the McCanns from the beginning. Basically, it was political correctness, virtue signaling, why they continue to support them. Now, why does the German government, why the German prosecutors, why are they so obsessed with pushing this Christian Bruckner narrative? Once again, it does not require any conspiracy theory-laden explanation. We can use Occam's razor here. What is the simplest explanation? The prosecutor is probably trying to make a name for themselves. And this ties back to my Amanda Knox series. In that series, we had prosecutors who loved the media attention of the case, who wanted to make a name for themselves, and in doing so, cut corners, skipped over important uh, avenues of investigation, and basically developed tunnel vision in order to gain attention, build their reputation. People's motivations are very simple, right? Um, it does not require some Illuminati level orchestration behind the scenes for a prosecutor to want to solve a famous uh, decades-old unsolved mystery. So regarding the German prosecutors, they've got a German. They have him in prison. They can work on him. And all they need to do now is extract a confession from him. If they can do all that the prosecutor becomes a hero. The German police can celebrate solving this crime. They get news articles written about them. And 
they already know Christian is a very bad guy. So they're not expecting anyone to scratch below the surface. If they can pin this on Christian Bruckner, well, voila, case closed. We got a bad guy in prison. Uh, the McCanns can have closure and we get to take the credit. And uh, I think that is basically what that might be what happens if people are do not have enough critical thinking to see past the illusion, past the fake news. If I had to boil this video down to one, if I had to boil this video down to one or two sentences, it would be fake news is achieved by priming people to believe whatever is said next in the news report. And secondly, by lying via omission, by leaving out context. This report, the cryon, the entire time we've been watching, has said Maddie, Maddie confession, prime suspect told Bell she didn't even scream. If you did not watch past the first minute of this uh, report, you would think that Christian Bruckner confessed to killing Maddie or to kidnapping Maddie and that he said he told someone that she didn't even scream. But if you have one ounce of the skills I'm teaching on this channel, you would be able to scratch past that surface and see what's really going on. And that's why I think this is one of the most important videos I've made so far on the channel, and it applies to every series I've put out since coming back to YouTube, as well as the series I made before leaving YouTube. So let's keep watching, see if we can find any more techniques. So far, we have priming and lying via omission, leaving out context. Yard in 2008 on this Maddie hotline, but he says nothing happened. That's true. He said, he told me when we met that uh, he called the Maddie the headline and he left his name, uh, his contact details. Uh, he left uh, the name and the contact details of the suspect, uh, but he said they never got back to him. And then he basically claimed, okay, if they don't call me, they will just take care of it. And then a couple of years passed until the 10th anniversary of the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. And uh, Helge B says he then called again because he, he found out apparently nothing had happened since. And that was then basically what he says, well, finally someone listened to him. Okay, so Helga Bushing, clearly a quite a shady character, stealing guns and videos uh, from his shady friends, getting out of prison in 2017. Um, why do you believe him? Exactly. So I got to give this anchor some credit. He started off with a ton of priming, which, it, which I did not like. Right? He said this is a sensational story. Um, the cryon says it's a confession. However, he is asking good questions, reasonable questions. For example, his first question was, okay, you have this villainous, evil criminal, Christian Bruckner. How does he tie to Maddie? The only way he ties to Maddie is through the word of a guy who just got out of prison in 2017. Now, another great follow-up question. Why do you believe this guy? Well, it is true. They all got a bit of a background of, uh, of crime and, and, and petty theft. Uh, but it's actually not me who only believes him. It's also uh, the federal prosecution in Braunschweig who basically so now we have a weak response from this guy. So this guy's out here telling us we have a confession. Kai Feldhaus, chief reporter of Build. Right, so we have Christian Bruckner confessed to this guy. But it's not just me who believes him. Other people also believe him. So what? This reminds me of uh, other videos I did where um, maybe it was the McCann's, my early McCann's videos. Actually, I'm going to find this clip to show you guys. Uh, some of my early videos, my early McCann's videos, people would comment, you know that everyone thinks Christian Bruckner did it, right? You know the German police have Christian Bruckner in prison. You know he confessed. You know that he was in Portugal at the time she was kidnapped, right? Everyone in the BBC thinks he did it. Everyone in the British government, UK government thinks he did it. Everyone in the German government thinks he did it. The Portuguese think he did it. So what are you doing? And here is my response. Let me find this clip. I'm going to do a quick cut. 
So here's my response to people telling me that my McCann's analysis contradicts the BBC, the police, the behavior panel on YouTube from the great Christopher Hitchens. My own opinion is enough for me, and I claim the right to have it defended against any consensus, any majority, anywhere, any place, any time. And anyone who disagrees with this can pick a number, get online, and kiss my ass. <laughs> Wise words. So when it comes to Christian Bruckner, I've done my analysis on the McCanns. Unless something dramatically changes my analysis, I'm sticking with it. Because I didn't go into my McCann's analysis trying to pin anything on them. I went into my analysis with them a month ago, knowing very little about the case. And I developed my theory over, at this point, this is my 12th video with the McCann's. And in this series, I've come up with how I think Madeline died, who I think did it, which parts of their stories I think are scripted and why, why I believe they're scripted and how, why I believe they are scripted, as well as why I think the Portuguese police stopped looking at them as suspects in my last McCann's video, how to derail, how to derail an investigation, which I think might be one of the most underrated videos in this series because it explains a lot of stuff in ways that the real world works rather than ways that conspiracy theorists work. Shady friends getting out of prison in 2017. Um, why do you believe him? Well, it is true. They all got a bit of a background of, uh, of crime. And so why do you believe this guy? And now this chief reporter who's been reporting everything as if it's fact starts walking back, starts backpedaling. Because not even he believes this nonsense, right? So he's going to appeal to the masses. Well, it's not just me who believes it. Other people also believe it. So what? And, and, and petty theft. Uh, but it's actually not me who only believes him. It's also uh, the federal prosecution in Braunschweig who basically think him as credible to indict Christian Bruckner on the base of what Helge B. said. So there seems to be some credibility. Yes. Um, and they went, from then on, they, they investigated further and they could prove that Christian Bruckner uh, committed a rape case in 2004 in Pilot. So now we have more character attack. We already established Christian Bruckner is not a good guy. He belongs in prison. But people who are trapped in binary thinking can't see past that. Christian Bruckner bad. Maddie kidnapped bad. Christian Bruckner kidnapped Maddie. That's, that's not how logic works. Two things can be true at the same time. Christian Bruckner can be bad, even a kidnapper, even um, a sexual assaulter. Madeline could have been kidnapped. Doesn't mean Christian Bruckner did it. Although based on my analysis, I don't believe Mad Madeline was ever kidnapped. And I think it's, it's fairly obvious to anyone with any degree of um, statement analysis skills or even critical thinking skills. Even if we leave out all the statement analysis, contextually, the way they reacted to a supposed, supposed kidnapping does not add up. That, that is not how people would react in that situation. For example, leaving the room uh, to go look for Madeline but leaving the twins in bed. If you believed there was a kidnapping ring in the area, I doubt you would leave your twins alone in the bedroom again. You would only do that if you knew the story was fake. But that's just one contextual detail. Right? We've, we have dozens by this point. By Lalouche. And that all started because of what LGB said. And so what is Christian Bruckner's the defense team saying about these claims? Well, the defense team pretty much go after uh, the witness being a shady person, of course. Um, he has a history of drinking and maybe <clears throat> of drug doing as well. Uh, yeah, i.e. unreliable. I.e. this entire news report should have ended the minute they realized this alleged witness is not credible. Um, also, it seems like 
what, what Helge B. now told me does not really match what another witness called Manfred Seifert said. They, they do not really match the... So now we have this journalist who's reporting all this stuff about Helge B. saying that there's actually inconsistencies between Helge B.'s story and another alleged uh, little petty thief piece of scum witness. But notice how this is brought up. It's not brought up in the first minute of the interview. This is brought up four minutes and 39 seconds into a five and a half minute interview. So all the context is eventually disclosed, which is good, but only after prompting by the anchor and only at the end of this segment. So if someone tells me, I saw an interview on Talk TV where it showed that Christian Bruckner confessed to kidnapping Maddie, I know that they have not watched past the first 20 seconds of the story. Or if it was a written story, I know they have not read past the headline, and maybe the little blurb. And this is not limited to uh, stories about Madeline, which is why I say this is one of the most important videos I'm showing you. One of the most important videos I've made that applies to almost every series we've done so far. Uh, because fake news is everywhere. People have agendas, and it's not necessarily some nefarious Illuminati-level agenda. Often, people, news anchors and um, influencers lie with good intentions. Right? They think that they're doing you a favor by, by duping you or leaving something out. In this case, they might even be telling themselves, hey, between themselves, you know, when no one else is listening, look, we know Christian didn't do it. Did he do it? No. But he's a bad guy. We can get him to make a confession if we cut a little deal with him. Maybe we'll put a TV in his uh, prison cell. He's going to be in prison for the rest of his life anyway. This will bring closure to the parents. The British government will be able to save tax dollars because they can end the search. So this will actually benefit the British citizens. It will benefit the Portuguese citizens because they won't have to have a, a Madeline task force any, anymore. They can end that. You know, hey, and it will also help our careers. I could put my kids through college with, uh, uh, you know, the um, the raise I'm going to get for solving this case. So it's win, win, win. That's right, right? It would be win, win, win if they had pinned on Christian, but it wouldn't be the truth. And that's the important thing. It wouldn't be the truth. And on my channel, I came back to YouTube because uh, I care about the truth. I want people to be able to spot when someone's lying or when someone's manipulating them. And the news has become more and more manipulative in the time I was gone, which I thought was impossible. And this is just one example of it. I wanted to teach this lesson, but I had to tie it to a video in a series that my subscribers would actually watch. I had to find a way to tie it to the McCann's. So if you think this lesson's a little bit shoehorned, that's fine, right? I've shoehorned other lessons into the McCain series where I pointed it out as well. So maybe this is shoehorned in, but it's an important lesson. The way to spot fake news is to actually think critically. Notice how I'm not pointing out individual words here like we do when we're doing a typical interview analysis of a subject. The way the news lies is actually much easier to spot. And it's all through um, priming you, right? Right when you turn into this interview, you see Maddie confession at the bottom of the screen. You're primed to believe that when Christian B said she didn't even scream, that was a confession. In reality, it's not at all. It's a hypothetical response to a hypothetical question reported by a non-credible witness. And the guy who was reporting this story, who's covering the story, admits that himself but he only admits it four and a half minutes into the interview. So you have to think critically. Uh, what, what the two uh, persons have seen and, and, and heard. So um, this report... The other reason I, I want you guys to watch this video and share this video out 
is because when this is eventually pinned on Christian Bruckner, let's say they, they pin it on him tomorrow, believe me, they will come for my channel. So I want to put this out there so at least you guys who are subscribers right now can see the truth if and when this is finally pinned on Christian Bruckner. And remember, when I was doing low stake stuff, like uh, when I first started YouTube, when I was calling out influencers for using steroids or calling out video gamers for cheating, and I was eventually proven correct, I got kudos. The channel grew and grew. Um, like I hit something like 25,000 subscribers after three videos just because, or three or four, three or like something like three or five videos. Because each video I made came true, each prediction I made based on statement analysis was proven correct, and people flocked in to subscribe. However, with these true crime ones, and one reason I've been avoiding true crime is because with true crime ones, there's more uh, elements. There are uh, PR firms working for the Ramseys. Right? PR firms on retainer for the Ramseys. PR firms on retainer for the McCanns on retainer for, I think, Amanda Knox, too. And you can see the PR firms at work now. So I can see the bots and uh, the, the orchestration happening on the channel in real time. After I made my, I think, second or third Ramsey's video, I started seeing bot comments that all of a sudden disappeared after I commented about them. So there were bots basically saying dogmatically, the Ramseys are innocent. You don't know what you're saying. Ramseys are innocent, pointing out things that weren't even in the video. And then I think YouTube eventually flagged them as bots and got rid of them. Or in my flagged comments, I actually posted a screenshot of this on X. I had little bots uh, mimicking my channel and commenting to people. So pretending to be me and commenting with some WhatsApp phone number thing. So I think that some of those, especially the Ramsey ones, are likely bots from a PR firm, something along those lines, right? Just bots that track whenever you, you use the Ramsey's tag in a video on YouTube, and they go and they try to control the narrative. Regarding the McCanns, I've already covered their head communications guy in how to derail an investigation. Uh, Clarence Mitchell, I think his name is, right, who runs a PR firm. That, and he works in McCann's full-time. And I can anticipate it. Once they pin this on um, Christian Bruckner, that PR firm is going to go to work to try to spread the news, to try to comment on every comment on my video saying that Maddie's kidnapper has actually been caught. Um, the McCann's are innocent. I don't know what I'm talking about. Right, uh, Pat Brown, who mentioned me in her last video, right? They'll say she doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, they'll say Peter Hyatt doesn't know what he's talking about. Basically, anyone who's stood up against the McCanns searching for truth is going to get pilloried, I think, in the next few months once they pin this on Christian Bruckner. And all it really comes down to is what deal they make with him to get a confession out of him. They have all the cards in the Christian Bruckner case. Bargaining is a big part of the legal system, the give and take. Also, Christian Bruckner apparently wrote like some four-page letter in prison saying he didn't do it, protesting his innocence. But I cannot find a copy of that anywhere. Apparently, he wrote it in English, and all I can see on news articles are just screenshots of the letter. And I would love to analyze that, that letter, to see if it's credible or not, to see what he reveals in his word choice. So if anyone has a copy of that letter, uh, please comment below, let me know, or send it to me on X, because I think that would make a good video. Especially if he, ha if he says something in that letter that does not align with the confession he'll eventually give to the Germans if, if they get him to confess. So we can actually, we'll be able to see an inconsistency in things he said over time, which may indicate that he was compelled into finally admitting whatever they wanted him to admit. So probably what the 
what the defense will be after when when it comes to a court case against Christian Buckner. So German prosecutors, he's their prime, uh, he's their, their, their prime <laughs> suspect and they're going after him. What sort of time scale are we looking at? That is pretty difficult to say. According to Hans Christian Wolter, who is who's running the prosecution, uh, I met him two weeks ago, he said there's not much happening there. Um, we are looking at another uh, indictment, uh, another rape case that uh, Christian Brücker might be in court for in the next couple of weeks, probably months, because there's a bit of dispute what court is actually responsible for this. Um, there's no... That's when I think, when his other rape case... <coughs> goes to court, that's going to be their opportunity to cut the deal with them. <clears throat> so expect, if we get a confession from Christian Bruckner, if they get him to roll over, it will be, be when they're cutting the deal with him on that second case, whenever that goes to court. Uh, so mark my words, if we see one, it will be, there will not be a coincidence. The confession will come around the time of that other case because that's when they will be bartering with him on his sentencing for that case. And they'll be able to say, look, if you help us close this Madeline McCann case, if you admit you did it, just tell us you did it, we'll give you a lighter sentence, um, we'll give you a cushier prison, because you're helping us save so much money and you know helping relieve the stress of these parents who have been under duress all this time, wondering what happened to their daughter. So just admit you did it. We'll cut you some slack on the sentencing, and we can all go home happy. That is that is how it will happen if it does happen. No time frame for a Madeleine McCann court case. I think this is this can be said. No time frame for a McCann case because they know they know they have no evidence. So it's going to come down to that other case. That's that might be why he's their fall guy. Why they picked him because he has another case. They know they're going to pin. They know they're going to get him on that one, and they know they can negotiate pinning Madeline on him if they give him a lighter sentence on that one. So mark my words on that. Hopefully, this has been useful for you. Don't believe everything you see in the news. Remember the words of Chris, Christopher Hitchens that I played here. If you feel something in your gut and based on your own analysis, you should follow that. But keep an open mind that if other things come into play to change your mind, you need to be able to accept those too. So don't get trapped into tunnel vision or binary thinking. Before we wrap up this video, let's just do our comments Q&A section. I think this is a fun segment to add to each video. It's got a great response so far, so we're going to continue doing it. I've only done it on the Ramseys so far. So this will be our first one with the McCanns. So I'm just going to read and react to the top comments from my last McCanns video. The last McCann's video was how to derail an investigation. So let's look at uh, five or six comments. And usually you guys have great points here, so I have not looked at all these yet. Um, at least not since the first time I read them a little while back. Five days ago is when I did this video. All right, so the first comment from Ellen Mogensen. Normal parents do not focus on their child's pure perfect genitals being torn apart as Kate McCann did. This is a quote from her book, Madeline. Normal parents do not get annoyed and say we've been through all that as Jerry McCann did many times. And then she gives a list of things that normal parents don't do. I'm just going to focus on the first one right now. So in Kate's book, apparently she says, she talks about imagining or having a dream or something along those lines of Madeline's pure, perfect genitals being torn apart. Why did she mention that? Personally, I think it's just because it helps support their narrative of a stranger kidnapping. So Kate wants everyone to believe, Kate and Jerry both want everyone to believe that Madeline was kidnapped. However, there is no evidence of the kidnapping. So I think this is Kate's way of sort of introducing evidence to gullible people that there is evidence Madeline was kidnapped because she had a dream of these people um, doing something with her daughter and it was graphic so it must be true. In reality, I don't believe in um, visions or, or any of that uh, voodoo. And I don't think Kate does either. I think this is just Kate's way of 
trying to introduce some evidence that Madeline is still alive and is being abused by a kidnapping ring without actually having any evidence. It also displays a contempt for her audience. It actually shows that the, she thinks that the people who read her book are stupid if she thinks that they will interpret interpret her dream as actual evidence. And there's lots of reflections of Kate and Jerry thinking people are stupid because they've been proven right so far. Even when they said um, something along the lines like uh, they made some comment about how easy it was um, in a previous video. I forget the exact quote. If you remember, please put it in the comments. But to me, when they said that line, it indicated to me that they couldn't believe Madeline hadn't been found yet, that they didn't think uh, it was going to be so hard for the police to find her wherever they placed her. So I do think that Kate, Kate and Jerry have contempt for the people who read their book. And as I always say, liars always have contempt for the, for the people they lie to. So I think this line comes from Kate relaying something she saw in a dream, which is her way of pushing her narrative because she has no proof that Madeline is kidnapped. And just demonstrate that her lack of respect for the people she expects to believe that. All right, this one's from a member, Mel. Thank you for being a member of the channel. I seriously cannot believe how bad the behavior panel botched this one. My only training comes from YouTube, and it's so obvious to me. I love the behavior panel, but this makes me question everything they've said. Wow. This comment got 121 likes, 45 replies. I've never actually watched the behavior panel. I've watched like a clip from them. So I know it's like four guys with a, a, a bunch of credentials. My main thing with, with them getting it wrong is either, I, first of all, I don't think body language analysis is beneficial to anybody. I think it's, it, unless you're Ekman, unless you can actually record someone responding to a question and freeze frame and analyze their micro expressions, it's not going to be very useful on the fly. And what I teach on my channel is spotting lies on the fly, watching a video together, usually a video I've never seen before, and picking out the lies and, and sort of weighing up our poker chips on how much we want to bet that the person is lying, which I think is a useful skill to have in real life. I feel like body language analysis is too subjective. So whether or not you can tell someone's lying, it doesn't really tell you what they're lying about. There is no leakage, for example. Or your body can't pick things to bring up, right? It's just you're interpreting someone folding their arms or looking to the left or looking to the right. Or I, I really don't know what they do. I, but I personally try to ignore it. So either... The behavior panel, getting the McCann's wrong is just more proof that body language analysis is a waste of time. That's just too subjective. Or it might simply be that they are bullied into not calling out the McCann's. Um, lots of the McCann's are very litigious. When I first started covering the McCann's, as I've said before, lots of people told me, oh, they're going to sue you. They're going to take down your channel. They're going to come after you. They also said that about the Freemasons. So far, I'm still standing. The reason is probably because I'm an attorney and people understand if you go after an attorney, you are opening up a can of worms. For example, if the McCanns came after me for slander or libel, my defense would be truth and I would make it my mission to prove that they killed their daughter and hit her body. So I think they understand that um, right now I'm using these videos as a way to teach deception. If they piss me off, it will become more content for my channel and I will be on the defensive and I will put all my resources behind proving they did it. So a uh, behavior panel may, might not want to make that wager. They have a very big YouTube channel. They might not want to put anything at risk. Also, their names are out there. Ever since day one, deliberately, I have used the glasses, used the hat, used the headphones to mask my identity. Because when people use their real names or get doxxed, it affects what they talk about. They will not cover certain topics because they know there, there are crazy people out there. There are mobs of people. The mob is not 
something you ever want to deal with. The mob is not rational. The mob is a sadistic force. And if someone points out a victim, sadistic people love to form mobs and go attack someone. So I, I keep my identity a secret and uh, it makes it a lot harder to try to attack me in a nefarious, underhanded way. So the behavior panel getting that wrong might have been accidental because they use body language analysis, 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 which I think is uh, voodoo, or because they simply don't want to open up that can of worms. All right, let's see. I've never known. Uh, this is from Bob. I've never known parents of a missing child to require the services of a spin doctor, as well as the need to sue detractors from their narrative of the events of May 2007. The parents have got away with at least a case of neglect and with their careers intact and still fetid as victims. Bob's right. Uh, if having a spin doctor, especially Clarence Mitchell, is a very powerful thing to have. And I did a whole video about, about Clarence Mitchell, their spin doctor, in my last McCann's video, how to derail an investigation. Clarence Mitchell, as I said, has a, an almost Scientology level of bullying persuasion in order to browbeat and cajole people and bully them into doing things. I actually think that Clarence is so um, adept at that, that he might have been one of the big reasons the whole Portuguese investigation was delay uh, derailed. So the threat of lawsuits, the threat of um, having your name dragged through the mud, having more friction in your day-to-day -day life by getting doxxed can definitely influence uh, what people do. So I agree. Having a spin doctor is unique. I don't know of too many parents of of kidnapped children who get spin doctors and get ones that are full time. And this was pointed out in another comment on another video, um, and I thought it was a great point. So not long after Clarence Mitchell started representing the McCanns through hit, through the British Foreign Office, they hired him full time. So Clarence Mitchell quit his job in the, in the British Foreign Office to work for the McCanns full-time as their PR guy. What is the red flag about that? Well, if someone quits their job to represent the parents of a missing child full-time, it means that person knows the child is not going to get found anytime soon. Clarence Mitchell wouldn't risk his livelihood if, for example, he quit his job, moved to the Portugal to help the McCanns, and then Madeline was found the next day. Now he's out of the job because she's found. They don't need him anymore. So I think that he has, although he'll never admit it, an instinct of the truth because he, know, he knew when he quit his job, he was going into a full-time job that he would not lose anytime soon when he began representing the McCanns full time. If a girl's actually missing, you don't know if she's going to get found in one day, two days, one month, three months. You don't quit your full time job to go represent that family unless you have some sort of job security. So I think he he can also see through the nonsense. Like I said, the McCain's are not sophisticated liars. They're no Casey Anthony. They're they're not psychopaths. Even though some of my uh, viewers seem to think they are. They are not psychopathic. They are not sophisticated liars. They have to use basic lying techniques like scripting, um, avoiding questions. They're not the bold-faced psychopaths that can lie directly to the police and update their lies in real time like Casey Anthony or, or Jody Arias. Um, true psychopaths can do that. So the McCanns need a spin doctor to hold their hand. And I think that spin doctor, Clarence Mitchell, actually knows the truth himself. But then again, uh, he, he also has a non-nefarious, non-Illuminati level reason to support them. They're paying him, right? If he were to turn on them, he would lose his paycheck. All this stuff can be explained by, by just human instinct. Politicians do not want to take the risky opinion on anything. So they're going to support the parents of a missing child. 
politicians do not want to cut the funding off any sort of charitable cause. Because if that funding has been in place for years and they're the one who cuts it off, they look like the bad guy. So it's better to just let it persist. Um, and Clarence Mitchell, if you're getting paid to represent people, just like an attorney, you're going to represent them to the best of your ability. I don't blame him for being a British bulldog for them. All right, let's see. Susan Wan, I noticed a couple of things from your previous video. From your previous videos, when Kate talks about entering that room, why did she not mention the twins? Either I saw the twins, then noticed Madeline missing, or I couldn't see Madeline, so I immediately checked to see where the twins were there. Yes. Great comment from Susan. That's how you know the story is scripted. Lying is very difficult. You have to think in four dimensions. When you're not actually in that situation, you don't know what you would actually do. The whole point of that scripted story of Kate entering the bedroom, noticing Madeline missing, and then seeing the window open is the money shot of saying that the window's open to imply that Madeline was kidnapped. Everything else, like the twins laying there, is tangential to the narrative she came up with. So she just doesn't mention it. In reality, yes, a mother would immediately, if she noticed Madeline might, was gone, she'd go check the twins next to make sure they're not gone too. But because that's not part of the narrative they're trying to build, the story, the painting they're trying to paint of a kidnapping, the twins don't factor into it. Um, and if you want to know how I know that story is scripted, why I think it's scripted, uh, this is a very important video in the series, How to Spot a Fake Story. And what is missing from their story. And how repetition reveals lies. Right. So these all delve into the various aspects of a scripted story. Let's see. Let's just read the rest of Susan Susan's comment here. Also, when Jerry was talking about putting the children to bed that night, he had already said the usual routine was that Maddie stayed up a bit later. But then that night he states he put them all to bed at the same time. Could that mean she was already gone by then so he didn't mention Madeline? So he didn't put Madeline to bed at all that night? Interested to hear your thoughts on this. That's a great catch. Nice catch from Susan. I might have to watch another McCann's interview where they describe that night. I think almost every interview they do, they are asked about what happened that night. And another red flag is that they always give a very vague response. So let's see if we can find another, I'll see if I can find another interview of them where they're asked to describe what happened that night and see if he leaves out putting Madeline into bed altogether. That would be strange if that echoes across different stories. And I might actually have to go back and watch the interview Susan is referring to. Um, yeah, because that, that is a big catch. If he's leaving out part of the story, there's a reason for that. And then um, Artemis and Ollie here, a member, says that's a good point. I agree. That was a really good point. All right, let's just read one more comment here. And I suggest if you guys like my videos, do check out the comment section. I have the smartest subscribers on YouTube. And if you see the little member badge next to them, it means they're especially uh, good detectives because they are have access to the member section where I put extra material. And it usually implies that they've been around on the channel for longer, so they're more familiar with, uh, with things I say in the video, certain patterns I point out. Um, so this is a good indicator, the little ABDD head that, that they, the commenter really knows what they're talking about. But almost every comment is very good. All right, let's see. All right, we'll just read this one here. This will be the last one. Brian Stewart, I'm so glad you've done this video. Clarence Mitchell is a red flag himself. My take on his involvement as spokesman for the McCanns is simple. When your child is missing, it's always best to control the narrative. I agree. I actually think the McCanns have been scared of losing control of the narrative since day one. They are petrified of losing control of the narrative, which is why they do so many interviews, why they wrote the book. 
because they need people to buy into the stranger kidnapper hoax. Otherwise, the finger will point back at them. So they are constantly pointing the finger outward because they know as soon as they stop, as soon as people get tired, or as soon as people see through their story, the finger will inevitably point right back at them the same way it was pointing at them in the beginning of the investigation until the British government and Clarence Mitchell got involved. So I do believe that Clarence Mitchell is a very big figure in the in this McCann story. He's intrinsic to it. I think he is a powerhouse of persuasion strong enough to derail the invest- entire investigation. That's how powerful he is. And some of the tactics he uses are tactics you see in Scientology. In other words, nuclear level persuasion that most people in polite society are not used to. So let me know if you want me to do a video on that. Right? We, we don't have enough enemies here. So let me know if you want me to do a video on the techniques that Clarence Mitchell uses so you're able to spot them yourself. They are unique uh, persuasion tactics, a very dark art bullying type of persuasion. But someone with those skills is good to have on your side. Don't get me wrong. All right, let's see. Uh, From Chief Spin Doctor Propagandist for the government. So this is more of Brian's comment. From Chief Spin Doctor Propagandist for the government, their spokesman is some leap and a very curious one. But let's face it, it worked for them. I agree. Um, Hiring Clarence Mitchell might have been the best move the McCann's made. And it's also scared off a lot of people from talking about the McCann's. Especially in the UK. And I think lots of the behavior panel is is British, right? Or at least one or two of them are British. And they I think they feel a lot more pressure than I do as a McCann talking about the McCann's. Over here in the US, Clarence Mitchell has very little power. Um, all right. Uh, let me know if you like this segment. Uh, more McCann's to come, more Ramsey's to come. Uh, more Amanda Knox to come. I'm also going to do another poll soon so we can introduce another series uh, to our lineup of ongoing series on the channel. Until next time, stay true.